Explosive Truth Book 1 of the Finnegan First Responders series Written by Laura Scott Performed by Alex Knox Chapter 1 Devin Thompson wiped down the tables at the McCormick's Irish Pub as the last patrons finally staggered out of the building. Every night there was always one group that stayed right up until closing time, even during the work week. She inwardly sighed. She'd hoped they'd have left earlier, considering it was the middle of January in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, with a cold wind coming in off Lake Michigan bringing the threat of snow, but no such luck. She locked the door behind them, then quickly went to work on the rest of the cleaning. Thankfully, her manager, Steve Caraco, had left hours ago, leaving her to close alone. She preferred that, as constantly fending off his advances while trying to keep a professional relationship with him was getting old. Maybe it was time to get another job. Restaurant positions were relatively easy to find these days, although the past seven years had taught her that managers like Steve were everywhere. There was no way to know for sure the next job would be better. Often it was just as bad, or worse. Not for the first time, she wished things were different, that she hadn't been forced to leave her home, her entire life behind. Changing her name and starting over had seemed to be a good idea at the time. Now she was tired and crabby, yet there was no point in dwelling on the past. This was her life, and the sooner she accepted that fact, the better. After finishing the last of the cleaning, making sure everything was put away for the morning crew who would be there early, she pulled on her coat. She grabbed her purse, fished out her keys, then headed to the rear door. Behind the restaurant, there was a very small staff parking area tucked regrettably behind two large dumpsters. They didn't smell too bad in January, but during the summer, it was nasty. She hit the key fob to unlock the car while she was still in the doorway. A large explosion rocked the earth, sending her flying backward into the restaurant. Debris rained around the area, hitting the dumpster and the ground with loud pings and thumps. Lying on her back in the doorway, she struggled to catch her breath. The darkness was alight with orange and yellow flames coming from her car. The brick building of the restaurant shielded her from the worst of the blast, but what if she had been next to her vehicle when she'd unlocked it? She'd be dead. For a moment, she feared the worst, that somehow her father had been released from federal prison early and had tried to kill her. But that didn't make sense. He was serving several life sentences for all the people he'd killed. No way could he have gotten out. Sirens wailed as she struggled to her feet. Her initial instinct was to run, but not only was it a cold, five-mile walk to her low-rent apartment, she couldn't just ignore the fact that her car had disintegrated in front of her eyes. The police would track her down regardless, so she knew it was better to meet them there. She pulled out her cell phone and shakily dialed 911. The sirens grew louder, so she figured they were already heading to her location, but it would seem suspicious if she didn't make the emergency call. This is the 911 operator. What's your emergency? I, uh, my car blew up. Never in her life had she uttered those words, and she found it incredible this was happening now. My name is Devin Thompson. The car is located behind the McCormick's pub on Boulder Street? Oh yes, we've gotten reports of an explosion in that area. Are you hurt? Just a few bumps and bruises. Humbling to realize how this could have ended very differently. She watched the flames lapping at her car. The car is still on fire, though. Help is on the way, the operator assured her. True enough. Seconds later, the first fire truck pulled into the parking lot. One of the firefighters rushed over to where she stood. Miss Thompson? Yes? She managed a weak smile. I need to do a quick search for weapons. She was surprised but didn't complain, still in shock over the explosion. When he finished, he said, Come with me. She didn't argue, allowing him to escort her from the restaurant, after she took a moment to lock the door behind her. Once she was far enough away from the danger zone, the rest of the fire crew went to work battling what was left of the blaze. They soaked the building, and she had the random thought to be glad the building was brick and less likely to burn. The police showed up next two officers crossing over to where she stood. Are you Devin Thompson? The older of the two asked. Yes. She told herself to remain calm 
Even though the mere thought of interacting with the police gave her the willies, they didn't know her real name. Hopefully, her fake ID would hold up to their scrutiny. And if it didn't, she swallowed hard, staring beyond the officers to her demolished car. She'd already considered getting a new job, but leaving town wouldn't be easy without wheels. Miss Thompson, can you explain what happened? The younger of the two officers, a guy roughly her age of 30, eyed her thoughtfully. I unlocked my car and it exploded. She held up the key fob in her hand. I was in the doorway over there, and the car was parked partially behind that dumpster. I think that's the only reason I'm not hurt. Cars don't just explode, the older cop said dryly. Someone must have planted a bomb. Any idea who would do such a thing? Anyone who has a grudge against you? I have no idea. This, she waved at the debris littering the area, doesn't make any sense. I've only been in the Milwaukee area for nine months. This was where she had to step carefully. I moved here from Detroit, Michigan. And before that, it was Fort Wayne, Indiana. And before that, it was Chicago, Illinois. But none of that mattered now. Her true identity would remain a secret unless some ambitious cop dug deeper into her background. When the officers asked for her ID, she handed it over, her fingers still trembling. The younger cop took her driver's license back to the squad, no doubt to run a background check. The other cop asked her more questions. What's your job at the McCormick's Pub? I'm a server and bartender. It's my job to close the place down each night. She shivered, likely from shock more so than the temperature. I work five days a week, covering Tuesday through Saturday. I'm off on Sunday and Monday. She didn't doubt for one minute Steve Caracco would open the following morning, unless someone like the police told him he couldn't. Do you have a boyfriend? The cop asked. She narrowed her gaze, but of course understood why he was asking. No, I don't. I just told you I haven't been in the area for that long, and most of the people I meet working here, she jerked her thumb at the pub, aren't the dating type, you know? He stared at her for a long moment, as if waiting for her to elaborate on her love life or lack thereof. She didn't. Family or friends in the area? He finally asked. My parents are dead. I'm an only child. Her mother was dead, and she was an only child, so that much was true. Can I please go home now? The buses stopped running two hours ago, but she could call for a ride share, although it made her cringe to spend money on such a luxury. We'll give you a ride, the younger cop offered, returning with her driver's license. He smiled at her in a way that would have been sweet if not for the awful circumstances. The older cop looked disgruntled but nodded. Yeah, sure, we'll give you a lift. She hesitated, glancing again over to where the firefighters had battled the blaze. All that was left of her car was a charred hunk of metal. As she followed the officers to their squad car, another vehicle pulled in behind it. The cop stopped and glanced over at the man who slid out from behind the wheel. Captain Finnegan? The older cop nodded at the blonde-haired man. Wasn't expecting to see you here. Heard about the explosion and figured I'd check it out. Captain Finnegan met her gaze. Ms. Thompson? Yes. Her instincts went on high alert. This man wasn't your average street cop, which was a bit worrisome. Why was a captain showing up at a crime scene at 2.30 in the morning? I'm Ryland Finnegan, captain of the Milwaukee Police Tactical Unit. We're in charge of incidences involving explosive devices, among other threats to the community. He crossed over to stand beside her. I'd like to ask you a few questions. I already spoke to the officers. She protested weakly even as her mind spun. A captain of the tactical unit? She shivered again her heart sinking all the way down to the soles of her feet. Staring at the imposing figure before her, she felt certain this was a man who would keep digging into this incident until he knew everything about her, something she desperately wanted to avoid at all costs. Rye couldn't understand why Ms. Devin Thompson was looking at him as if he were a potential threat. Someone had planted an explosive device in her car that had subsequently been blown to smithereens. Shouldn't that person be the source of her fear? Or maybe it was just that she didn't like people in authority. Either way, 
he found her reaction unusual, combined with the fact that someone had blown up her car made her even doubly intriguing. On a professional level, of course, not personally. She was pretty enough, with her dark hair and large eyes, but he wasn't interested. As the oldest of nine siblings and having helped raise most of them in the past ten years since their parents had died in a car crash, he wasn't interested in anything remotely resembling a relationship. He'd had enough family responsibilities to last a lifetime. Still did, since three of the youngest still lived with him in the large six-bedroom home his parents had built 30 years ago. At some point, the last three kids would be gone, and from there, he'd figure out what to do with his personal life. Can we talk tomorrow? Miss Thompson said. She was shivering. Her lightweight, dark jacket wasn't warm enough for the Wisconsin winters. There was also a hole in her fitted black slacks, probably from when she'd fallen after the blast. It's late, and these kind officers were about to drive me home. This won't take long, and I'll drive you home after we're finished. He nodded at the cops. They both likely knew his brother, Taryn, who was a detective with the Milwaukee Police Department. You look cold. Let's head over to my car. We can talk on the way to your place. Miss Thompson looked as if she wanted to refuse, yet managed a nod. Even in the darkness, he could see her smile didn't quite reach her eyes. Sure, that would be fine. Thanks, she belatedly added. This way. He turned and escorted her to his SUV. He opened the passenger door for her, then went over to slide in behind the wheel. When they both had their seatbelts latched, he put the car into gear and pulled away from the curb. What's your address? he asked. I'm in the Pine Ridge apartment building. She lifted her chin as if daring him to say something negative about the place. About five miles from here. I know where it is, he agreed. He kept his thoughts about the high level of crime in that area to himself. Would you mind explaining what happened? She sighed. I'm a server and bartender at the pub. I close Tuesday night through Saturday night. When I finished cleaning the place up, I unlocked my car from the doorway. Next thing I know, I'm lying on my back inside the restaurant, reeling from the blast. Miss Thompson, I know the police probably already asked, but do you have any idea who would do this? An ex-husband or boyfriend? Call me Devin. And no, I have no clue who would do this. As I told the other officers, I've only been in the area for nine months. I relocated here from Detroit. I don't have a boyfriend or an ex-husband. She turned to stare out the window for a long moment before turning back to face him. Honestly, I don't have a single enemy that I'm aware of. There must be someone you've angered at some point or another. She narrowed her gaze. Because of the darkness, he couldn't tell what color her eyes were. Sure, I've fended off a few advances here and there, told several guys to keep their grubby hands to themselves, but to make someone mad enough to plant a bomb in my car? She shook her head. No way. That's far too extreme for the clientele we see. If you ask me, I think the bomber must have chosen my car by mistake. Picking your car by mistake is a possibility we can investigate, but it sounds to me that you're the only person who closes the pub down each night, and your car was the only one parked back there. Yeah, I know. Her voice dropped so low he had trouble hearing her. So maybe the bomber decided to test his bomb on my car. Or maybe there are other cars in the area that have also been wired by this idiot. Wired? He echoed. It was a strange term for a civilian to use. How do you know the bomb was wired? I... don't all bombs have wires? She scowled and crossed her arms over her chest. They do on TV. You triggered the device with a wireless key fob, he pointed out. But yes, most bombs have wires as part of the components. He wasn't about to go in depth about how bombs could be made. There was too much information on the internet about that already. Devin didn't respond, but turned back to stare out the window. She was awfully calm, without any of the hysterics he'd have expected, from someone whose car had just gone up in a ball of flames. People didn't react the same way to grief, death, and other life-altering events. He'd barely had time to grieve after losing his parents. He'd been 26 years old when they died, and his brother Taryn had been 25. Together, they'd held the family together on a wing and a prayer. Mostly prayer. 
What about the owner of McCormick's pub? He asked, turning down the road that would lead to her apartment complex. He found himself hoping Devin didn't make a habit of coming home alone at this hour, with lots of cash in her purse. Talk about being a target for thieves. Have you spoken to him about what happened? I've only met Mac a few times. He stops in occasionally, but we're not friends or anything. I don't have his phone number. But I suppose I should call the manager, Steve Caraco. She frowned, tucking a strand of her dark hair behind her ear. I hate to wake him and his family at this hour. A bomb going off behind the restaurant is a pretty big deal. He pulled into the parking lot in front of the building. But I can call him if that's easier. She hesitated, then nodded. This type of news is probably better coming from you, Captain Finnegan. I'll give you his contact information. Call me Rye, short for Ryland. I don't stand on formality. He smiled, trying to put Devin at ease. She seemed tense and wary, as if she didn't trust him one bit. Maybe she had a history with the police. No criminal record, he'd checked on his way over to the pub, but that didn't mean much. Misdemeanor crimes didn't always make it into the system. Upon hearing she'd lived in Detroit, he made a note to perform a wider background check when he had time. It was possible Devin had made enemies back in Michigan. The cities were roughly the same size, with Detroit being slightly larger, and it wasn't that far to travel by car, roughly six to seven hours, depending on Chicago traffic. Yeah, the more he thought about it, the more he felt certain that some guy she'd escaped back in Detroit had driven down to exact revenge. Not that car bombs were often used in such a way. That fact alone was what had brought him out to investigate in the first place. He'd gotten a call from the precinct, as bombs tended to land within his purview. Well, thanks for the ride. Devin reached for the door handle, but he stopped her with a hand on her arm. She whirled to glare at him so fast he quickly let her go. Sorry, but I have a few more questions. How long did you live in Detroit? Is it possible someone there has a reason to come after you? I told you, I don't have any ex-boyfriends who would do something like this. Not from Detroit or anywhere else for that matter. Her gaze bored into his. If I knew who did this, I would tell you. I don't like knowing my car was used as an experiment by some bomb-crazy dude. Her gaze slid from his, and this time he didn't stop her from getting out of the SUV. Instead... He quickly joined her in the biting cold. What are you doing? She demanded. Her suspicious nature was off the charts, but he cut her some slack, considering her car had gone up in a ball of flames. I'm walking you up to your apartment. It's the middle of the night, and you promised to give me Steve Caracco's contact information, remember? She hunched her shoulders but seemed to relax a bit. Yes, I did. Are you ready? She pulled out her phone and scrolled through her contacts. When she rattled off the number, he punched it into his phone. Thanks. He typed in the guy's name, then tucked the phone away. Lead on. I'm fine. I come home at this hour all the time, she protested. He arched a brow. I'm not leaving you alone, so let's go. She grimaced and headed toward the building. He fell into step beside her, sweeping his gaze over the area on alert for any potential threat. Rye had been a cop for 15 years now, thankful for the job that had helped keep the family afloat after his parents died. He couldn't deny the job had been good to him. He'd managed to move up the ranks, first earning a spot on the coveted tactical unit, then eventually being promoted to captain. Devin opened the door to the building. He frowned. No locks? She snorted. The lock has been broken since the day I moved in. You need to call the manager, he said. Yeah, like I haven't tried that already. She threw him an exasperated look, then took the stairs to the second level. As they passed down the hall, he noticed each apartment door was made of flimsy, hollow wood, the kind of door that wouldn't withstand a swift kick from an average-sized man. A guy could force his way inside without breaking a sweat. No way on earth would he allow one of his sisters to live in a place like this. Half the hallway lights didn't work either. He scowled, thinking about how vulnerable Devin was coming home to this each night, especially with cash in her pocket. Looking down at the floor, he noticed a very small piece of wire, 
from the broken lights. Stop! This time, he used both hands to lightly grasp Devin's shoulders. How do you know someone didn't plant a bomb here? She froze, her apartment key in her hand. Slowly, she turned to look over her shoulder at him. Why would someone do that? I don't know. The bit of wire could mean something or nothing, but he wasn't about to take the chance, not with the lack of security around here. He drew her back away from the door, then used his phone to call in his team. This is Captain Finnegan. Possible explosive device in the Pine Ridge apartment building, Unit 214. I want a team here to investigate ASAP. Really? That seems drastic, she protested. No, it's not. He let go of her shoulders and gestured toward the stairs. Let's go. You're not going near this place until it's been cleared. She hesitated, and for a moment, he feared she'd jump forward and unlock the door to prove him wrong. But common sense must have prevailed. She meekly followed him down the stairs to the first floor foyer area, where they waited for his team to arrive. He had some gear in his SUV. He was always prepared for action, but he didn't bother to head outside to grab it. He didn't dare leave this woman alone. It didn't take long for several members of his tactical team to arrive. They were dressed in full gear, including helmets and face coverings. He briefed them on the situation, then led Devin outside to wait. Ten minutes later, Joe Kingsley returned, his expression grim. Good call, Cap. There was just enough room beneath the door to get a mirror under there. We found a small device stuck to the doorway. We'll get the place evacuated and then get inside to take care of the device. Wait, what? Another bomb? Her voice rose in agitation. You're saying there's another bomb in my apartment? Devin's eyes widened with fear. Why? How? What's happening? Good questions. Too bad Rye felt certain she was the only one who could provide the answers. Regardless of who was responsible... It was obvious Devin Thompson couldn't stay there or anywhere close by, not when the bomber had gone to great lengths to set explosive devices meant to kill her. No, he was stuck with her, at least until he could get to the bottom of this. Chapter 2 Bombs in her car and her apartment. Devin couldn't wrap her mind around the fact that someone had targeted her, She'd honestly believed the bomb planted in her car was a practice run for some joker who thought it would be fun to blow things up. But the device found in her apartment blew that theory right out of the water. Numb from shock, she stood beside Rye, her arms wrapped tightly around her torso, fighting to hold herself together. Who would do this? And why? The guys will take care of the bomb and question the apartment residents if they saw anything suspicious. Rye rested a hand on her back. Let's get you out of here. And go where? She didn't move, mentally counting the cash in her purse. It hadn't been a bad night. She had maybe a hundred and fifty in tips. Unfortunately, she didn't think that would go too far in getting a hotel room. She didn't own a credit card either, preferring to pay as she went. Her bank account held a little over seven hundred bucks, but she needed every dollar she made to go toward her next month's rent. I can give you two choices, Rye said. But let's talk in the car where it's warmer, okay? Two choices? She suspected one choice was to go with him, which was so not happening. Still, she needed a ride, so she nodded. Rye opened the car door for her, using manners that must have been ingrained at a young age as he seemed to act without thinking. When she was settled inside, he closed the door and went around to get in behind the wheel. I'm the oldest of nine kids and have been helping to raise my siblings since our parents died ten years ago. She blinked. Nine? A faint smile tugged at the corner of his mouth. Yeah, crazy, huh? Anyway, my three youngest siblings still live at the house where we all grew up. It's not that far from here, and believe it or not, there are two bedrooms that aren't being used. She frowned. You're offering me one of the bedrooms? for me to spend what's left of the night at your house. He nodded slowly. I promise that you'll have all the protection and privacy you need, and this guy who's been planting bombs would never think to look for you there. That was true, and despite her earlier thought that she'd never accept his so-called hospitality, 
she found herself leaning toward doing just that. Maybe she was losing her mind, but she trusted that Rye wouldn't hurt her. You mentioned two options. I'll pay for a hotel room, he offered. The downside is that you'll have to check out by 10 or 11 at the latest. It's already going on 3 in the morning, and that doesn't leave much time for you to get some sleep. I can always pay for a late checkout or pay for two nights, too. Even with the team taking care of the bomb tonight, you shouldn't go back there anytime soon. Devin eyed him warily, wondering if he was for real. Not that she hadn't met some great people, because she had, but she'd also experienced many a bad apple, too. Why do you care how much sleep I get? He shrugged. I guess that comes from having younger sisters. Honestly, I would hope someone would look after them the same way if they ended up in a similar situation. There was something honorable about him. The fact that he'd started the conversation about being the oldest of nine had certainly caught her off guard. Maybe he was treating her like a younger sister, which was kind of sweet. As an only child, she'd always fended for herself. Yet she couldn't deny it was nice to know someone cared whether she lived or died. And she'd also dealt with enough gropers to know Rye was not one of them. He was so incredibly handsome with his short blonde hair and dark eyes that he didn't need to grope a woman. She had no doubt women threw themselves at him voluntarily. Okay, staying at your house is fine. She lifted a hand as he started the engine. But no funny business. He frowned. You don't have to be afraid. No one will hurt you at the Finnegan homestead. The Finnegan homestead? She shook her head. I can't say I've heard anyone refer to their house in that way. Yeah, well, nine kids, remember? It was pretty much a wild place, especially after the twins were born. Then there was the oops baby, too. He waited for her to clip on her seatbelt before pulling out of the parking lot. Our parents always called it that. I guess the name stuck even after they passed away. Twins? And then an oops baby? Good grief, she couldn't imagine. Then his parents had died, leaving him in charge of the whole family. I'm sorry for your loss. She felt guilty she hadn't said it earlier. Obviously, she was out of practice with this sort of thing. I'm sure that was difficult for your entire family. He nodded, but didn't say anything more. Doubts assailed her. Was she making a mistake in going with him? A hotel room would probably be safer. Yet, she didn't even have a car to leave when it was time to check out. Sure, the buses would be running, but where would she go? The pub? No way. With a grimace, she lifted a hand to massage the back of her head, feeling the lump swelling there. She vaguely remembered her head hitting the floor when she'd been thrown backward after the explosion. You don't have a gun or a knife in there, do you? Huh? She realized she was gripping her purse with white fingers. No, I don't. But you can search it if you'd like. I would like to search your purse, if you don't mind. He slanted her a glance. It's not that I don't trust you, but I need to protect my family. Understandable. First the officer on scene, now this. For a moment, she wished her father had cared about protecting his family, rather than going off the deep end about the government infringing on his rights. With a grimace, she thrust those thoughts aside. Her father would never see the light of day outside the federal prison. Fifteen minutes later, Rye pulled up the driveway of a massive red brick house. Easy to believe he'd been telling the truth when he said he had an extra bedroom for her to use. In addition to the front porch light, there was a faint glow coming from one of the upstairs windows. It made her wonder if Rye had been here at home when he'd heard the news about her car explosion. When the massive garage door opened, revealing three stalls, two filled with cars, he pulled into the empty space then held out a hand for her purse. She gave it to him, and he made quick work of looking for a weapon. Thanks for understanding. He passed it back. Of course. The entire situation was surreal. From her car exploding, Rye driving her home, finding the bomb in her apartment, then offering her a place to stay, she felt as if she'd landed in an alternate universe. Less than two hours ago, she'd been irritated at her lingering customers for taking so long to go home. Now she had no car, no apartment, at least for the next few days, and a killer out to get her. No wonder her head hurt. She followed Rye into the house, looking around in surprise at the homey atmosphere. 
The place wasn't dirty, but it wasn't neat and tidy either. It was clear by the jackets, books, and other things lying around that several people lived here. She shrugged out of her coat, as did Rye. He hung them on a hook in the large mudroom. Three of his youngest siblings, or so he'd said. For the first time, she wondered how old Rye was and what the ages of the kids who lived there were. Physically, Rye didn't look old, but his mannerisms screamed responsibility. This way, he said, once again putting a hand on her back to gently steer her toward the curved staircase. She'd never lived in a place this big, although she imagined it had seemed small and crowded, with nine kids and two parents living there. You can sleep here, and the bathroom is right next door, Rye gestured with one hand. The bathroom is also used by my youngest sister, Ellie, but she should be gone by ten o'clock or so tomorrow morning. Ellie is a pretty name. In Irish, it means light, he smiled. Get some sleep, Devin. Thank you. She watched him move down the hall to the room on the end. Slipping inside the guest room, she could tell it had once been used by another of his sisters, based on the pretty pastel coloring of the bedspread and curtains. After cleaning up in the bathroom, trying to be quiet for Ellie's sake, she slipped into the bedroom, closing and locking the door. Stripping off her pub t-shirt and black slacks, she crawled into the large bed. Being in unfamiliar surroundings, she felt certain she wouldn't be able to sleep, especially not after everything that had happened. To her surprise, though, she found herself relaxing into the soft bed, feeling safe and secure for the first time since her car blew up in front of her eyes. As she drifted off to sleep, she warned herself that this was a temporary arrangement, a nice but brief reprieve from the harsh reality of her life. Tomorrow, or the following day at the most, she'd be back in her cramped apartment. Why on earth had he brought a strange woman to the Finnegan homestead? Maybe he was losing his marbles because normally he didn't take in strays. That was Ellie's gift. Raising his siblings had been his only focus for years. There hadn't been room for anything more, or anyone. Not to mention, he didn't trust Devin. Oh, not that he thought she'd physically hurt him or his siblings. He had a weapon, as did Aiden, who served in the National Guard. No, it was more that he knew Devin wasn't being entirely honest about the identity of the bomber. No stranger went out of his or her way to plant bombs in someone's personal vehicle and living space with the intent to kill. Every cell in his body screamed this was a personal, targeted attack. Devin knew something that she was holding back. In truth, he'd hoped that inviting her to stay here would help break through her defenses. After making sure she was settled in her room, he tiptoed back downstairs and left a brief note on the whiteboard mounted in the kitchen for Ellie and the twins. Aiden and Alana, about their houseguest. They would be curious, but he could fill them in on the details later. Aiden was heading out for more National Guard training in the morning anyway, and Ellie had classes, so it would just be Alana here by the time Devin woke up. Alana was an ER nurse at Trinity Medical Center, the large Level 1 trauma center located just a few miles away. Alana worked 12-hour shifts, but she was off work the next four days, including the weekend. Keeping track of his siblings' schedules wasn't easy, but thankfully they didn't mind keeping him in the loop. They had a family calendar, which also helped. Rye managed to get a few hours of sleep before he heard someone, likely Ellie and Aiden, moving around downstairs. Raking a hand through his hair, he thought, not for the first time, how nice it would be to get a full eight hours of sleep. A rarity, even now that the youngest were older. He figured, even after the twins and Ellie moved out on their own, he'd still have trouble staying asleep. Waking at the slightest sound had been his norm for a long time. Pulling on jeans and a long-sleeved t-shirt, he stuffed his feet into a pair of shoes and padded down to the kitchen. The scent of coffee welcomed him, and he instantly crossed over to the half-filled pot. Who is Devin? Ellie demanded before he'd so much as taken a sip. You've never brought a woman here before, Rye. Swallowing a sigh, he turned to face her. There were 12 years between them, and he often had to remind himself she was 24 now, not 14. Don't go thinking this is the beginning of a personal relationship, Al. She needed a place to stay, that's all. Why can't it be personal? She planted her hands on her hips. How long has it been since you've gone out with a woman, Rye? Oh, I'll tell you. 
She held up her hands, one with five fingers splayed wide, the other with three. Eight years! That's how long! He tried not to grimace. Ellie might be the youngest, but she was constantly badgering him about finding a woman to share his life with. He didn't want to explain that he wasn't interested in raising another family. Been there, done that, and didn't need to ride the roller coaster again, thanks very much. Besides, Rachel had given it her best, at least in the beginning. Trying to have a relationship when you had a house full of young adults and teenagers coming and going had proven impossible. His schedule changed on a moment's notice, and to be fair, he'd usually put Rachel last as far as his priorities went. It hadn't taken her long to bug out, starting an affair with his close friend before he'd even realized what was going on. And while he sometimes missed having a woman in his life, he did not miss having one more person depending on him. You have to admit, it's not usual for you to bring a stranger to the homestead, Aiden pointed out. His youngest brother was dressed in his National Guard training gear. Did you hide the silver? Ha ha, very funny. He narrowed his gaze at his brother. We don't have any silver. Devin doesn't know that, Aiden drawled. The place is huge. She could be sneaking through the place searching for valuables at this very moment. No, she's sleeping, but her door is locked. Ellie turned to look at him. Did you scare her or what? I don't scare people. At least, not on purpose. He took a sip of his coffee. You have class soon, don't you? If you don't get going, you won't finish in May. Don't try to change the subject. Ellie glared at him. We're all adults. You don't need to keep sacrificing your life for us. He didn't point out that Ellie was on her third career goal, currently taking the emergency medical technician program. Maybe once she was settled in a regular job and able to support herself, he could relax. But that was not today. I'm not sacrificing anything, he assured her. I promise. Yeah, so you keep saying, Aiden said dryly. We still don't believe you. He clapped Rye on the shoulder. Gotta run. Training lasts for the next four days. I won't be back until Sunday. Okay, be safe, Aiden. Rye took another sip of his coffee. The caffeine wasn't hitting him hard enough to continue arguing with Ellie. Despite being the youngest, she'd proven to be his most tenacious sibling. Come on, Rye. Ellie came over to put her arm around his waist. I took a family poll. We all want you to move on with your life. I'm living my best life, Elle. He kissed the top of her strawberry blonde hair. I promise I won't hold back if I find someone I'm interested in, okay? And that's something I pray for every night, Rye. Her comment took him by surprise. Then she grinned. Along with praying I pass this program, I want to make sure I hold up my end of the family mission of helping others. You'll be great, he smiled reassuringly. And I told you, there's no reason to stay focused on health care or police work or anything else that the rest of our siblings are doing. You can do anything you want, Ellie. I know. She hugged him, then slipped away. I was hoping to meet Devin before I left, but we're doing a study group before class. I'll be home to make dinner later, though, if you're interested. That would be great. Thanks. He was touched at how his youngest sister pitched in to help. Considering they'd all spoiled her, especially after the devastating loss of their parents, he was proud of the woman she'd become. Ellie filled her to-go coffee mug, then slipped into her jacket and reached for her backpack. Please tell Devin there's plenty of food if she wants to stay for dinner. She can have Aiden's portion, since I forgot he was doing National Guard training. He hesitated, since it hadn't been his plan to have Devin stay all day, much less for the evening meal, but nodded. Sure. Oh, one more thing. Ellie paused at the doorway leading to the garage. I found a family connection on the DNA site I've been researching. What kind of connection? Rye didn't understand why Ellie wanted more family connections. Really, wasn't having eight siblings enough? Six cousins, last name Callahan, she grinned. I reached out to find out more. Hopefully they don't live far away. Wouldn't it be awesome to meet them? No, he thought, but he forced a smile. Yep. Later, Rye. Ellie flashed him a grin as she headed out. He leaned his hip against the counter and drank his coffee, pushing thoughts of Ellie's possible DNA connection out of his mind to focus on the woman sleeping upstairs.
Two bombs, one in her car and one in her apartment. It bothered him to think about what would have happened if the police officers had driven her home. If they'd escorted her all the way upstairs, they would have likely died in the blast along with Devin. Yeah, this had to be personal. Pushing away from the counter, he found his computer bag. After setting it up, he sat at the table and logged in. Last night, he'd done a quick background check on Devin Thompson, but it was well past time to dig a little deeper. Starting with her time living in Detroit, Michigan, someone in her past must have followed her here, or she'd been hiding the truth about an old boyfriend, although why she would bother, he had no clue. There had to be something, somewhere to explain the recent events. He was deep into his search, with nothing to show for it, when he heard footsteps coming down from the second floor. Assuming Alana was up, he didn't bother to tear his gaze away. Devin didn't have much of a financial history, which was highly unusual. Do you mind if I have some coffee? He jerked around, surprised to see Devin standing near the counter. So much for my cop instincts, he thought wryly. If she'd been a serial killer, he'd be dead. Help yourself. Then he realized the pot was nearly empty. He jumped up, slamming his knee against the leg of the table. Finnegan's didn't curse. Even in death, he'd known his mother would come back to haunt him if he did, so he swallowed a groan and limped toward her. Oh, sorry, I'll make a fresh pot. Between me, Ellie, and Aiden, we drank most of it. Two of the three younger siblings? she asked. The twins, I assume. Ah, uh, no, Aiden and Alana are the twins. Ellie is the youngest. It was a good thing he had something to keep his hands occupied because, in the light of day, Devin was stunningly beautiful. Her clear blue eyes seemed to look right through him, and he found himself knocked off balance at having her here. After all, as Ellie pointed out, he hadn't brought a woman home since Rachel, and they'd broken up eight long years ago. Working already? Devin asked, gesturing to the computer. Yes. Once the carafe was dripping with fresh coffee, he turned to face her. But you already know what I've found, don't you? The lie slipped out before he could stop it, making him inwardly wince at the way he was treating her like a perp rather than a woman who was targeted by a mad bomber. No, I don't. She tipped her head to the side. Why don't you enlighten me? A thudding of more footsteps gave him pause. Yep, this time it was Alana. She burst into the kitchen, then comically stopped short. Oh, wow, sorry, Rye. I, uh, didn't mean to interrupt. You aren't. He gestured to the white erase board. Oh. Alana quickly read the note, then shrugged. Hey, you can't blame me for hoping. Devin, is it? Nice to meet you. I'm Alana. It's nice to meet you. I guess you're one of the twins? Devin smiled as she shook Alana's hand. I missed your brother Aiden and your other sister Ellie. Have you met the others? Taryn, Kylie, Brady, Quinn, and Colin? Alana asked. No. Rye had to grin at the momentary panic that flashed in Devin's eyes. They don't live here though, right? Right. At least, not now. We've all been known to bounce back to the homestead on occasion. Alana grinned. How did you and Ryland meet? Enough with the interrogation. Rye protested firmly. Read the note. This isn't a social call, Alana. Right, sorry. His sister grinned, not the least bit apologetic. He wondered for the third time why he'd thought this was a good idea. Your brother takes his responsibilities seriously, Devin said. Alana snorted with laughter. Oh, you have no idea. Getting there, Devin said dryly. I guess I should be glad I've only had to meet one of the infamous nine. Rye eyed Alana's scrubs. I thought you were off the weekend. His sister rolled her eyes. I was, but agreed to pitch in to help. Only doing an eight-hour shift, though, instead of twelve. You didn't put that on the family calendar, he said. Ellie is making dinner. Well, I just picked up last night when they begged me to come in. Alana glanced at her watch. I should get going or I'll be late. Wish I could stay and chat more, Devin, but maybe we'll see each other later? You'll be home around eight o'clock tonight, he pressed. It really bugged him when his siblings didn't use the family calendar, as if it wasn't chaotic enough around here. At the latest, unless there's some sort of disaster, you know how it goes, Rye. 
Alana drew on her coat and grabbed a large canvas bag. Bye! A long silence hung in the room after his sister's departure. The coffee pot was more than half full, so he pulled out a mug and filled it for Devin. Cream or sugar? Um, both please. She looked bemused as he pushed a sugar bowl toward her and then pulled a carton of creamer from the fridge. I guess I didn't give you enough credit, Rye. I can't imagine how difficult it must have been for you to hold such a large family together after losing your parents. He shrugged. There wasn't much choice. I did what needed to be done. But remember, my brother Taryn helped. I don't think I could have managed without him. I admire you, she said in a low voice. I'm sure your siblings drive you crazy, but it's clear they love you. He got the sense she was talking more about herself than his family. Devin, please sit down. We need to talk. She stirred her coffee for a moment, then reluctantly moved toward the table, dropping into a chair. He refilled his mug, then joined her. I need you to trust me. I do. The words sounded more like a question than an answer. Then she blew out a breath. Look, Rai, I appreciate everything you've done for me, but I think it's best if you drive me to the bus station. I'll be out of your hair in no time. The way you left Detroit nine months ago? He held her gaze. Not an option, Devin. Besides, what's to prevent this guy from following you again? He knew exactly where you worked, what time you finished your shift, and where you live. He scowled. Why on earth won't you help me find him? I don't know who he is. Her frustration rang true, but then she added, Although I suspect I may know why. Now they were getting somewhere. And the motive behind the bombing is what exactly? Potentially linked to my father. She stared at her coffee for a long moment before lifting her gaze to his. Paul Rowe. The name instantly clicked in his memory. Roe was convicted of bombing several government buildings in Chicago eight years ago. They called him the Stealth Bomber. He didn't add that his buddy Jerome Parker had died in that last explosion. It was the reason he joined the tactical unit. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Her shoulders slumped. He's still in federal prison, serving multiple life sentences without parole, so I know he's not responsible for this. But it's possible someone is seeking revenge against me for being his daughter. Sitting back in his chair, his mind whirled. Devin Thompson wasn't her real name, which explained the lack of a criminal record. He didn't want to know how many laws she'd broken in obtaining a fake ID, as those were the least of his worries. Was this a copycat bomber? Someone trying to gain notoriety by targeting the stealth bomber's daughter? Were other explosive devices hidden someplace close to where Devin lived and worked? If so, he and his team needed to find them before it was too late. Chapter 3 The flash of disappointment in Rye's brown eyes bothered her more than it should have. He'd been kind enough to bring her to his home to get some sleep, but now his guard was up and he gave her a grim stare. Your father killed dozens of people, including innocent kids at a daycare center. Did he think she didn't know that? She dropped her gaze to her coffee. Yes, he did many horrible things. She drew in a shaky breath and then met his bold stare. But I didn't. He winced and nodded. You're right. Your father is responsible for his own actions, not you. Why do you think I changed my name? She asked wearily. The few hours of sleep she'd gotten weren't enough. The reality of her car blowing up and the bomb being in her apartment had begun to nag at her, pulling her from slumber. Do you have any idea how many people blame me for what he's done? Even the police acted as if I should have known his plans and stopped him. A bitter laugh escaped her. I hadn't seen him in years, and it's not like he called to run his crazy bombing scheme past me. Were you estranged? Rye asked. She glanced around the large kitchen, understanding where he was going with his question. From the brief interaction she'd had with his family, there was no way he'd be clueless as to what his siblings were up to. It wouldn't surprise her in the least to learn they gathered together on a regular basis for family meals. 
Not all families are like yours. She sipped her coffee, needing the sustenance. She decided to give him the shortened version. My parents divorced when I was ten. I pretty much lived with my mom, visiting my dad every other weekend. But those visits grew farther apart over the years and stopped altogether when I was sixteen. She shrugged. So no, we weren't estranged per se, but we weren't close either. I tried to mend fences after mom died, but... He wasn't interested. You really had no idea he was the stealth bomber. That's correct. It had been several years since she'd had to defend herself in the court of public opinion, and she didn't much care for it now. Believe what you want. I need to go. She reached for her phone, intending to call for a rideshare. With a sigh, she noticed the battery was less than 10%. Her phone was old and outdated which was why the battery life was terrible. Buying a new one was an expense she couldn't afford, and that was a problem for another day. She stood and glanced around for her coat. Hold on, you can't leave, Rye protested. A shiver of fear skated down her spine. Why not? Are you planning to hold me hostage? No. He looked appalled at the idea, then hastily backtracked. I'm sorry, but... I need to ask you to please stay for a while yet. Based on this possibly being connected to your father, I would like to call my team so we can double-check the pub. And I'm concerned there may be other devices hidden in your apartment building too. It will take time for us to completely clear both locations. More devices? She gripped her coffee mug tightly. That possibility hadn't occurred to her. I appreciate your concern, but I can't just sit at your house all day. I need to call my insurance agent about my car and... Her voice trailed off. Her out-of-pocket car insurance deductible was a thousand dollars, which she didn't have. Well, she had most of that in her bank account, but it was earmarked to go toward her next month's rent and utilities. I know you're feeling helpless and uncomfortable here. Rye stood and faced her. But you can't go back to the pub or your apartment until we know they are safe. I'd rather ride along with you. She couldn't explain why she didn't want him to leave her behind. Please, I promise I won't get in your way. It's too cold to sit in the car. I don't mind. She waved a hand toward the living room. I saw a plaid blanket I could borrow for a few hours. That will keep me warm enough. His brow furrowed. I don't take civilians to possible crime scenes. I was already at both crime scenes. My car went up in flames in front of my eyes, remember? She battled a flash of annoyance. Obviously, my life is in danger, and I refuse to sit here doing nothing. If you won't take me along, then I'll get a rideshare. She hoped he wouldn't call her bluff. Although she felt certain if he decided to leave her behind, she'd be able to hunt up a spare cable cord somewhere in the massive place to recharge her phone. She didn't want to pry or poke through the Finnegan family's personal belongings, but she would if she had to. He let out a loud sigh. Fine, but I need to make a few calls first. Then we'll stop and grab something to eat along the way. Sounds good. She glanced toward the fridge. Or I could make breakfast while you make your calls. He arched a brow. You cook? Not gourmet meals or anything, but I can manage breakfast. She'd put in lots of hours working in various restaurants as a cook, bartender, and server. That would be very nice, thanks. He moved toward the doorway, leading to the living room. Then he glanced back at her with a wry grin. Do me a favor and try not to burn the house down. One explosion was enough. I'll do my best. She found herself smiling at his back, which was unusual because happiness had been in short supply recently. She gave herself a mental shake. This brief connection with Ryland Finnegan wouldn't last. In fact, she'd figured she'd need to move on once the bomb threat had been neutralized. After that, she wouldn't see Rye again. Her growling stomach had her moving across the kitchen. Surprisingly, the fridge was jam-packed with food. The Finnegans clearly liked to eat, but it also made it difficult to find everything she needed. Soon, though, she was hard at work. She made a large ham and veggie omelet for Rye. As she slid it onto a plate, he returned from making his calls. Just in time. She handed him the plate. Hope you're not too picky, as I tossed in a bit of everything. 
Not picky at all, this looks amazing. He gave her a look of appreciation. Thanks. You're welcome. She turned back to the stove to make one for herself. While she waited for the eggs to cook, she frowned, noticing Rye wasn't eating. What's wrong? Nothing. He looked confused for a moment, then added, I'm waiting for you. Oh. Flustered, she turned back to the omelet. Hers was smaller than his and didn't take as long to cook. She joined him at the table, frowning slightly. You should have eaten while it was still hot. Family rules, he said with a shrug. Then he surprised her by bowing his head. Dear Lord, we thank you for this food we are about to eat. Please continue to keep the Finnegan family and Devin safe in your care. Amen. Devin wasn't sure what to make of his prayer, especially the way he'd included her, but she murmured, Amen. Rye smiled, then took a big bite of his omelet. His dark eyes widened with appreciation. Wow, this is great, Devin. Thanks. Her cheeks warmed, and she did her best not to overreact to his praise. Omelets weren't complicated, and there had been so much food available it wasn't difficult to pull something together, unlike her bare fridge back at the apartment. In some respects, being in the Finnegan homestead was as foreign as being in another country. She'd been on her own for a long time, making do with entry-level positions even while attending college part-time. Her goal of obtaining a marketing degree had changed dramatically after her father's arrest. Whatever. None of that mattered now. She quickly ate her omelet, telling herself she only had to get through the next few hours. Maybe she could even work her shift at the pub tonight. She found it difficult to believe this new bomber had planted other devices in the pub and her apartment building. It was nice that Rye wanted to be sure, but once that was done, she could move on with her life. When she finished her meal, she carried her dishes to the sink. She filled the sink with water, but Rye stopped her. Those can wait. I'll take care of them later. We need to go. Okay. She turned and reached for her coat and purse. Rye went to the living room to grab the plaid blanket. She took it from him, knowing the soft flannel would keep her warm. As they left the house, she glanced back over her shoulder one last time. Deep down, she couldn't help but marvel at how wonderful it must be to live there, especially with the camaraderie of the Finnegan siblings. Rye shouldn't have been surprised to learn Devin was a good cook. Being so slender, he'd figured she was either a picky eater or preferred salads, but the way she dug into her omelet with gusto proved him wrong. As he drove to the pub, he could admit he'd been wrong about several things. Granted, Devin hadn't been entirely honest with him, but he could understand why she'd held back. He couldn't imagine going through life with everyone knowing your father was the infamous stealth bomber the man responsible for causing so much harm and destruction in Chicago. The man had blown up four government buildings, including one that was located next to a daycare center. That blast alone had killed ten young, innocent children, along with injuring countless others. To be honest, he'd have wanted to change his name too. He'd always been proud of the Finnegan family legacy, one that was based on service to the community. Everyone in the family had taken after their parents in becoming first responders. His dad had been a cop, his mom a nurse. As kids, they'd learned from their role models. Granted, a few of them had strayed outside the typical firefighter, paramedic, cop, and EMT, but every job they'd chosen was one in which the main goal was to protect and serve. Ellie was the only one who'd struggled to find her niche. She hadn't made it through the police academy, then she had dropped out of college when trying to become a nurse. He hoped the EMT program worked out for her. Her kind-hearted and empathetic nature made it difficult for her to face the terrible truth about how some people treated each other. He prayed for her often, along with the rest of his siblings, but in the end, he could only leave Ellie's future in God's hands. The trip to the pub didn't take long. Thankfully, his team was already assembled. He'd called ahead to Steve Caraco, the restaurant manager after leaving a message last night asking for the guy to meet them out front. At first, Caraco had sounded irritated, but upon hearing about Devin's car explosion and the possibility of other devices, he had quickly changed his tune. He shut down the SUV and turned toward Devin. I really need you to stay here, okay? The team knows what to do, and you being there will only prolong things. I understand. 
She looked subdued, clutching the plaid blanket. Will you let me know what you find? Yes. It wasn't normal protocol to include a victim in the investigation, but he'd decided to make an exception. Devin had been targeted, likely by someone who knew her true identity and about her father. She deserved to know if they found additional explosive devices. Thank you. You're welcome. He resisted the urge to take her hand, pushing out of the SUV instead. The cold air nipped at his skin, thankfully not as chilly as yesterday, and he quickly shut the door to keep the interior of the SUV warm. Shaking off ridiculous fears of Devin getting cold, he approached the guys who'd come to do the sweep. Cap? Kyle greeted him with a nod. Sounds like you've been busy. He nodded. I'll gear up to join you, but we need to go through the building in segments. We'll start with the dining room, the bar, restrooms, then move into the kitchen, supply room, and office area. He raked his gaze over the group. Any questions? Nope, we're good to go, Leo said. Let's do it. Once the manager gets here, he agreed. As if on cue, a pickup truck rolled to the curb and a paunchy guy in his forties slid out from behind the wheel. Rye stepped forward. Mr. Caraco, I'm Captain Finnegan. We spoke earlier. Yes, we did. I, uh, can't believe this is happening. Here, I brought the key. Caraco held out the key for Rye to take. I hope you don't find more bombs in there. I hope not too. He took the key. Stay here. We'll let you know when it's safe to go inside. Caraco gave a jerky nod and returned to his truck. Rye pocketed the key, then went to his SUV to grab his gear. Once he was ready, he joined the rest of his team. Unlocking the front door, he led the way inside. The place looked to be a typical Irish pub, one of many in the city. Lots of Irish immigrated to the state of Wisconsin over the years, like his great-grandparents. But most of the Irish pubs were no longer owned and operated by the Irish. Still, it seemed to be a nice restaurant, better than he'd expected. He and his team fanned out to search for hidden devices. Because the pub was empty, the task didn't take long. He paid special attention to the storage area, figuring that might be the spot chosen by the bomber, especially if his goal was to target Devin. Although, now that he thought about it, Devin's father had positioned his bombs for maximum destruction. The more lives at risk, the better. If this new perp was a stealth bomber wannabe, then why not do the same thing? It wasn't at all logical. Not that anyone setting bombs to blow things up and to hurt people made sense, except to the warped mind of the bomber himself. He wished he'd known about the possible connection to the stealth bomber sooner. He needed to go back and dig up the old files, see what, if any, connections there might be. Devin said she was an only child, so it couldn't be an older brother, but maybe an uncle or a cousin. Bathrooms are clear, Kyle called. Rye focused his attention on finishing the task in front of him. Supply room is clear, he called. Office is clear, another guy added. Kitchen? He raised his voice. Have you guys cleared the kitchen? Working on it, Joe Kingsley said, a bit of an edge to his tone. Lots of nooks and crannies in here. Coming, Rye hustled over to join them. Joe was right. There were lots of places to hide a potential bomb. It took them 30 minutes to check the kitchen, including the large walk-in fridge and freezer. Looks like this place is clean, Kyle said. Yeah, Rye couldn't help feeling relieved. Let's head over to the apartment building. I don't think the bomber said anything in the other apartments, too risky to stumble across people who might be at home, but we need to double-check the basement laundry room and the area outside the building. We went through the basement last night, Joe said, but we didn't search the surrounding area. Rye nodded. We'll double check, just to be sure. The guys looked at each other, shrugged, and nodded. You're the boss. He went outside to give the key back to Caraco. The pub is safe. You're cleared to open for business. I'm going to advise Devin not to work today or tomorrow either. I hope you understand. Of course. Thanks. Caraco looked relieved. I appreciate it. After stripping off his gear and storing it in the back of the SUV, he slid in behind the wheel. Devin was curled in the blanket, but didn't look too uncomfortable. She abruptly straightened when he joined her. Well? We didn't find anything, 
He quickly started the SUV, cranking the heat for her benefit. We'll head to your apartment building next. I'm surprised you went inside with the others. She held her hands by the vents to warm them. He frowned, realizing she didn't have gloves. I thought the boss stayed outside to give orders. He arched a brow. Not this boss. If not for the bump in pay, he wouldn't have bothered to climb the administrative ranks. But keeping the Finnegan homestead in good repair, paying the astronomical property taxes and utilities, not to mention supporting his siblings, he'd known it was for the best to seek promotions that would provide a higher income. And the others all gladly chipped in too. Given a choice, I'd rather be on the front lines. She frowned. Then you should be. You're in a position to do whatever you want. Not even close, he thought, but he let it go. Once we clear the area around your apartment building, we'll discuss our next steps. What do you mean? I was planning to go home. He frowned. This bomber knows where you live. It's not smart to go back. The guys removed the device from your apartment, but that required breaking in through a window to access the bomb. They boarded it up, but you shouldn't return until it's replaced. She stared at him for a long moment. They broke a window? And what, used a ladder to get inside my second floor apartment? Yes. He wasn't about to apologize for doing the right thing. It was the only way to safely get the bomb deactivated. Keep in mind, if it blew, others may have suffered too. I know, she murmured. It's just, I'm still having trouble understanding why this guy has targeted me. I'm more interested in how he found you, considering you changed your name. Rye grimaced. I assume it's a fake ID, combined with a fake social security number. She didn't answer, which basically confirmed what he'd already known. He pulled into the narrow parking lot behind the building. With the engine still running, he asked, Are you sure you'll be warm enough? I'll be fine. She tugged the edges of the plaid blanket closer. Reminding himself that she'd insisted on coming along, he slid out of the SUV. Once again, he donned his gear, then joined the team. I know you cleared the apartment and the basement yesterday, so let's focus on the surrounding area. He pointed to various team members. North, south, east, and west, okay? Once we're convinced it's safe, we'll allow the residents to come back. Got it, they responded in unison. With a nod, he joined Kyle in heading to the east. In his mind, that was the most logical place to stash a bomb, somewhere that wasn't far from the narrow parking lot. They moved cautiously, examining the snow and icy ground intently as they went. The snow had fallen a few days ago, so it was possible the bomber had hidden a device within a pile of snow, making sure it wasn't too noticeable. This was the type of search that couldn't be rushed, but as he poked his gloved finger into several small snow hills, he found nothing suspicious. Neither did the rest of his team. An hour later, they came together to quickly debrief. There was no evidence the bomber had set another device there or at the pub, which, in his mind, was both good and bad news. Two bombs wouldn't be enough for this perp, not if he envisioned himself as the next stealth bomber, even more so because his second device had failed to detonate, which he probably knew by now, since the explosion hadn't made the news. Rye glanced around the building, wondering if the perp had been hiding someplace nearby to watch. Some bombers were like arsonists, in that they loved to see the results of their work. He made a mental note to discuss this case with his brother Colin. Colin was a firefighter slash paramedic working out of the fire station not far from here. Maybe he'd have an idea of where this guy might strike next. Unfortunately, Rye was out of ideas. He rubbed the back of his neck wishing he'd been able to get more sleep. Need anything else, Cap? He took a moment to sweep his gaze over the area, then finally shook his head. I can't think of anywhere else to search, unless one of you has a thought. The guys looked at each other and shrugged. Nope, Joe said. The fence with the interstate is the only thing behind the building. There's a bank and a few other businesses across the street. We could check them out if you think it's necessary. He thought about the bank. These days, people didn't often go to banks, they did everything online, but it was likely Devin used that bank for her needs. Yeah, why don't you guys check the bank, just to be sure. I need to take the victim to her apartment, let her grab a few things. No way was he allowing her to stay here, 
even if the other residents were cleared to return. Consider it done, Joe said. The guys eagerly jogged around the apartment building to the street. He turned back to the SUV where Devin waited. After stripping off his gear, he went to open her car door. All clear? Ready to head inside? Yes, she looked relieved. Where did the rest of the guys go? He hesitated, then said, The bank across the street. I assume that's where you do your banking? I, uh, yeah. She shivered, either from the thought of her bank being blown up like her car, or the chilly temps. I tend to go there a lot to deposit my cash tips. He nodded, thinking the bomber could have noticed her heading to the bank, especially if he'd been watching her for a while. As they walked inside, he said, You mentioned being an only child, but what about aunts, uncles, or cousins? She frowned. My dad has a brother, Charles, and he might have a couple of kids. Again, since I didn't see much of my dad, I'm not familiar with his side of the family. He couldn't imagine not knowing your family. But then he remembered Ellie's comment about finding a DNA connection to a bunch of Callahans. If they were first or even second cousins, this was the first he knew about it. Thinking of DNA gave him an idea. Would you mind giving a DNA sample? That might help us find relatives who may be involved. She stopped inside the doorway, turning to face him. You really think this is the work of someone related to me? Why not one of my dad's victims? Wouldn't that make more sense? It could be a victim or a copycat, he admitted. But how did this guy find you, Devin? Or whatever your real name is. How did they track you here? I don't know. She threw up her hands and turned toward the row of mailboxes. The moment she pulled out a small key, he realized what they might have missed. No, don't. She froze, holding the key inside the lock. What should I do? Don't move. He pulled out his phone to call Joe. I need you guys back here at the apartment building. Did anyone clear the mailbox? Uh, not me. He heard Joe run the question past the others before he came back on the line. That's a negative, Cap. We're coming back. Hurry. He shoved the phone in his pocket, then approached Devin. One wrong move, and they'd be blown to bits. Chapter 4 The moment she'd heard the strange click when she'd turned the mailbox key, she'd known it had been a mistake. Beads of sweat rolled down her temples as she tried not to move. Oddly, Rye's pre-breakfast prayer echoed through her mind. She'd been raised to believe in God, but after her parents had divorced, her mother had stopped attending church. Then her dad had become the stealth bomber, and the idea of God watching over her had seemed laughable. Facing certain death, she understood how wrong she'd been, because only God could save her now. God and Rye. Okay, I'm going to take hold of the mailbox key so you can get out of here, Rye said in a low voice. No. Alana's features flashed in her mind. Who would miss Devin if she was gone? Absolutely no one. But Rye had a family, eight siblings who would miss him dearly. I'm not letting go. Go outside and discuss this with your team. Devin, I want you to be safe. There was an edge to his voice. This is my fault. The mailboxes should have been cleared. I'm not letting go of the key, she repeated stubbornly. Your family needs you, but I'm not sure how much longer I can stand here with my arms up, so you need to figure out a new plan and fast. Joe, bring extra gear. Key is already in the mailbox. The extra gear was meant for her. She swallowed hard, her mouth dry with fear. Somehow, she didn't really believe that wearing a protective vest, helmet, and gloves would be enough to protect her if the stupid bomb exploded. This area of the foyer was small and narrow. It was far too easy to imagine the force of the explosion throwing her backward into the wall behind her. Not for the first time, she struggled to understand why this was happening. Why someone had targeted her with three different bombs. As Rai had pointed out, if this was connected to her father, and how could it not be, the bomber would have had to uncover her real name. The team will be here soon, Rai said breaking into her thoughts. 
I'll gear up first and place as many items on you as I can, but once that's done, you will let go of the key so I can take over. I'm trained in this sort of thing. You aren't. Trained in being blown up? She blinked back sudden tears. I don't think so. Trained in dealing with explosive devices. A layer of frustration laced his tone. I need you to trust me on this, okay? She didn't answer. She barely knew the man, yet somehow she had come to admire him. The way he and his second oldest brother had stepped up to hold the family together was incredible, and she really, really didn't want to be the reason the Finnegan homestead fell apart if something happened to Rye. The conversation was halted by the sound of pounding footsteps approaching the front door of the building. Rye's teammates, who'd headed across the street to the bank, had wasted no time in turning back. Call for reinforcements. We need the robot, Rye said as he donned the protective gear. At least that's what she thought he was doing. She didn't dare turn her head to look at him or the others. I'm going to put gear around her, then take over holding the key. I know you evacuated the building last night, but I need you to do a quick double check in case someone returned without permission, or we missed someone. Use the back stairs to avoid traffic through the foyer. Once I have possession of the key and the civilians are clear, we'll put the robot to work. Understand? Roger, Kyle agreed. We'll make sure the place is vacated. Several members of the team bounded up the stairs. Devin listened as they began knocking on doors, wishing she could believe everything would work out. Her arm ached from being held at an awkward angle. She found herself praying for strength, fearing if she moved one iota, the bomb would blow up in her face taking innocent lives with her. Why did you do it, Dad? Why? She blinked again, forcing the tears away. Crying wasn't going to help. She needed to ignore her sore muscles and focus on holding the stupid key. I'm going to place this helmet over your head, Rye said. It felt incredibly heavy as he gently slipped it on. Now we're going to cover your torso. She appreciated the way he carefully placed the protective gear around her entire body, making sure not to jostle her. Despite his slow, deliberate movements, she could feel the muscles in her arm begin to shake. My arm is trembling, she said in a choked voice. Leave me here and get your team out. That's not happening, Rye said calmly. Just one more minute, Devin. You can do it. I'm almost ready to take over. I just need to get this vest secure. He gently tugged on the straps. Then he reached up and put his hand over hers. Gently now, I need you to slide your fingers down just enough for me to grab hold of the key. She didn't want to put his life on the line, but the way her arm was shaking meant she didn't have a choice. Either way, Rye wasn't leaving. And if her fingers slipped, the bomb might blow. Drawing a deep breath, she loosened her grip on the key enough to move her fingertips down. Rai's hand over hers radiated warmth, and before she realized it, he had the key. Good job, Devin. You were very brave. Go outside now, okay? I don't want to leave you. Her protest was muffled by the helmet and face shield. Go now! His sharp tone caught her off guard, and she quickly turned away, then paused glancing up the stairs to the second floor. Maybe she needed to help get the other tenants out of the building. No, you'll only be in the way, Rye said as if reading her mind. Or maybe she'd spoken out loud. At this point, she wasn't sure. I mean it, Devin. I want you outside. Unwilling to be a burden to him or his team, she did as ordered. Pushing through the doorway, she walked outside. The clouds overhead suited her depressed mood. She went over to stand next to Rai's SUV. Less than a minute later, several police squads arrived on the scene, blocking the entrance to the apartment building. She was still wearing the protective gear. The cops must have assumed she was part of the team because no one questioned her presence. The officers came out of the building as quickly as they'd gone in. Get back! Everyone get back! One shouted. Bring the SWAT shields and set up a perimeter. Hey, what are you doing? One of the officers finally approached her. She reached up to remove her helmet. Captain Finnegan told me to stay outside. The bomb is in my mailbox. The stern expression in the cop's eyes softened. Okay, please come this way. 
I need you safe behind the perimeter. She held up the helmet, then gestured to her vest. You should take this stuff, for your safety. Keep it for now, he said, taking her arm and leading her to a position behind several squads. Hey, Sarge, I have the victim here. The device is in her mailbox. A tall man with short blonde hair, dressed in a Milwaukee PD uniform, crossed over. She noticed his name tag said Sinclair. I'm Sergeant Noah Sinclair. Can you tell me your name? De- Devin Thompson? This didn't seem the time to explain she had changed her name, or to explain about the possible connection of the bomber to her father. I, uh, you need to know this is my fault. The bomber is after me. First, he blew up my car last night, then planted a bomb in my apartment, and now Captain Finnegan is inside, holding on to the key in my mailbox, where another bomb has been planted. At least, I'm pretty sure there's a bomb. I heard a weird click when I turned the key. She paused, then added, Please, I need you and the others to help get Rye, I mean, Captain Finnegan, out of there. Sergeant Sinclair looked thoughtful. Thanks for explaining exactly what's happening here. And trust me, we're going to do our best to get the captain out. In the meantime, I need you to stay out of the way so we can do our jobs. His eyes were kind, as if he understood the trauma she'd been through. Okay? Yes. She wasn't about to argue. A large black police van pulled up, and a smile creased Sergeant Sinclair's face. Ah, looks like the robot has arrived. Since Rye had first mentioned the robot, she'd been imagining a tall, man-shaped device like something out of a Transformers movie. She'd been way off the mark, as this robot was short, square, and stout, as it rolled down a ramp from the van. It took a minute for her to realize it was remote-controlled by another cop. Suddenly, the mechanical device changed, the top part rose, growing taller, and two arms with pinching fingers came out of each side. Now it looked more like the Transformer she'd expected. The robot rolled toward the front door. A man dressed in protective gear opened the door for it. She wished she could follow it inside to see how it worked, but she knew she wouldn't get two feet before one of the cops hauled her back. No, there was nothing she could do now but stand there, hoping Rai's plan would work, while praying no one would die here today. Rai waited patiently while his team cleared the building. The place was empty except for the apartment manager, who'd sneaked back in. He'd taken one look at Rai, dressed in his bomb gear, then bolted outside as if his pants were on fire, without saying a word. Yeah, he could understand the guy's reaction. However, he should have stayed away, the way he'd been told. Robot is present inside the foyer, ready to take over, Joe said. Okay, Rai took a deep breath. This would be trickier than taking over from Devon. The robot couldn't feel his fingers to know when to grab the key. Get outside with the others, Joe. This is a one-man job. Not leaving you, Cap. Joe's tone was grim. He was Rye's second in command. We messed up. Should have cleared these mailboxes in the first place. You shouldn't be the one to take the rap. My fault, too. I should have thought of it. Regrets were useless, so he didn't dwell on his failures. I'm still the boss, Joe. I'm giving you and the other guys on the team a direct order to get out of here right now. Rye wasn't taking no for an answer. There was a brief pause before Joe reluctantly responded, Copy that. Once he was alone, Rye closed his eyes and prayed. While this mess was mostly his fault, he knew that his family would be the one to suffer if he didn't make it home today. Give me strength, Lord, he whispered. Then he raised his voice loud enough to be heard via the two-way communication system attached to the robot aptly named Bot. I'm ready. Bring Bot forward two feet. We see and hear you. No need to shout, Gully replied. Rye almost smiled at the robot operator's wry tone. Gulliver Hammond was a whiz with controlling the robot and often acted as if he and the mechanical device were one and the same. Make room? We're coming in closer. I don't have much room to spare, Rye said. Holding his breath, he shuffled a few inches to the right. Get bot in front of me if you can. Easy now, we'll get the job done, Gully replied. 
We're going low, then we'll straighten up, okay? Whatever works, I'm not going anywhere. It took Gully a full minute to maneuver Bot into position. When it was right in front of Rai, the top part of the robot slowly rose upward until it was at the middle of his chest. Bot's arms were out and ready to be used. That's right, Gully said. We're going to take that key from your hands, Cap. Smooth as silk. I hope so, Rai muttered. Bot's right arm bent forward, the pincher fingers reaching toward his hand. Whoa, Gully, don't jab my hand. Sweat rolled down his back beneath the heavy gear at the near miss. He eased his fingertips down the sides of the small key, doing his best to provide more space for Bot to grab it. You need to come at the key from the top, not the side. That way I can see when to let go. I'll drop my hand down from the bottom, okay? Yeah, yeah. Gully slowly moved the pincher fingers up several inches before bringing them closer to Rai's fingers. It took Gully several attempts to manipulate the pinchers. Rai ignored the ache in his arm from holding so still as he helped guide Gully and Bot to the key. There, you've got it. Gently now. He watched as the lower edge of the pincher fingers slowly closed on the top edge of the mailbox key. Perfect. Easy peasy, Gully joked when the actual movements had been anything but. Let go, Captain. Let us take it from here. Rye held his breath and watched the key intently as he released the pressure of his fingertips. The key didn't move, thanks to Bot's secure grip. At least Bot's pinchers wouldn't get sore the way his hand had. Rye lowered his hand, silently thanked God for watching over him, and then stepped away from the row of mailboxes. He moved carefully to avoid tripping over Bot's wheels. Coming out, he said. Copy that, Gully responded. Rye pushed through the doorway and raked his gaze over the chaotic scene, consisting of dozens of cops, police cars, not to mention Gully and the black police van. His heart thudded painfully when he didn't see Devon. Had she left? Disappeared without telling him. Rye! She waved a hand from behind one of the squads. She still had the protective gear on, sans the helmet, which she held in one hand. Devon! He quickened his pace to join her, taking a moment to nod briefly at the sergeant on scene. I was so worried, she said, reaching out to grasp his arm. I'm glad you're okay. Me too. He caught himself before he could sweep her into his arms. Too many people were watching, and really, what did he know about this woman? Other than she'd lied to him about her true identity, he forced himself to turn toward the sergeant. We need to evacuate the buildings across the street, just to be safe. Already started to do that, Sergeant Sinclair said. The man, who was probably about his age, maybe a few years younger, clapped him on the back. Nice work in there. He instinctively opened and closed his fingers. Just glad it all worked out. Me too, Devin murmured. When I heard that click, I knew it was bad. Rye glanced at her. I'm sorry. I should have thought of the mailbox as being a target sooner. Although, I'm not sure how the bomber managed to get access to a key. She shrugged. Honestly, the locks are easy to pick. At least, that's what the guy who has the mailbox next to mine told me about a week ago. He came right out and said that? Rye asked. Yes. He lost his key once, and that's how he got his mail, she admitted. All the key does is turn a lever that allows the mailbox door to swing open. It's nothing fancy. He narrowed his gaze, envisioning what she'd described. Was it possible the bomber was living in the apartment building too? It didn't make sense that he would plant bombs in his own building. Then again, being this close would make it easier for him to follow Devin, keeping track of her comings and goings. What's his name? Her brow furrowed as she thought about it. Starts with a T. Oh yeah, Theo. Last name? He pressed. Come on, you must remember. It was written on the mailbox next to yours, right? Last name of Denny. Theo Denny. Then she frowned. Wait, you can't really think Theo is involved. He lives in the apartment building too. Why on earth would he take on that sort of risk? I don't know, but it's something to follow up on. Rye didn't like coincidences, 
and this Theo guy mentioning how easy it was to pick a mailbox lock didn't sit well with a bomb being placed in one. If there really was a bomb inside, Devin had mentioned hearing a click, but maybe that was just the lock lever itself. Maybe it was rusty and needed a good oiling. Hey, Cap, when can we open the mailbox? Gully called. Not yet, he turned towards Sinclair. Let me know when the entire block has been evacuated. The good thing about Bot is she can hold the key for as long as it takes to ensure everyone's safety. Understood, Sinclair agreed. He turned away to speak into his radio, asking for updates from the officers scattered around the area. He focused on Devin. I want you to take my keys to the SUV and head back to my place. This could take a while. No reason for you to stand around. No reason other than this idiot is after me, she shot back. I'm not leaving. He scowled, wondering why she was being so stubborn. Then go sit in the SUV to warm up. Once we're ready to open the mailbox, you can come back out here and take cover. I'd rather stay here, she patted her vest. This stuff is keeping me warm. Arguing was useless, so he turned back toward Sergeant Sinclair. See if your guys can find one of the tenants, a guy by the name of Theo Denny. The Red Cross probably set them up in a place close by. I'd like to talk to him and the apartment manager. I know he's on scene. Will do. Sinclair reached for his radio again. The apartment manager's name is Bruce Olson, Devin interjected. Thanks. He nodded at Sinclair, who repeated the name for his officers. After a few minutes, he heard Sinclair say, Bring them both over to the rear barricade. Thanks. Rai turned to see the older building manager who'd quickly scuttled out of his apartment, along with a younger man, roughly the same age as Devin, or at least the age Devin had on her fake driver's license. For all he knew, that information had been changed too. Captain, you asked for Theo Denny and Bruce Olson? The officer asked. I did, thanks. He eyed both men for a moment, then settled on Theo. Come with me, we need to talk. I, uh, yeah, sure, no problem. Theo glanced at Devin, confusion in his gaze. If the guy was the stealth bomber wannabe, he was a good actor. Rai drew the guy away from the others although he could feel Devin's curious gaze following them. When they were out of earshot, he said, How often do you pick the locks of the apartment mailboxes? Theo's face flushed. I only picked my lock, nobody else's, and only because I misplaced my key. Yeah, and why should I believe you? Rye asked. You do realize there's a suspected bomb in one of those mailboxes. A bomb is in the mailbox? All the color leached from Theo's face. It wasn't me. I swear, man, it wasn't me. Yet you recently bragged to Devin about how easy it was to pick the lock, Rye pressed. Are you angry with her for some reason? Did she shoot you down when you asked her out? I only bragged because I wanted her to notice me. Theo's expression was earnest. I haven't asked her out yet, but I was hoping to establish a rapport with her, you know? I mean, look, man, she's hot, right? Smoking hot. Who wouldn't try to impress a girl like that? He didn't want to admit that Devin was indeed smoking hot. He drilled the guy with a direct gaze. And you thought breaking into a mailbox, which is a federal offense, by the way, would impress her? Theo stared at the ground, shuffling his feet. Well, it was more of an icebreaker, you know, to strike up a conversation. Rai didn't say anything for a long moment. Listening to Theo made him realize the guy wasn't smart enough to plant three explosive devices. Heck, he wasn't smart enough to plant one device. But he still didn't like the way he'd bragged about picking the lock. I need your full name and your phone number in case we need to reach you, Rai said. Sure, anything. I'm happy to help. Theo appeared pathetically grateful. The Red Cross put us up in a hotel a few blocks down the road, temporarily. He flushed again. I walked down to see what was going on. Rye typed the information into his phone, repeating it back to make sure he had gotten the spelling and the number correct. Thanks for your cooperation, Theo. Theo nodded, then quickly left without looking back at him or Devin. Apparently, the guy thought that pursuing Devin, the target of a bomb, was a bad idea. 
Rye went back over to get Bruce Olson. Every single one of the apartment tenants would need to be questioned at some point, but the officers could help with that task. He wanted to handle this guy himself. I need a few minutes with you, too. This is terrible. Just terrible, Olson muttered. Where are we going to live if this doesn't get resolved soon? The Red Cross has already secured housing. They'll continue working with you until this is resolved, Rye assured him. Although, I have to say that your lack of security in the building is appalling. You need to fix the lock on the front door and the lighting in the hallways. I know, but the owner is cheap, Bruce whined. I'll do it now, though. A little late, Rye thought. I need to know if you've noticed any strangers hanging around the building. Someone who doesn't belong. The older man shook his head. That's all I've been thinking about since being evacuated. I don't tolerate any funny business. I call the cops if I see anything that looks like potential drug dealing or prostitution going on. I'm glad to hear it. Although the lack of security is still deplorable, Rye said. This guy wouldn't be doing drugs or anything like that. He'd be watching Devin. Olsen turned to look toward his tenant. Devin is a sweet girl, pays her rent on time and doesn't cause any problems. Why would anyone want to hurt her? I was hoping you had an idea about that, Rye admitted. You're sure you didn't notice anyone following her? I'm sure, he hesitated, then added. She works late hours, though. I uh, never see her when she comes home. Which is why the building needs to be properly secured. Rye swallowed a wave of frustration. If you think of anything else, let me know. He went through the same process of taking down the manager's contact information before heading back to where Devin and Sinclair waited. Did you learn something? Devin asked, her blue eyes bright with hope. No, sorry. He glanced at Sinclair just as the sergeant's radio squawked. The entire area has been evacuated, a voice said. All clear, Sarge. We're all clear. Roger that, Sinclair responded, then nodded at Rye. Your call, Captain. Rye nodded. He was about to give the order for all officers to get back, taking Devon with them, when a loud reverberation blasted through the air, rocking the ground beneath his feet. He instinctively launched himself at Devon, covering her with his body as they fell to the ground. The door of the apartment building blew off as the bomb inside Devin's mailbox exploded, sending debris raining down around them. Chapter 5 Despite being sheltered in Rye's arms, Devin struggled to catch her breath. The explosion had been so unexpected, she couldn't wrap her mind around the fact that the device had detonated. Gully! What happened? Rye shouted. There was a long moment of silence before she heard an answering reply. We didn't do anything, Cap. Bot still had a grip on the key. I... The only explanation is that the device was set with a timer, and we waited too long. A timer? She thought about how long she'd held the key, then Rye too, until the robot had taken over. It had seemed like forever, but it probably wasn't nearly as long as it felt. Any injuries? Rye asked. There was a chorus of negative responses from the cops in the area. She was flat on the ground, with Rye covering her back. Can I get up? She asked. Yeah. He stood, then helped her up. Her knees were wobbly, and she tried not to lean against him. Scanning the area, she noticed there wasn't a lot of obvious damage to the apartment building. I thought it would look worse, she admitted. There's probably more damage inside. Rye spoke in a grim tone. A structural engineer will need to be brought in to examine the place thoroughly before anyone can return to the building. It took a moment for that to sink in. She couldn't go home. None of the apartment tenants could, not until the building was deemed safe. So many lives impacted by the bomber. Logically, she knew it wasn't her fault, but guilt weighed heavily on her shoulders all the same. She was the target. Her car, her apartment, and her mailbox. It couldn't be any more obvious that this guy was trying to kill her in a way that mirrored her father's horrible actions eight years ago. The only bright side so far was that no one had been hurt, at least not physically harmed by the bombs. 
She suspected the robot had been destroyed, but Bot was a machine, not a person. A very different scenario to what her father had done. This has to be the work of one of the victims from my father's bombings. She lifted her gaze to Rai. It's the only thing that makes sense. We'll find him. The steely determination in Rai's brown eyes made her believe he would. Rai was the kind of man who got things done. She knew he wouldn't rest until he'd gotten to the bottom of this mess. Stay here. I need to check things out. Swallowing a protest, she nodded. This was Rai's job. Something she'd do well to remember. It was only being nice to her because she was in danger, not from any sort of personal interest. Fine with her, because she didn't plan on sticking around for long. Although if the bomber knew her alias, then she'd have to either stay to help catch him or buy another fake ID. Neither option was very appealing. In the meantime, she didn't have a place to live. There was no way to know how long it would take for the structural engineer to get there and to complete his investigation. Several days, for sure, and today was Thursday. Doubtful they'd even start until the following week. Would the Red Cross put her up in the hotel with the others? She'd rather not use her precious cash reserves unless absolutely necessary. That way, she'd still have enough to make her next month's rent, if she was allowed to stay at all. Based on the explosion from a bomb in her mailbox, it wouldn't surprise her if Bruce kicked her out. Turning her attention to the cops swarming the area, she noticed Rye leading the way through the broken doorway inside the apartment. She held her breath, hoping that nothing more would happen, but she needn't have worried. The team came back outside after a few minutes. Rye and Sergeant Sinclair spoke at length, discussing next steps. Then Rye broke away, coming back toward her. How was the inside? she asked. He grimaced. No one will be using the stairs for a while. They're blown to bits. The elevator is broken too. The sergeant will follow up with the apartment manager and contact the owner of the building. He frowned. Do you know anything about him? Some guy by the name of Rick Santo. She shook her head. Nope, never heard of him. Although, I suppose his name was on my lease. He owns a few properties and most are lower rent places. He shrugged, just wondering if he was looking for an easy out by bombing the place. She didn't follow the logic. Wouldn't it cost him more to rebuild? Maybe. Or he could simply declare it a loss and use the insurance money towards something new. Still seems odd he'd target me, she felt compelled to point out. True, but in my line of work, everyone is a suspect until proven otherwise. Isn't it supposed to be the other way around? Not while doing an investigation. Rye gestured toward his SUV. Come on, I'll take you home. You mean to a hotel, she corrected, walking alongside him. Then she abruptly stopped. Wait, shouldn't you leave this gear here? No, it's fine. I'll store it along with my stuff in the back of the SUV, Rye assured her. And I'm not taking you to a hotel. You may as well continue using the guest room. While she appreciated his generosity, she hesitated. A hotel is fine. I'm not sure how long I'm staying in town anyway. What do you mean? They'd reached the SUV. Using the key fob, he opened the back and began removing his padded gear. She did the same. Leaving the city isn't a good idea. You must realize this guy will follow you. She froze as a horrible thought hit hard. What if he finds out I'm staying at the Finnegan homestead? Rye's expression darkened. That would not be good, but I don't see how he'll find out. It's not like we're going to advertise the fact. With a furtive glance over her shoulder, she wondered if the bomber was out there, somewhere close by, watching her right now. She finished stripping off her gear, shivering in the cold air. That's not a risk I'm willing to take. A hotel would be for the best, and I shouldn't put the other tenants at risk by joining them wherever the Red Cross has set them up. Then she added, A cheap one, if we can find it. Rye stared at her for a moment, then nodded. Okay. She ignored the stab of disappointment at his easy capitulation. Not that she blamed him for changing his mind. Rye would always put his family's safety above that of a stranger. It was just another of those traits she secretly admired about him. She hurried over to climb into the passenger seat. Seeing the plaid blanket he'd loaned her, 
She quickly folded it up and turned to set it in the back seat. Rye slid in behind the wheel. He shot one last glance over at the cops who were still milling about, waiting for a few to move their squads so they could get out. She realized he'd rather have stayed behind. Well, he could return after dropping her at the closest and hopefully reasonably priced hotel. I feel bad that everyone has to find a new place to live for the next few days. The Red Cross has it under control. Fine, she sighed. Just make sure the place isn't too pricey. I'll cover the hotel, and that's only for show. We'll book the room using your card. I'll give you the cash to cover it. I'll pretend to drop you off, but you'll still come home with me. Her jaw dropped for a moment. You shouldn't have to pay for the hotel. He shrugged. It's not a big deal, especially if the ruse helps me figure out who is behind this. You think he'll do something at the hotel? Her shoulders slumped. That's even worse. Just that many more people who might be hurt because of me. I have a place in mind. It should work well enough to minimize the risk to other innocent people. He flashed her a reassuring smile. Trust me, I don't want any bloodshed over this either. She did trust him, probably more than she should, considering she only just met him, what, less than ten hours ago? Going home with a guy was something she'd never, ever done. Why on earth she had last night, she had no idea. At least her instincts were on track. Rye was an honorable guy, never taking advantage of the situation. Remembering Alana's teasing, she was reminded again of how he'd held his family together over the past ten years. Rye's name was synonymous with responsibility. So much so, she couldn't help wondering why he was still single. Not that she planned to ask. Royce, her former boyfriend, had dropped her faster than a hot potato after her father had been arrested especially when the full nature of his crimes had been splayed across every newspaper and media outlet across the country. Part of his decision to cut bait was likely related to the media hounds parked outside her apartment for days on end. At the time, she'd only granted one interview, and that was an attempt to clear her name. She'd denied having any knowledge of her father's plans or actions, but the reporter had badgered her so relentlessly she'd known there was no way to change his mind or anyone else's for that matter. She would always be guilty by association, held accountable for not knowing her father's terribly destructive plans. She'd even testified against him in court, but that hadn't been good enough. Hey, I'll keep you safe, Rye said, his brow furrowed in concern. You don't have to be afraid. I know you will, but I still hate knowing there's a risk to your family. She sighed and rubbed her temple. The nagging headache from the night before had returned in full force. Not enough sleep, combined with the tension of holding the key to the bomb and the stress of watching her apartment building explode like her car. Setting a trap at the hotel will minimize the risk, he assured her. The American Lodge is owned by a retired firefighter, a guy by the name of Gary Campbell. He'll take it personally if someone tries to plant a bomb in the place. We'll set up cameras, too. Once we get a good look at the bomber, we'll be able to track him down. She had to admit his plan was impressive. You really think this will work? I do. He smiled confidently, and she was struck by how attractive he was. Not just his looks, which were amazing, but his overall personality. Ryland Finnegan would never cut and run when the going got tough. Not the way Royce had. No, Rye was the type to be supportive no matter what. With an effort, she tore her gaze away to stare unseeingly out the passenger window. There was much to admire about Rye, but she needed to remember that this wasn't personal. He wasn't interested in her other than finding the connection to the bomber. His family would always come first. If her being at the Finnegan homestead brought trouble, she had no doubt he'd toss her out on her backside without hesitation. She'd need to guard her heart to avoid getting burned. Leaving the scene of the bombing was difficult. Normally, he'd stay until the end. But as the new plan to trap the guy formed in his mind, he couldn't wait to put it into place. Maybe he should have thought of this last night, or rather, earlier that morning. Not that doing so would have prevented the mailbox from blowing up. He still couldn't believe the device had detonated. 
he'd need to take some time to discuss the plan with the owner of the American Lodge Motel. Most of the cops and firefighters in the area knew Gary. He offered his place at a discount if needed. Rye had never required his services before. Hopefully, the fact that it was the middle of January meant there were plenty of vacant rooms for him to work with. Most Wisconsinites went south for the winter, and if they didn't because they preferred outdoor sports, they wouldn't bother to stay here in town. No, they'd head to the rural areas where snowmobiling, skiing, and snowshoeing were popular winter activities. He couldn't help smiling to himself, remembering the ski trip he'd taken everyone on a few years ago. His brothers had been super competitive, insisting on doing the most difficult double black diamond runs and timing each other to see who could take the run faster. Taryn had led the charge, challenging his brothers. Rye, of course, had won, while Taryn had fallen head over ski, wrenching his knee badly enough that he couldn't go down the slopes for the rest of the week. To this day, Taryn wanted a rematch. It was harder to coordinate their schedules these days, especially with the cop, firefighter, paramedic, and nursing weekend schedule requirements. Still, that was no excuse, and he made a mental note to plan another family vacation soon. He hoped his parents would approve of how he and Taryn had pulled together to raise the kids. Even after ten years, he still missed them. He pulled into the American Lodge parking lot, relieved to see there were only two other cars parked in front of the rooms. He threw the gear shift into park, then turned to her. I'll need your credit card. I only have a debit card. She pulled it from her purse. I hope it works. It will. Gary would take it no problem. He pushed out of the car. I'll be back soon. Without waiting for a response, he shut the door and headed inside. The kid behind the desk glanced up from his laptop computer. Need a room? Is Gary around? Uh, yeah, he's in the office. The kid jerked his thumb toward the back. Please let him know that Captain Ryland Finnegan of the MPD needs to talk to him. He smiled reassuringly. There's no problem or anything like that. The kid nodded and left. A few minutes later, he returned. Hey, Gary said you can go on back. Thanks. He rounded the desk and found the office without a problem. Gary Campbell was a man in his mid to late sixties, with silver hair and a rugged complexion. One of his hands was severely burned, forcing his retirement about eleven years ago. It was clear, though, that Gary kept himself in good physical shape. Rye could only hope he'd age as well. Finnegan, what can I do for you? Gary gestured to the chair on the other side of the desk. Don't tell me you're looking for a job. He chuckled. Tempting, but no. I need a favor. He hesitated, erasing all humor from his features. A big favor. One you have every right to refuse. The older man's eyebrows shot up. Okay, I'm intrigued. What's going on? Rye spent a few minutes filling the retired firefighter in about Devin's situation and the recent explosion at the apartment building. Gary let out a low whistle. Being stalked by a guy with a bomb fetish is no joke. Tell me about it. Rye spread his hands. I was hoping I could secure a room under Devin's name using her debit card while I personally pay for the other rooms around it. I'll also set up cameras to see if the perp shows up to try again. Gary stared at him for a long moment. You want to set up a decoy to draw him in? Yeah. He winced. I know it's asking a lot, and I'll understand if you decline to be involved. Gary barked out a laugh. If I was smart, I would say no, but I have to admit, business has been slow and running a motel is pretty boring. Things have been super quiet since the Callahans all got married and settled down. The Callahans? He remembered Ellie's comment about a DNA connection to a family of Callahans. The same family or someone else? Surely there was more than one Callahan in town. He'd been surprised at how many Irish immigrants had chosen to settle in this area. Yeah, friends of mine. Gary waved a hand. It's not important. I like to keep on friendly terms with the local firefighters and the police too. Like you, Rye. Sure, I'll rent you the rooms. Why not? As an added bonus, you'll be relieved to know I already have several security cameras.
We can add a few if you think it's necessary, but they cover the entire parking lot and the rear portion of the building, too. He grinned. I watched you drive up in the SUV. I assume the pretty brunette sitting in the passenger seat is the girl in trouble? Yeah, Devin. Rye passed over her debit card, then reached into his pocket and pulled out his wallet. He hesitated, then decided against using his credit card. I have enough cash on me to cover the rooms for one night, but I'll come back tomorrow with more. Don't worry about it, Gary said. You can pay for two rooms. I'll just leave instructions to keep the two rooms above them vacant. As I said, it's the slow season around here. Shouldn't be a problem. Thanks, Gary. This is really helpful. Gary took the card and the cash with a wide smile. I hope he does show up. I'd love nothing more than to help put him behind bars. Rye swallowed a wince. The last thing he wanted was for Gary to play detective. You and your desk clerk need to keep an eye on the cameras, but if you see anyone, call for backup. Don't try to take this guy in by yourself. I won't, Gary assured him, although the keen anticipation in the older man's eyes was worrisome. I'll call you and the cops, okay? Thanks. He stood. I appreciate it. Gary followed him to the front desk. He used Devin's debit card to secure the last room on the lower level for her. The room next to that one was given a false name, and the two rooms above were to be held vacant. Gary handed him the card and room key. I'll keep in touch. Thanks again. He headed back outside. Sliding in behind the wheel, he glanced at Devin. He returned the debit card, along with some extra cash. It had taken longer than he'd anticipated to make the arrangement, and she'd wrapped the plaid blanket around herself to stay warm. He started the engine and cranked the heat. The trap is set. We've done our best to ensure no one will be injured if this guy does show up to plant a bomb. Glad to hear it. She tucked the card and cash into her purse, shivered, and pulled the blanket closer. I still think you should take me to another motel. Maybe the Red Cross will set me up someplace different from where the others are staying. Not happening. He hated the idea of putting his family in danger, but he also needed to question Devin more about who might be involved. She'd mentioned this could be the work of one of her father's victims, which wasn't a bad place to start. I need your help to find this guy. She nodded slowly. Okay, I'll do my best. Great. He tried to lighten the tone. Besides, didn't you promise to help with dinner? A smile tugged at the corners of her mouth. I'd be glad to. That settled then. He would have to be sure Ellie and Alana understood this arrangement wasn't personal. His siblings had not been shy about expressing their feelings about how he needed to find someone to spend his life with, as if having eight siblings wasn't enough. Rachel had claimed to love him, but even she couldn't stand the chaos. It wasn't fair to drag someone else into the foray, even if he was interested, which he wasn't, despite Devin's attractiveness. The entire family needed to understand this was only a temporary arrangement, born out of necessity, to keep Devin safe, nothing more. He took his time getting back home, making sure he wasn't followed before pulling into the driveway and waiting for the garage door to open. Once they were inside, he closed it again. No other cars were here as his siblings were all still working. It felt strange to be alone with Devin in the empty house. You can borrow stuff from Ellie and Alana. I'm sure their clothes will fit you. Oh, I can't do that. She looked appalled at his suggestion. I don't want to invade their privacy by digging around in their personal space. I don't think they'll mind. They share clothes all the time. But we can talk about it later after they get home. He eyed the clock. The hour was approaching noon. He needed to check in with his boss before he dug into the case. Would you mind throwing something together for lunch? I need to make a call. No problem. She appeared happy to help. His boss wasn't thrilled that Rye hadn't come into the precinct, but he was happy to hear he planned to interrogate the victim again. She must know something, Rye, Assistant Chief Michaels said. I hope so. Devin had lied to him at first about her real name, but he didn't honestly think she knew who was behind these bombings. There would be no reason for her to keep that information confidential. I'll keep you posted on what I find. Oh, I also set a trap to lure the bomber to a motel. Between that and whatever information I can glean from the victim, I hope to have a lead soon. 
At the moment, he had absolutely nothing to go on, which was not reassuring. Good. Get it done, Rye. His boss disconnected from the line. After pocketing his phone, he dug his computer from the bag and carried it into the kitchen. He figured he could work on his own until after they'd eaten. He didn't want his questions to ruin her appetite. Devin was standing at the counter. She glanced over her shoulder when he came in. Looks like spaghetti is on the menu for tonight, so I may do with sandwiches, since you seemed long on lunch meat. Sounds good to me. He logged on and began a search on her father's name, bringing up the details of the last bomb he'd set off, the one that had killed several small kids at the daycare center nearby. It made him sick to his stomach to view the carnage, and the list of victims was long. Too long. It struck him that finding the one who might be here in Milwaukee to seek revenge would be like finding a diamond on the shores of Lake Michigan. Nearly impossible. Do you like mustard? Devin asked. Doesn't everyone? He countered, without looking away from his screen. The images of the destruction caused by the bomb were surreal. A sudden crash had him leaping off his chair, spinning to face her. A shattered plate was on the floor, the remnants of a thick sandwich strewn among the plate fragments. Her gaze was fixated on the graphic image of the injured children on his computer screen. Tears filled her eyes, and she bolted from the room, heading up the stairs to the second floor. He winced, realizing he should have warned her of his intent to search for victims in her father's explosions. He took a moment to clean up the mess, then headed up the stairs. This wasn't the first time he needed to apologize to a crying female. He'd done that many times with his sisters. Devin, he rapped on the door. I'm sorry, can I please come in? There was a long moment of silence. He was about to knock again when the door opened. Her face was red and blotchy, but she'd wiped away the tears with a tissue. I'm the one who should apologize. I broke your plate. I don't care about that. He searched her gaze. I take it you never looked at those photos. Never. She shuddered with revulsion, and her eyes filled up again. I hate what my father did. I absolutely hate him. He pulled her close, smoothing a hand down her back. Hey, it's not your fault. She surprised him by snaking her arms around his waist and holding on tight. He was used to offering comfort to upset females, but this was different. There was nothing sisterly about this embrace. He was far too aware of this woman, and that wasn't good. Somehow, some way, he needed to put Devin back in the younger sister category, rather than a woman he secretly wanted to kiss. Chapter 6 Being held by Rye was becoming a bad habit one she had no interest in breaking. But of course, this wasn't a real embrace. He was just being his usual sweet, kind self, taking care of her the way he likely had done for his sisters. She forced herself to lift her head and step away from him. Silly to have overreacted to the images on the computer in the first place. Running her fingers through her hair, she looked everywhere but at him. I, uh, should have mentioned how I stayed away from all the media hype back then. I never saw... She didn't finish. I can understand why you would stay away, and I should have taken your feelings into consideration. Rye sighed and added, Please forgive me. It's okay. Unable to drum up a smile, she moved past him. I need to clean up the mess. I've already taken care of it. He followed her down to the kitchen, then moved ahead to close the laptop computer. Why don't you sit down while I make sandwiches? No, it's the least I can do. Keeping busy would be far better than dwelling on the horrific images. Today's explosion had been nothing compared to what her father had done. Thanks to Rai's quick response and his team's actions, no one had been hurt today. Yet she couldn't help but wonder when the bomber would strike next. It seemed unlikely Rai and his team could prevent the bomber from injuring others forever. She moved to the counter and went to work making another sandwich. Rye sat at the table, without so much as touching his computer. Now that she understood what he'd been working on, she felt guilty for holding him back. I'm fine now, you can go back to your search. She brought the fresh plate to the table. I hope you enjoy. This is amazing, better than what I would have slapped together. 
he flashed a warm smile. Thanks. You're welcome. It was just a sandwich, nothing fancy, but she sensed he was being honest, or maybe she just wanted him to be. She quickly fixed her own sandwich and joined him at the table. As he had done at breakfast, he'd waited for her. Knowing what to expect, she clasped her hands in her lap and bowed her head. Dear Lord, we thank you for the food you've provided for us today. We also give thanks for the way you kept us all safe at the apartment building and ask that you continue to guide us on your chosen path. Amen. Amen, she whispered. She glanced over at him. You really believe God has a plan for us? Absolutely, he said with conviction. It's not our place to question his plan, but I know he has one just the same. He smiled reassuringly and took a bite of his sandwich. It was on the tip of her tongue to ask why God's plan had been to take his parents, leaving him and his brother in charge of their siblings, but she took a bite of her meal instead. Just because she had trouble believing in God's plan didn't mean she should question Rai's beliefs. Unfathomable to understand why God had allowed her father to do such terrible things, killing hundreds of innocent people, including babies. Babies. No, Rai could believe what he wanted, but she wasn't buying that theory. No way, no how. Every crisis we face is easier to recover from with God's help, Rai said. I'm no expert, but I often think of how Jesus suffered. Putting that into perspective, it wasn't a burden to keep my family together after losing my parents. She glanced up at him. How about living with the knowledge your father brutally killed innocent people? His sins are not yours, Devin. Rye reached over to gently squeeze her hand. And maybe God wants you to learn from your father's mistakes, to focus on turning your life into something better. Something better? A flash of guilt hit hard as she thought of how she'd changed her name, went into hiding, and moved around to avoid being associated with her father rather than helping others. She hadn't stepped up to face the challenge the way Rye had. You must think I'm weak, she murmured. What? No, of course not. He stared at her. Why would you say that? You're being too hard on yourself. You're young, Devin. It's never too late to change course. I'm not that young, but you're right. She nodded slowly. Once this bomber has been caught, I'll think about that. Maybe there is something I can do to help. I'm sure there is. He took another bite of his sandwich. For the first time in a long while, hope flickered in her heart. Maybe she could help impact a positive change within the community. Hearing about how the Finnegan family had all chosen careers that helped protect the public, she was ashamed that her plan had been to cut and run, and her plan of being anonymous hadn't even worked. The bomber had discovered who she was, and had made it clear he wanted her gone. Not just gone, she silently admitted. Dead. He wanted her dead. Do you mind if I ask a personal question? Rye's deep voice intruded on her grim thoughts. Ask away, she forced a smile. You already know the worst about me. You're not at fault, he repeated. Maybe someday she'd even believe that. But I am curious about your real name. She held his gaze. You mean my birth name, right? Jennifer is the name my parents bestowed on me. But to be honest, I've been Devin for seven years now. It sounds crazy, but I prefer Devin, and not just because it's not associated with my father. Jennifer is common. There were several of us by that name all through school. It's not crazy, Rye said dryly. I had the opposite problem. There wasn't a single kid in my school who shared the name Ryland, especially with the unique spelling of R-H-Y-L-A-N-D. Why my parents decided to go down that route, I have no clue. Now, I'm used to it, he shrugged. I figured it was better to embrace our Irish heritage than to fight it. Did your grandparents immigrate from Ireland? She grabbed onto the neutral topic with both hands. Great grandparents, he corrected. I've been meaning to take the family to Ireland, but not only is it pricey, it's not easy to coordinate everyone's schedules. Especially Aiden being a part of the National Guard. He can be called up on a moment's notice. A family trip to Ireland sounds amazing. 
She knew Rye wasn't that worried about the money. He'd consider it an investment well spent. But she could see how difficult it would be to coordinate nine people's schedules. You should book it a year in advance. Then just tell everyone to be off those days. I'm sure there is a way to get vacation from the National Guard. He looked at her for a long moment, then he smiled. You're right, Devin. That's exactly what I should do. Book it 12 to 18 months in advance and force the issue. I guess I was taking the easy way out, blaming our schedules, but if we plan the trip that far ahead of time, no excuses, right? Right. She couldn't help returning his smile. No doubt he was only trying to make her feel better, but it worked. They ate in silence for a few minutes. She noticed he ate quickly and wondered if that was a byproduct of being one of nine kids. Had there been competition between them? She could only imagine what it was like to have eight siblings, including a set of twins. Mind-boggling, to say the least. When she finished, she carried her plate and rise to the sink. The breakfast dishes were still sitting there, so she quickly went to work washing them. Glancing over her shoulder, she noticed he'd taken a different seat, one in which she wouldn't be able to easily see the computer screen as he returned to his search. So many victims, she thought with a sigh. Where to start? The children. She turned from the sink so fast, she spilled some water over the edge. Rye, you should look at the parents who lost children in the daycare center that day. One of them could be responsible for this. He lifted his gaze to hers. Great minds, Devin. That's exactly where I've started, which was why the images were on my screen. He paused, then added, I'll want to talk to you more when you're finished. That's fine. She wasn't looking forward to it, but she would do whatever was necessary to help find the bomber. Even though he or she may have tragically lost a child that day, that didn't mean planting more bombs targeting her was the answer. Obviously, though, the bomber wasn't thinking clearly. Grief could do that, she supposed. Grief and anger could turn a seemingly decent person into someone obsessed with revenge. She finished the dishes, stacking them to air dry, then came over to sit beside Rye. She didn't look at his computer as she waited for him to finish whatever he was working on. He typed a few notes, then turned his chair so he was facing her. You mentioned avoiding the media after this happened, but did you ever talk to your father about it? No. I didn't want to hear whatever pathetic excuse he might use to justify setting bombs in government buildings. She sighed heavily. I told you, I didn't have much of a relationship with him, even before this happened. One of the reporters mentioned your father had some paranoia about the government. Did you hear him mention that? Yeah, he was always anti-government. She thought back to those early years when she spent the occasional weekend with him. He always complained about the state of Illinois, about how expensive the housing was, that sort of thing. But bombing government buildings? He never mentioned that. She curled her fingers into fists. This is the same line of questioning the police put me through eight years ago. I didn't know anything then, and I still don't. I'm sorry to drag you through this again, he said gently. It's just that even the smallest thing might help. She didn't see how, but she didn't argue. The only thing that I can think of is that maybe my mother's death caused his paranoia to become worse. She had cancer. It was missed by the doctor until it was too late to do anything but make her comfortable. She shrugged. They divorced by then, though, so I'm not sure why that would send him over the edge. I always had the sense there wasn't a lot of love between them. What kind of cancer? Ovarian cancer. She had been angry at first, but soon grief took over. I did some research. It's one of the hardest cancers to find and diagnose. I didn't hold the doctor responsible for missing it. Rye typed more notes on the keyboard. Did you ever receive hate mail or threats via phone? Anything that would help narrow down our search? I had dozens of phone calls, mostly from the media, so I went out and bought a new phone shortly after my dad was arrested. The media camped out in front of my apartment building for a few days too. I moved afterward for peace of mind. If there was hate mail, I didn't get it and probably wouldn't have opened it either. 
If he was frustrated by her less than helpful responses, he didn't show it. He simply added to his notes and then sat for a moment. Let's go back to your father's family for a moment. He had a brother and maybe kids? A brother named Charles. I don't know if there are kids. She sighed. I guess it never occurred to me to seek them out. But really, why would my uncle or his kids want to blow me up? I didn't turn him over to the police. She shook her head. I get you have to check them out, but I think we're looking at a victim seeking revenge. Or a copycat, stealth bomber wannabe, Rye said somberly. I agree with you, Devin, but I need to cross everyone else off the list. That's how police work is done. Everyone is guilty until proven innocent, she said wryly. I know that sounds harsh, but that's the way we approach it. He typed a few notes into the computer. Thanks for your help. This gives me something to work with. Sure. She was happy to help, but she didn't think the small bits of information she'd provided would be of any use, other than maybe to exclude a possible suspect. I'll dry the dishes now, unless you need something more. I'm good, but you should head upstairs to take a nap. I'm sure you didn't get much sleep. Neither did you. She stood and went to the sink. Better to keep busy. Thanks for doing that. I'm going to make some more calls. He quickly left the room. As she finished drying and putting the dishes away, she wondered about the conversations Rye was having with his boss. He'd been supportive of her, but that didn't mean the other cops he worked with felt the same way. No doubt her staying here had put him in an awkward position, if his superiors even knew about it, which she felt certain they did not. Having a victim stay in your personal home was probably not a routine part of cop protocol. Now she had Rai's reputation to worry about too. She closed her eyes for a moment, thinking about how Rai had prayed earlier. Maybe it was her turn to pray that nightmare would be over soon. Rai filled his boss in on what little information he'd gotten from Devin. We need to look at her uncle, Charles Rowe. See if he has kids. Maybe there was some weird family dynamic that contributed to her father Paul's paranoia about the government. He and Charles could be part of some extremist group. Don't they usually live out in the middle of nowhere, specifically to stay off the radar? Yeah, but we need to cross him and any of his kids off the list. For all we know, they retreated to the north woods of Wisconsin. I'm sure the cops would have done that eight years ago, his boss groused. But sure, we'll take another look. Eight years is a long time. Could be one of Charles' kids has turned anti-government too. Or maybe he idolizes Paul Rowe and wants to be just like him. Okay, I'll put Joe Kingsley on that. Anything else? Not yet. Rye wished he had better news. It's early. I'm hopeful the trap I set at the American Lodge yields results. Stay in touch, his boss said, then clicked off. He stood in the living room for a moment, staring out the window at the snowy backyard. Now that he'd eaten lunch, his lack of sleep hit hard. Another pot of coffee was in order, so he returned to the kitchen, expecting to find Devin there. It was empty. Annoyed by the disappointment, he made a new pot of coffee, then went back to work. He was glad Devin had taken his advice to get some rest. Glancing at the clock, he knew there wasn't a lot of time before Ellie was due to return. The Finnegan homestead often resembled Grand Central Station, which is why he rarely worked from home. Even his siblings who didn't live there were apt to pop in without notice. He didn't mind, it just made it difficult to get work done. The warm aroma of coffee gave him renewed energy. He went back to his search on the victims, starting, as Devin had suggested, with the parents of the kids who died at the daycare center. Finding the list didn't take long. He filled his mug and then went to work, painstakingly putting each name into the search engine as well as checking the various social media sites. The grief expressed by the parents was difficult to get through. His stomach nodded at the thought of losing a child, especially upon learning the youngest victim from the daycare center had been nine months old. No wonder Devin had avoided the news. If someone he'd known had been responsible for that, he'd have done the same thing. He stumbled across a brief video interview of Devin, who had of course been going by the name Jennifer Rowe at the time. 
He went over to peer through the doorway to make sure she wasn't nearby before heading back to the table to play the video. Her youthful expression was like a slap to the face. He hadn't considered that she was only 22 years old at the time of her father's arrest. Younger than Ellie, he thought grimly. Her pale face and red-rimmed eyes betrayed her grief and angst. Her dark hair hung limp around her bereaved face. The interview had barely lasted 30 seconds. She started by saying how sorry she was for all the people her father had hurt, then reiterated she'd had no contact with her father for over six years and had known nothing of his plans to do such a terrible thing. She stressed that she'd been cooperating with the authorities regarding the investigation and would continue to do so for as long as they deemed it necessary. The moment she'd finished the interview, the pack of reporters had barraged her with questions, but she stepped back and closed the door in their faces. He sat back in his chair, rubbing the back of his neck. When he'd first met Devin, he'd been upset that she'd lied to him. To be honest, he didn't like liars because Rachel had pretended to be okay with his decision to keep his family together, only for him to discover she'd secretly hated it and had begun seeing one of his cop buddies behind his back. Watching the video and witnessing how vulture-like the media had come down on her made him sympathize with her plight. He had to admit she'd handled it well. It also explained why she didn't want to go back to being Jennifer Rowe. Could he really blame her? Not that he condoned breaking the law. He made a note to convince her to go through legal channels to change her name once this mess was over. For the next hour, he drank coffee and doggedly continued his search. When Devin returned to the kitchen, he glanced up. Hey, hope you got some sleep. Not really, she shrugged. I'm not good at taking naps. He wanted to ask what she'd been doing upstairs all alone, but decided not to pry. No doubt she relished the peace and quiet. He sure did. As if on cue, the rumbling sound of the garage door opening reached his ears. Ellie was back from class and would be full of questions when she discovered Devin was still there, and would be for at least the next day or so. Someone is home, Devin said. Ellie. Alana is working an eight-hour shift at the hospital. He closed the computer, knowing that trying to work with Ellie chatting would be useless. Oh, Devin, I'm so glad you're still here. Ellie smiled brightly. It's great to meet you. I hope this means you're staying for dinner. Um, sure. I can help, too, if you'd like, Devin offered. I was planning to make spaghetti, which isn't hard. Ellie dropped her backpack on the table. Rye. I heard back from Maddie Callahan. She told me her great-grandparents also immigrated from Ireland. I really think we're second cousins. Or is it third? I'm not sure. But isn't that amazing? Best of all, she lives in Milwaukee, as do the rest of her family. I had no idea we had relatives living so close. Yeah, that's great. Just what he needed. More family members. But he didn't show his true feelings, knowing his sister was excited about the DNA connection. She's married to a cop. His name is Noah Sinclair. Their family all works in the public sector too, just like we do. Ellie beamed. I'm telling you, Rye, being first responders and supporting the public is in our blood. Wait a minute. Noah Sinclair? I worked with him earlier today. He's a sergeant with the Milwaukee Police Department. Wow. Ellie did a wiggly dance. That is so cool, Rye. Ooh, I can't wait to tell Maddie that you met her husband. I'm sure it's the same guy. He thought about how Gary had also mentioned being friends with the Callahans. You might want to ask her if she knows a retired firefighter named Gary Campbell. He owns the American Lodge Motel and mentioned he was friends with them. I will. Ellie glanced at Devin, who was watching with bemusement. Give me a few minutes, then we'll talk about dinner. Take your time, Devin said. Ellie, hold on a minute. Devin needs to borrow some clothes. I figure you and Alana may have something that might fit her. Of course, Ellie readily agreed. Come upstairs with me, Devin. We'll raid my closet and Alana's. This'll be fun. Rye watched them leave with a small measure of relief. Devin was in good hands. Ellie was known to bring strays home all the time when she was younger. It was one of the facets of her personality that worried him in her quest to become an EMT. 
The youngest of the Finnegan clan was tender-hearted and had grown up sheltered from the harsh realities of the world. Not that losing her parents at the age of 14 had been easy because it hadn't. But that sort of personal loss was different from facing guns, drugs, prostitution, sex trafficking, and domestic abuse on a regular basis. As a cop, it was easy to become hardened by the terrible things people did to each other every single day. He and Taryn often talked about ways to avoid letting the depressing stuff they witnessed get to them. They'd also agreed that spending time together as a family helped keep a sense of normalcy, helped keep them grounded. Opening his computer, he went back to searching the parents of the daycare kids who had died at the hands of Paul Rowe. His bombings were an extreme example, but there were hundreds of awful events happening each day that barely made a blip on the media radar. Thinking about the brief interview Devin had given eight years ago made him wonder if one of the victim's families had become focused on it and on her. Maybe they hadn't even believed her claim that she'd known nothing of her father's plans. The fact that she pledged to cooperate with the investigation would seem too little too late. As he reached the last of the ten sets of parents who lost their children that day, he stumbled across a long, ranting social media post written by a man named James Klein. In cross-referencing the list, he identified James as the father of two-year-old Andrew, who'd perished in the blast. The entire Roe family should be held accountable for this horrific event. I should have my son Andrew with me now, and so should the other parents who lost their children today. Something must be done. I don't believe no one knew what Roe was up to. They knew, but stayed silent. Hold them accountable. Every last one of them. We all deserve justice. The entire Roe family consisted of Devin, or rather Jennifer, her uncle Charles, and whatever children he must have had. He read the post again, then noticed that Jennifer Roe had been tagged in the post. He stared at the screen for a long moment. James Klein had just leaped to the top of his suspect list. The thought of Klein being here in Milwaukee targeting Devin had him reaching for his phone to call his boss. They needed to find this guy ASAP. Chapter 7 Humbled by Ellie's enthusiastic generosity in sharing her clothes, Devin took the jeans and sweater into the bathroom to change. Ellie was only an inch shorter than she was, so the jeans fit well enough. Maybe a tad short, but that didn't matter. They were clean, which was more than she could say for the black slacks she'd worked an entire shift in at the pub. The t-shirt, too, had reeked of grease. Ellie's sweater and jeans were a welcome change. She finger-combed her hair, then returned to Ellie's room. They fit great, Ellie, thank you. Not bad, Ellie said with a grin. Oh, wait, you must need toiletries, too. We have lots of stuff here. Help yourself. Brushing past her, Ellie went into the bathroom and opened the closet. There are spare toothbrushes, hair products, combs, and brushes. All are fair game, okay? Thanks. The closet was jammed full of stuff, giving her a glimpse of what it must have looked like when all nine kids were still at home. How many sisters do you have? Just two, Alana and Kylie. Ellie sighed and rolled her eyes. We are so outnumbered by the guys. That leaves six boys. No wonder Rye was so protective. Must have been nice to have so many siblings. Oh yeah, it wasn't noisy, annoying, or overwhelming in the least. Ellie let out a snort. Honestly, it wasn't as bad as it sounds. I do worry about Rye, though. Worry about him? You mean because of his job running the tactical unit? Ellie regarded her thoughtfully for a moment. No because he's pushed aside his personal happiness so he could focus on holding the family together after our parents died. Taryn chipped in to help too, but everyone knew Rye was the one in charge. I see, she nodded. I'm glad your older brothers were there for you. They were, but Rye needs to find someone, a woman to share his life with. Ellie's gaze was pointed. And one who won't break his heart. Gee, don't hold back. She said wryly. Then she held up a hand. Ellie, I hear your message loud and clear, but you must know that Rye is only being nice. He's not interested in me on a personal level, and I'm not looking for romance either. The flash of disappointment in Ellie's gaze stung a bit. 
Too bad, because Rye is a great guy. He absolutely is, she agreed. But I'm sure he can do better than someone like me. What did she have to offer a guy like Rye? Absolutely nothing. She had a useless associate degree in graphic arts, only to end up ditching her old life to move to another state, working under a different name as a server and bartender in an Irish pub. From what little she'd gleaned from her brief interactions here, every member of the Finnegan family had achieved higher aspirations. The minute Rye found the bomber, she'd be on her way to a fresh start. She did her best to shrug off the depressing thought. Thanks again for loaning me the clothes, Ellie. She moved out to the hallway. Why don't we start dinner? Sounds good, Ellie beamed. Rye loves spaghetti, so that's what I planned. Let's do it. She followed the younger woman down the grand staircase to the kitchen. Rye was still at the table, working on his computer. He barely glanced up as they entered, no doubt years of practice tuning out his siblings while working. As they prepared the meal, Ellie talked about her EMT classes and how she'd learned how to put an IV catheter in. They only let us practice on a dummy, which isn't the same as a human being. But I figure I'll get one of my brothers to let me practice on them for real. Really? She couldn't imagine anyone volunteering to get stuck with a needle. Ellie glanced at Rye, who was ignoring them, and grinned. Trust me, they'll be falling over themselves to prove they're tougher than the next. Not me, Ellie, Rye interjected. I don't have anything to prove. You can get someone else to be your guinea pig. Aw, come on, it's just a little poke, Ellie teased. Nope. Rye closed his computer, tucked it under his arm, and stood. I have more calls to make. Let me know when dinner is ready, okay? Spoil sport, Ellie called after him. He didn't bother to respond. Ellie's phone rang and her face lit up when she answered it. Hey, Taryn, what's up? Devin didn't hear the other side of the conversation, but as Ellie sent her several quick looks, she soon realized she was the topic of discussion. Why don't you join us for dinner? Ellie suggested. Alana is working an extra shift and Aiden is doing his National Guard thing, so there's plenty extra. Another moment of silence as Ellie listened intently. Then she added, Great, be here before six. Oh, I have news about our Callahan cousins too. See you later, Tear. When Ellie pocketed her phone, Devin asked, Do all of your brothers and sisters pop in for dinner at random? We try to make Sunday dinner a consistent gathering, but that doesn't always work out with everyone's schedules, Ellie said with a shrug. So yeah, whenever there's time, the sibs drop by. They're always welcome. Ellie frowned. Although that's usually because I'm making dinner. Once I'm working shifts as an EMT, that will have to change. The others will have to chip in more to cook. Devin wasn't sure all families were as close as the Finnegans seemed to be. Then again, there were nine of them. Intimidating to realize she'd be meeting another one. When that was only the third sibling, there were five others she hadn't met yet. It was enough to make her head spin. Had Rye mentioned Taryn was a cop? She couldn't remember. Regardless of his background, the second oldest Finnegan would be suspicious of her, the same way Rye had been initially. Maybe it was better to meet one sibling a day, space things out a bit. Hopefully there wouldn't be a pop quiz. Between Ellie's chatting and working in the kitchen, time flew by quickly. Devin kept a wary eye on the clock, feeling certain Taryn would show up early. At 5.30, the front door opened. Taryn had red hair rather than blonde, but his facial features were such that he was obviously Rye's brother. Taryn! Ellie rushed across the room to embrace her brother. Glad you could make it. And miss a free meal? Why wouldn't I make it? Taryn eyed Devin over his sister's shoulder. Introduce me to your house, guest. Ellie released him, then drew him to the kitchen. Devin, this is Taryn, the second oldest Finnegan. Taryn, this is Devin. Ah, uh, Ellie faltered. I'm sorry, I don't know your last name. Thompson, Devin Thompson. She held out her hand. Nice to meet you, Taryn. He shook her hand, his gaze still wary. Rye filled me in a bit on what's going on. Sounds like you've had a rough few days. One day, she corrected with a sigh. It seems like much longer, but it hasn't been 24 hours since my car exploded. Wait, your car exploded? Ellie echoed in shock. She winced, 
realizing Rye hadn't filled his youngest sister in on the danger surrounding her. And by the narrow look in Terran's dark eyes, he wasn't happy to hear about that either. Her stay at the Finnegan homestead would likely be short-lived, especially if the somber-looking Terran had anything to say about it. And while she didn't really want to pay for a motel, she couldn't blame Terran or Rye for being protective of their family, something her father had never done. Rye! Dinner! Ellie called from the bottom of the stairs. He'd finished his phone calls to his team, his boss, along with a quick check-in with Gary Campbell at the American Lodge. Unfortunately, all remained quiet at the lodge, and his team hadn't found anything interesting on James Klein yet. Police work was slow and tedious, which was one of the reasons he enjoyed participating on the tactical unit. He preferred being active and thought again that he should have considered taking the detective exam the way Terran had, rather than moving up into leadership. The pay was better as a captain, but he'd rather be out on the streets. Too late now, he'd done what was best for the family at the time. No regrets, he sternly reminded himself as he washed up, then headed down to the kitchen. Finding Terran was a surprise. Hey, what brings you by? Dinner, Terran answered. The way his gaze narrowed on Devin told a different story. Rye suppressed a sigh, knowing an interrogation would soon come. Do you have a minute to talk? Sure. He gestured for his brother to come with him into the other room. Once they were alone, he held up a hand. Look, I know what you're going to say, Terran. Are you nuts? His brother demanded. What were you thinking to bring a stranger into the house while Ellie and the twins are still living here? Yeah, that. I knew you would come at me like a grizzly bear, but hear me out. This woman has been targeted by a bomber and needs to be safe. Three bombs, Terran, he said. There were three bombs set for her, and it's a miracle she's still alive. You know I'd never put Ellie or Alana in danger. I made sure we weren't followed. That's still a huge risk, Terran said with a scowl. You don't know anything about her. Surprisingly, he felt like he did know Devin. This is a temporary arrangement. With Gary's help, I set a trap at the American Lodge, renting a room under her name and keeping the rooms around that one vacant. Hopefully later tonight, we'll catch the bomber if he searches for her there. Terran stared at him for a long moment. This isn't like you, Rye. You always put family first. We all do, he said, although his brother was right. Bringing Devin to the Finnegan homestead was very much out of character for him. He still wasn't sure why he'd done it, but he also didn't have any regrets. Not after the way her mailbox had exploded. Gully had been sure Bot hadn't moved the key, but why would the bomber have used a timer? There hadn't been a timer on the bomb he'd set in her apartment. In reading the initial report from his team, the device had been a simple pipe bomb that would have been triggered by Devin unlocking the door. Had his guys missed something? He needed to find out, but not until after dinner. Taryn, you know that our parents would never have shut the door on someone in need. Devin's apartment building was damaged by the mailbox bomb. The place is off limits until it's been deemed safe. I'm just trying to support a woman who doesn't have anywhere else to go. But you didn't bring the other apartment tenants here too, did you? Taryn let out a frustrated sigh. I don't understand what's come over you, but it might be better if I stick around for a few days to help keep an eye on things. That's not necessary, Tear, but suit yourself. Aiden isn't here. You can bunk in his room or take the other guest room. Rye nodded toward the kitchen. Let's eat. Ellie seems to get along with Devin. Ellie likes everyone, Taryn muttered as he followed Rye across the room. She was always bringing in stray pets and kids. And it worked out, most of the time, Rye grimaced. Except for the stinky homeless guy who refused to shower, then was caught stealing what he thought was valuable silverware and knickknacks. Taryn burst out laughing at the memory. Yeah, poor dude had no idea that the silverware was cheap and mismatched, not worth anything to anyone. He just assumed we were rich because the house is so big. He didn't understand the real value here was that it's an awesome place to gather as a family. His brother's comment made him realize Taryn was looking at Devin much the way they'd all stared in horror at Ellie's homeless man. 
Oh, they'd tried to help the guy out. With everyone chipping in, they'd given him plenty of cash, along with food, water, clothes, and a promise to drive him to a shelter the next day. Unfortunately, when Rye had come down in the middle of the night, he'd caught the guy with a pillowcase full of their silverware, books, picture frames, and a few other odds and ends he'd stuffed inside. Rye had taken the pillowcase from the guy and shooed him out of there. The following morning, Ellie had been upset, but not just because he'd kicked the guy out. More so because, after she'd given the stranger her allowance, he'd still tried to steal their stuff, including a picture of their parents in a silver frame. It was a hard lesson for her to learn, but she also didn't let it get her down. As he took a seat at the kitchen table, he had to admit Taryn made a good point. Rye needed to be careful about trusting Devin. Dinner is ready, Ellie announced. She set a plate of spaghetti and meatballs in the center of the table. Devin, would you please grab the salad and garlic bread? Right here. Devin set a large bowl of spinach salad topped with bacon and vinaigrette dressing on the table, along with a heaping platter of garlic bread. Anything else? Ellie eyed the table critically. Nope, looks good. Rye took his usual seat at the center of the table. They only used the formal dining room when the entire family was together and prepared to say grace. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this wonderful food you've provided for us. We ask that you continue to keep each of us and the other Finnegans safe in your care and guide us as we follow your chosen path. Amen. Amen, Taryn, Ellie, and Devin echoed. They took a few minutes of passing the food around, then dug in. Tastes great, Ellie, thanks, Rye said. Devin helped, Ellie said modestly. She made the salad and garlic bread. Wasn't difficult, Devin protested. Well, thanks to both of you. Rye loved spaghetti and meatballs, making quick work of his food. What's this about finding cousins? Taryn asked. Oh, the Callahans, Ellie grinned. I found a DNA connection. I don't know for sure yet, but I think we share the same set of great-grandparents. Taryn lifted a brow, catching Rye's eye. He shrugged. Don't look at me. I have no idea why we didn't know about the family connection before now. Or why Ellie had felt the need to add more chaos to their family. He could tell she was already planning a large family reunion here at the homestead. He stifled a weary sigh. I know a guy named Callahan, Taryn mused. He's a canine cop, has a beautiful German shepherd as his partner. Really? Rye tried not to groan at the interest in Ellie's eyes. They'd had a dog growing up, but after Finley died a few years ago, he'd balked at replacing him. With fewer kids living at the house, it would be hard to take care of a dog, especially a puppy. Elle, he warned, we don't have time for a dog. Yes, we do. Ellie shot back. If you wanted one bad enough, we'd get one. Since that was mostly true, he didn't say anything more, concentrating his efforts on shoveling food into his mouth so he could get back to work. Cut Rye some slack, Ellie. He's doing his best. Taryn came to his rescue. Devin, you've been awfully quiet. Rye glanced at Devin, who blushed. I don't have anything to contribute. I'm an only child. I've never been part of a family dinner like this. He will on Sunday, Ellie piped up. Most of the family will be here then. Rye could tell by the frown on Taryn's face he wasn't pleased with Ellie inviting Devin to family dinner. He didn't really care one way or the other. Devin could hang here with Ellie until they had a lead on the bomber. He was confident it wouldn't take them long to nail the guy, especially if the perp was James Klein. They'd issued a bolo, be on the lookout, for him as a person of interest in the case. One social media post railing against the Roe family wasn't enough for an arrest, but they could and would question the guy, especially if he happened to be here in Milwaukee. I'll wash the dishes, Devin offered when they'd finished eating. It's the least I can do. Taryn looked a bit surprised by her willingness to pitch in. I can help too. No need, Taryn, Ellie waved a hand. We've got this. You cooked, Rye pointed out. The rule is, whoever cooks doesn't have to clean up. I don't mind, Devin said firmly. The rest of you go, do whatever it is you need to do. Taryn glanced at him, then shrugged. Okay, thanks Devin. I should probably hit the road. I have an early shift in the morning. No problem, 
Rye said. Be safe. Back at you, bro. Terran grabbed his coat and headed for the door. He paused, then glanced back at Rye. Call me if you need anything. Rye knew his brother was referring to the trap he and Gary had set at the American Lodge, and maybe about Devon. He nodded. Will do. After his brother left, he heard Ellie helping Devon in the kitchen. He knew she would. As the youngest, Ellie was normally surrounded by people. Being alone with him wasn't the same. He tried to work, but his vision kept blurring. The barely four hours of sleep he'd gotten was catching up with him. It was early to hit the sack, but getting a few hours of sleep was better than none. He went back into the kitchen to check on Devin. She looked cute wearing Ellie's clothes, although the jeans were a little short. All finished, Devin said when he came in. I hope you don't mind if I go to bed early. Not at all. I'm doing the same. He glanced around in surprise. Where's Ellie? One of her classmates called. Speaking of phones, mine is dead. I was wondering if you have a spare charger? There are several in the junk drawer. He tapped it with his finger. I hope you find one that works. She opened the drawer, rummaged around for a moment, then quickly pulled one out. This will fit. Thanks. He wondered who she wanted to chat with, but didn't ask. Maybe she had friends at McCormick's that she wanted to keep in touch with. Great. Good night. Good night. He stepped back so she could head up the stairs first. When they reached the landing, he could hear Ellie chatting on the phone in her room. Devin noticed too and gestured to the bathroom. Guess I'll call first dibs. See you in the morning. He nodded and moved past her down the hall to the master suite. After his parents had died, he'd resisted moving in there. Mostly because it was creepy to take over the room your parents used. But the other kids started to fight over the space, so he replaced the furniture and the carpeting and moved in. Now he barely noticed. The space had become his, with the added advantage of having his own bathroom. He checked his phone one last time for news from Gary. There was no message, so he plugged in the device and crawled into bed. Rye was so exhausted, he fell asleep instantly. When the phone jangled loudly, waking him, he was disoriented. It seemed like he'd just fallen asleep, but his bedside table clock said it was just past midnight. His pulse jumped when he saw Gary's number on the screen. He quickly answered. Do you have him? There's a guy hiding in the bushes behind the corner room where your girl is supposedly staying, Gary said in a whisper. He's dressed in black and has a ski mask on, so I can't give you any identifying marks. Where are you? Rye asked. Sitting in my office in the dark, trying not to scare him off? I have my laptop computer beneath my desk to hide the glowing screen. Good. You did great, Gary. He was already out of bed and reaching for his clothes. Don't engage. Just watch him. I'm on my way. Copy that. Rye quickly dressed in casual clothes as he technically wasn't on duty. That didn't stop him from grabbing his gun, badge, and cuffs, though. He'd notify his team once he had eyes on the perp. He had a good feeling about this, but as he tiptoed down the stairs, he inwardly groaned when he saw a light on in the kitchen. He hoped it was Ellie doing homework, but no such luck. Rye, what's going on? Devin jumped up from her seat. A cup of what looked like tea was on the table in front of her. Did the bomber show up at the motel? Maybe. I have to go. Snagging his jacket, he moved toward the garage. I'm coming with you. She was still dressed in Ellie's jeans and sweater, and she had already grabbed her coat, too. You can't. I need you to stay here. He didn't have time to argue. I'm coming with you or taking a rideshare. It was the same threat she'd made earlier in the day. Let's go. Fine, but you'd better stay in the car. He pushed through the garage door hitting the opener as he ran around to get behind the wheel. Irritated at being put in this position, he glanced at her. If you interfere with my ability to get this guy, I won't be happy. I won't. He planned to hold her to that promise. If she didn't follow orders, he'd stick her in a hotel at least an hour away without a second thought. Chapter 8 Devin knew she was pushing things with Rye. But she couldn't just stay in the Finnegan homestead waiting for news. 
she'd fallen asleep right away, but then a nightmare had woken her, the impact strong enough to prevent her from falling back asleep. As she settled into the passenger seat of Rye's SUV, she realized if she hadn't been awake and drinking sleepy time tea in the kitchen to help calm her thoughts, she wouldn't be sitting here now. Rye was grimly silent as he drove through the dark, cold night. Annoyance radiated from him in waves, so she didn't voice her questions. She was hopeful she'd learn more about what was going on very soon. Obviously, the owner of the American Lodge, what was his name, Gary something, must have let him know someone had approached the room they'd set up under her name. Her nerves jittered at the thought of finding and arresting the bomber. Getting him behind bars would put an end to her time with Rye and the Finnegan family, but at least she might be able to sleep at night without waking up in a cold sweat, reliving the moment her car had gone up in flames, and her mailbox too. Rye's phone jangled, breaking the strained silence. Finnegan, he answered curtly. Where are you? Gary's voice, or so she assumed, was a panicked whisper. I think he's leaving. Leaving? Without getting close to the motel room? Yeah, I can't see him on the cameras any longer. I think he might be getting away. You need to step on it. I'm two minutes out, Rye promised, then disconnected the call. Ignoring her, he punched the gas. She knew what he was thinking. If she hadn't argued with him, he'd probably already be at the motel. Rye pulled into the parking lot a minute later. Stay in the car. Without waiting for a response, he shot out of the car and ran around to the back of the motel. She gasped when she saw the gun in his hand. Her heart had been pounding already, but now a sick sense of dread washed over her. What if the bomber had figured out this was an elaborate trap? He could be hiding out there right now, waiting for the opportunity to take Rye out. No, she was the target, not Rye. With a nervous glance around the area, she swallowed hard and slouched down in the seat. This was why he hadn't wanted her to tag along. Devin didn't like upsetting Rye, but it was her life on the line. She wanted, needed to understand why the bomber had come after her. She wasn't sure how long she waited in the car. It seemed like eons, but eventually, Rye came back. The frustrated look on his face told her the bomber had gotten away. He wrenched her door open. You may as well come inside. She nodded and unlatched the seatbelt. I'm sorry. He shrugged and blew out a breath. Some of the tension in his features eased. It's not your fault. I think we'd have missed him anyway. I'm not sure why he didn't make a move on the motel room, unless he noticed the security cameras. I need time to review the video Gary has of the guy. Maybe we can learn something that will help. Okay. She hurried to catch up with him. Warm air embraced them as they went inside. It was only then that she realized how cold she'd been. Maybe she had been sitting in the car longer than she'd thought. Hey, Rye. Gary eyed her cautiously, so Rye introduced them. Gary, this is Devin Thompson. She's the target. Devin, Gary Campbell, owner of the American Lodge. Sorry to hear you're in this position, Gary murmured. Come with me. I'll show you what I have. The office seemed small and cramped with the three of them gathered inside. She wanted to see the video too, but hung back in the corner to give Rye and Gary room to work. Gary put his laptop on the desk, then gestured to the chair. Sit down. I'll start from when I first noticed them. Reaching over his shoulder, Gary tapped several keys, then stood back, giving Rye the controls. There was no audio recording, so a strained silence hung in the room. Rye stared intently at the screen, the furrow between his brow deepening with every second that passed. After a few minutes, he glanced over at her. I'd like you to see this, Devin. He waved her over. Maybe you'll notice something familiar about this guy. She and Gary changed positions, so she was the one looking over his shoulder. The image wasn't as clear as she'd hoped. It wasn't easy to make out the shadowy figure standing in the trees. But as the video continued, the man's image became clear, enough that she could see the guy was wearing tight, dark clothing along with a ski mask over his head. After a long moment, she asked, Does he have a backpack? Good eye, Rye said. Yeah, he does. Which makes me think he was planning to put a bomb someplace near your room. 
He may have planned to trigger the explosion himself, rather than setting something to go off with something you did. A shudder rippled over her, but she tried to mask her fear. Maybe he would have put it on a timer, too, thinking that I'd be asleep. Good point. Rye kept the video going, and moments later, the bomber stepped backward and disappeared into the wooded area behind him. I checked in the woods back there, and while I found some footprints in the snow, they're overlapped and messed up to the point I can't even identify a possible shoe size. He must have left a car relatively close by, Gary said. I didn't hear or see any vehicles approaching. I'll have my team canvas the area tomorrow, Rye said. I'm sure no one saw anything this late, she said, feeling dejected. It's the reason he waited to come at this hour. You never know. Rye glanced over his shoulder to meet her gaze. Evening shift workers often come home at this time, staying up for a while after they get off work. And we also don't know how long this guy cased the place. The camera picked him up here because he got within range, but he may have been farther back in the woods for a while. Someone could have seen him or a strange car. I've learned over the years to never make assumptions. He made a good point. She'd headed home at 2.30 in the morning for five days straight for the past nine months. Closing the pub alone had honed her habit of being hyper-aware of her surroundings. Rye played the video again. She stayed where she was, watching closely for any clues. But there was nothing. I'm sorry, but I have no idea who that is. She hated disappointing him. Maybe if he wasn't wearing the ski mask, I'd have recognized him. I understand. Rye stopped the video after the masked man disappeared out of camera range, then stood. Gary, can you give me a copy of that video? Yeah, no problem. They shuffled positions in the room so he could do as Rye had asked. Moments later, he handed over a small USB drive. I wish it was more helpful. Something is better than nothing. Rye took the drive, and we know the plan worked to the point of drawing the bomber to the motel. How did he know I was there? Or rather, that I was supposed to be there? She glanced between the two men. I know we used my debit card to get the room, but how does someone access my personal information? A very good question. Rye looked thoughtful. Whoever this bomber is, he has connections, either to law enforcement or with your bank, which happens to have a national footprint, meaning the guy could still be one of your father's victims from Chicago. He shrugged. That's another avenue we'll need to investigate. The bank is an interesting thought, Gary said. I'm sure you could go through the list of victims to see if anyone worked there, or worked within law enforcement. My father was arrested and charged eight years ago, she said. The trial was just a year later. Something he did just to prolong the inevitable. Those connections won't be easy to find after all this time. Not easy, but not impossible. Rye headed for the door. Thanks, Gary. You did great tonight. Most excitement I've had in years, he joked. I'll show you out. They left Gary in the lobby and then climbed into the SUV. She couldn't help wondering if the bomber was somewhere out there, watching them. Rye's gaze swept the area as if he shared her concern, but as he drove away from the parking lot and headed home, she didn't see anything unusual, especially since Rye took many winding turns, doubling back several times. I'm sorry I made you late in getting to the motel, she said. I know it's my fault you weren't able to find and arrest him. It's not your fault. Rye sighed and reached over to squeeze her hand. I was irritated by your insistence on coming along, but only because I don't want to be put in a place where I must protect you while trying to do my job. I hate knowing you're in danger. But you should know that the timing in the video confirmed the bomber was gone a few seconds before Gary called the second time. I would have missed him anyway. I'm disappointed we didn't get him, Devin, but as I said... The fact that he showed up at all proves we're on the right track. It was nice of him to try to make her feel better. She hadn't really considered that his need to protect her would distract him from his job. She yawned, slumping against the seat. Between the herbal tea and the adrenaline crash, exhaustion hit hard. She wanted nothing more than to crawl back into bed. Rye pulled into the driveway, the garage door sounding incredibly loud at this hour of the night. 
She wondered if Alana or Ellie would be awakened by the sound, but Rye didn't seem concerned as he parked, then shut the garage door behind them. She followed him inside, pausing long enough to take off her jacket. Her tea was stone cold, so she emptied the cup in the sink and filled it with water to soak. When she turned, Rye was so close she almost bumped into him. He lightly grasped her shoulders, staring down at her. Devin, you can't come with me while I'm doing my job like that again. If you can't agree to stick to the rules, I'll set you up in a motel far away from here. Even if you get a rideshare, you'll be so far away it won't matter. She should have expected his scolding, but for some reason she hadn't. What would you do in my situation? She held his gaze. I can guarantee you wouldn't be sitting back while others investigated your case. I'm a cop. You're not. His sharp tone made her wince. The situation isn't the same and you know it. Even if I was the target, my boss wouldn't let me run my own investigation. I need you to promise me you won't pull a stunt like this again. Don't force me to find somewhere else for you to stay for the next few days. His rebuke hurt, but she tried not to show it. Her voice was hoarse with emotion as she finally answered, I promise. Thank you. His hands gentled as he pulled her in for a hug. Trust in me and my team. We'll get this guy. She drew in a deep breath, relishing in his warm male scent. I do trust you. The words were muffled against his chest. She'd first met Rye less than 24 hours ago. But she trusted him in a way she hadn't trusted anyone in a long time. With an effort, she pulled out of his arms and summoned a smile. She tipped her head up to thank him, just as he was lowering his head toward hers. She didn't move away. Instead, she went up on her tiptoes to kiss him. She kept it short, a way of saying thanks, but somehow his arms tightened, drawing her closer as their mouths fused together. His kiss was everything she'd hoped for and more. Sweet, passionate, gentle, yet sending a sizzle down her spine, leaving her craving more. But even as she enjoyed the moment, she warned herself it wouldn't last. Despite Ellie's wish for her older brother to find someone, Devin knew she wasn't the kind of woman a man like Rye would want to spend his life with. And that grim knowledge was enough to give her the strength to break off from his kiss turn and hightail it up to her room, closing the door firmly behind her. Rye stood in the kitchen, listening to Devin rush upstairs to her room. If Rye was a cursing man, he'd have let loose a string of them. But of course, he didn't utter a single sound. What on earth had he been thinking to kiss her? Taryn was right, he had lost his marbles. Devin was a victim of a crime, Getting involved with her was wrong on so many levels. Most importantly, any sort of impropriety could ruin his case against the bomber, which was exactly what Taryn had so bluntly reminded him of earlier. Rye tipped his head back to gaze up at the ceiling. Unfortunately, he was already in too deep when it came to Devon. He cared about her more than just as a victim. Watching her bemused reaction to his siblings gave him the impression she lived a lonely life. Since he'd never been alone, he couldn't even fathom what she'd been through over the years since her father's arrest. And while he wouldn't wish away his siblings, he'd often wished for a little peace and quiet. Not that much peace and quiet, though. Not to the point where he had no one to turn to in times of a crisis. Maybe that's what had sucked him in. He hated to admit he might be more like Ellie in taking in strays than he'd thought. Devin was a perfect example. He needed to keep his head screwed on straight. No more hugging and kissing the victim. He'd dedicate himself to finding the bomber so that Devin could move on with her life. End of story. Yet, as her taste lingered on his tongue, Rye knew he'd need every bit of God's strength to get through the next few days. After turning off the lights, he trudged back upstairs. He'd call his boss first thing in the morning so officers could canvas the area around the American Lodge. As he drifted off to sleep, he remembered seeing the church steeple down the road a few blocks from the motel. It wasn't likely the church had cameras, but it wouldn't hurt to ask. Rye didn't sleep well, 
and secretly blamed his restlessness on the way he'd kissed Devin rather than on losing the perp. A shower helped rejuvenate him, and he changed into his uniform and put the canvas request in motion before heading down to the kitchen. He'd need to go to the precinct today rather than try to work from home. Today was Friday, and he was supposed to be off the weekend. Although, if the bomber wasn't caught very soon, he planned to keep working the investigation. As he descended the stairs, the enticing scent of bacon and coffee made his mouth water. Breakfast smells great, he said, entering the kitchen. He'd expected to find Ellie, but found Devin was the one manning the stove. Good morning, she glanced over her shoulder at him. I started with the bacon. If you're ready, I'll cook up a few eggs. I, uh, thanks. He made a beeline for the coffee. I don't expect you to cook every meal. I know. She shrugged and broke eggs into a pan. To be honest, it gives me something to do. I'm used to working 10 to 12 hour shifts five days a week. All this free time is unnerving. He poured a mug of coffee, leaned against the counter and took a sip. I guess this isn't the ideal place to take a vacation. Oh, it's beautiful here, but I don't get vacation time. Her smile was crooked. I have to pay rent in the next two weeks, assuming the apartment building will have been cleared by then and I'm allowed to return. He almost offered to help her out with some cash, then remembered he was supposed to be distancing himself from this woman. I wish I had an answer, but I don't know how long it will take for the building to be cleared and repaired. He paused, then added, but you may want to talk to the manager anyway. I hate to say this, but I'm not sure he'll want you back. I already thought of that, she admitted. It doesn't matter. I probably won't stick around here anyway. He frowned. Where will you go? I'm not sure, but I'll figure it out. After this guy is caught, of course. She glanced at him. Sunny side up or over easy? It took a moment to realize she was talking about the eggs. Over easy. That's the way I like them, too. She expertly flipped the eggs and then reached for a plate. He pushed away from the counter. This whole keeping his distance idea was harder than he'd anticipated. As ridiculous as it sounded, he didn't want her to leave town, not even after they'd found and arrested this guy. Although he certainly couldn't blame her for wanting a fresh start. Maybe this was her way of telling him she was planning to move on, that their incredible kiss didn't mean much to her. He should have been relieved to hear of her plans, yet he found himself irked by the news. He didn't say anything, though, as she set a plate of bacon and over-easy eggs in front of him. As always, he waited for her to join him. The family rule had been that they would pray together before meals. Devin's experience in working in the pub meant she tended to serve meals restaurant-style. I don't understand why you don't eat while it's hot. She dropped into the chair next to him. Because it's rude not to wait, and we need to pray. She grimaced. Sorry, I keep forgetting. He took her hand before he could talk himself out of it. Dear Lord, we thank you for blessing us with this food, and with the safety you continue to provide for us. We ask that you continue to protect us and keep us safe. Amen. Amen, Devin echoed. She released his hand to pick up her fork. That was nice. I have to say, I've never been with a family who prayed the way you do. I'm sorry to hear that. He took a bite of the bacon, enjoying the crispy and not very healthy treat. It's so automatic, I'd do it without thinking. She nodded, her expression thoughtful. You've given me a view of faith I've never considered before. I'm glad. There was much for her to know. Prayer was only a small part of knowing God and Jesus. You can attend church services with us on Sunday if you like. If I'm still here, she said after a moment's hesitation. That would be nice, thanks. Ellie padded into the kitchen, yawning while heading straight for the coffee pot. Morning. You look tired. He wondered if she'd heard him leaving and returning home last night. Didn't you sleep well? Alana wanted to talk after her shift, so we chatted for a while. Ellie came over to sit at the table. I thought I heard the garage door, but must have fallen asleep right after that. How do you like your eggs? Devin asked, jumping up. I'll make them for you. I'll do it. Ellie waved her back. Sit and finish your own food. 
Oh, Rye, I need to grocery shop today, too. He pulled out his wallet and extracted two hundred dollars. Let me know if you need more. This should be fine, thanks. Ellie tucked the bills away. Devin watched with apparent shock. He realized she didn't spend that much in groceries for herself in a month, much less a week. He dug back into his meal, only to be interrupted by his phone. Seeing his boss's number on the screen, he rose and went into the other room. What's this about a canvas being done near the motel? And asking about camera footage from the nearby church? Which doesn't have cameras, by the way. He kept his voice down so the women in the kitchen couldn't hear. I'm heading to the precinct. I have a video of the perp. He's wearing a ski mask, so it's not much help as far as identifying him. But he has enough tech-savvy access to have discovered Devin had a room there. It's a place to start. I want to see that video ASAP. I would have called last night if we'd gotten anything good. He was disappointed there were no cameras at the church. Figured there was no reason for you to be up in the middle of the night. Yeah, thanks. There was a brief pause, then Michaels added, We're working with Chicago PD to see if we can get information on James Klein. Rye wished he could go to Chicago to do the legwork himself, but there was no way to work a case outside his jurisdiction. Okay, in the meantime, we can do a search on his credit card, see if he's been using his plastic in Milwaukee. He glanced at his watch. I'll be in within 15 minutes or so. We've got avenues to explore to find this guy. If James Klein is your bomber, his boss said pessimistically. The ski-masked guy on your video could be anyone. I know. See you soon. He disconnected from the line, then quickly returned to the kitchen. He planned to finish his breakfast and hit the road. You look so handsome in your uniform, Ellie said, sending Devin a wide smile. Don't you think so? Of course, Devin agreed. Stuff it. He gulped his eggs, then stuck the last piece of bacon in his mouth. I need to get to work, he said around the bacon in his mouth. Thanks for breakfast, Evan. Behave, brat. He patted his sister on the shoulder, grabbed his jacket, and headed to the garage. The precinct was a whirl of activity. There had been a double shooting last night, with two dead and one woman wounded. Shortly after he arrived, his tactical team was called out to deal with a gunman holding his family hostage. The work never stopped, and while he was frustrated by the delay in working on discovering more about the bomber, he tagged along with his guys to the hostage scene. He had skills as a hostage negotiator, as well as explosive devices. Two hours later, he finally convinced the gunman to surrender. Rather than stick around to do the debrief, he headed back to search for information on James Klein. He was still going through reams of reports when Assistant Chief Michaels came into his office. I just heard back from the Chicago PD. Oh yeah? He glanced up. Good news, I hope. Not exactly. Michaels sighed. Klein isn't in Milwaukee or in Chicago. He committed suicide a few months ago. Rye groaned and pushed away from his computer. Klein isn't our bomber. Nope. I watched that video too. You're right, it's not at all helpful. The assistant chief turned to open the door. You're back at square one, Finnegan. Rye watched his boss leave, sharing his frustration. All they had was a video of a masked man and the possibility of a link to either the bank or law enforcement. It was going to be a long day. Chapter 9 As much as she enjoyed Ellie's company, Devin wished she was down at the police precinct with Rye. It was torture to be left behind, assisting with mundane tasks like grocery shopping and laundry, while knowing the masked man was still out there searching for her. She found herself looking over her shoulder constantly, even though there was no reason to believe the bomber knew she was staying at the Finnegan homestead. The grocery store was busy for being a Friday. She didn't see anyone suspicious lurking nearby, but there were strangers everywhere. She felt as if people were staring at her, knowing she didn't belong. When she and Ellie returned home, there were more household chores to keep her busy. She didn't mind pitching in to help, the house was big, so they split up cleaning the four bathrooms. I hope Rye doesn't expect you to do all the cleaning, she said to Ellie when they'd finished. I mean, it's not just women's work. 
Oh, Aiden does his fair share too, Ellie assured her. And Rye normally cleans his own room and bathroom, along with doing most of the maintenance stuff. He fixed our dryer a few months ago. Ellie grinned. He had to use a YouTube instruction video, which was pretty funny, but it worked. Glad to hear it. She smiled and dropped the issue, since how duties were doled out in managing the Finnegan home wasn't really her business. It was just that Ellie seemed to be the one doing most of the work, which didn't sit well with her. Oddly, she felt comfortable being in the house, considering she'd only been there a couple of days. The apartment she'd lived in for nine months had always seemed foreign to her. At the time, she'd chalked that up to having moved several times over the years. But now she wondered if it was because the apartment had never been a real home, certainly not like here. She shook off the thought. There was no sense in wishing for something she couldn't have. Besides, she was still nervous about her presence putting Ellie and the other siblings in danger. She couldn't bear the thought of anything bad happening to them. Once they'd finished the chores, Ellie told her to relax in the living room, as she had DNA work to do on the computer. She found a section of mystery and suspense books and was thrilled to find several by her favorite authors. Settling into the sofa, she began to read. The garage door opened, and a few minutes later, she heard voices in the kitchen. She'd hoped Rye was home, but both voices were female. Ellie, did you buy a pot roast for Sunday dinner? Yep. Where have you been, Alana? I thought you had off the weekend. I do, but decided to head to the gym for a while, then met a friend for lunch. Devin heard the refrigerator door opening and closing. You skipped out of Saturday chores, Ellie said, without anger. Good thing Devin helped out, or I'd still be scrubbing bathrooms. Sorry, I'll cook dinner tonight and tomorrow night too. I know I should have stayed to help. I had a rough few days at work and needed to decompress. Lose a patient? Ellie asked sympathetically. Two of them. There was a pause, then Alana asked, Where's Devin? I've barely had a chance to talk to her. Taking that as a hint, she set her book aside and headed into the kitchen. It seemed to be the gathering place of the Finnegans. I'm here. Hey, thanks for your help today. Alana eyed her curiously. It's not like Rye to bring someone home. That's more Ellie's gig. I only did that once, Ellie protested. No, you only brought a strange homeless man home once, Alana corrected. You brought several of your classmates over when you found out there were problems at their homes. Your friend Jessica spent a week in our room. A homeless man? Friends from school? Devin couldn't help but smile. Really? That sounds like an interesting hobby. Alana laughed. We preferred the animals she brought in, more so than the people. We were already sharing bedrooms as it was. The last thing we wanted was to double up more. The homeless guy slept on the sofa, Ellie protested. Until Rye caught him stealing, Alana agreed. I felt bad about that, Ellie confessed. Then said, Remember the puppy I brought home that turned out to be a baby coyote? She giggled. I thought Rye was going to have a heart attack on the spot. That was because he was worried the coyote parents would come back to bite you, Alana said dryly. And he was forced to get the Wildlife Society involved since we couldn't put the pup back in the wild after he spent the day in your room being fed people food you smuggled from the kitchen table. Three days... Ellie corrected with a shrug. Pretty sure I lied to Rye about that. Rye hates lying more than anything, so you better keep that to yourself, Alana said. Devin winced, thinking of how she'd lied about her name. Not that she'd kept the secret for long. Still, hearing about how Rye despised liars made it even more surprising he'd brought her here. That's only because Rachel cheated on him, Ellie pointed out. Then she glanced at Devin. Rye and Rachel were engaged to be married. Then our parents were killed and Rye instantly moved back home. Rachel was not happy about Rye taking on that level of responsibility, although she played along for a while pretending it was all great. Then she secretly found someone else. Ellie's brown gaze darkened. Rachel should have just broken up with him, but instead she kept Rye's engagement ring, then cheated on him with a cop buddy of his. Ouch. Devin murmured. That must have been rough. It was, Alana agreed. That's why I keep harping on Rye to get on with his life, Ellie said. 
I'm thrilled he brought you here, Devin. Hold on. Devin held up a hand. Despite the heated kiss they'd shared, she knew Rye wasn't interested in starting something personal. I'm only here until the bomber is caught. Rye isn't interested in me that way. Come on, Ellie. Don't put Devin on the spot like that, Alana chided. Rye will settle down once he's good and ready. I hope you're right, Ellie muttered. I worry about him. Not as much as he worries about all of us. Alana drained her soft drink. Rye is uber responsible. He won't even think of dating anyone until the rest of us are settled. You mean me, Ellie said glumly. I'm the failure in the family. I didn't say that. You're still finding your way. Alana patted her on the shoulder. Devin, would you like something to drink? We have plenty of soft drinks. No thanks. I'm fine. She'd learned a lot about Rye from this conversation and would have been content to stay and hear more, especially stories about their childhood. It had never bothered her to be an only child. She tended to prefer the peace and quiet, especially after working long shifts at the pub. But there was also something to be said for family camaraderie. Alana and Ellie seemed to get along well, but she had to assume it wasn't always that way at least from what little she'd heard about sibling squabbling from a few of her friends. Only three of Rye's youngest siblings lived here now. Impossible to imagine what it had been like to have all nine of them here at the same time. Pure madness. She eyed the clock warily, jumping up when she heard the garage door open. The strange look that Alana sent her way made her flush guiltily. I just want to hear... What, if anything, Rye has uncovered about the bomber? I understand, Alana said, but the twinkle in her eye made it seem like she was reading more into Devin's involuntary reaction. Okay, she needed to get a grip. If she wasn't careful, Alana and Ellie would learn about the kiss she and Rye had shared, the embrace she'd been unable to forget. Rye entered the kitchen looking tired, yet still devastatingly handsome. Her mouth went dry, and it took a moment for her to regain control. Hey, how was your day? Busy. He didn't elaborate, but glanced over to where Alana was standing at the stove. What are we having? Mom's infamous grilled chicken and broccoli concoction. Alana grinned. It's really not much more than a casserole, except we make it in an oversized electric fry pan. Sounds good, Rye said. Thanks for doing that. He moved through the kitchen as if to head upstairs. Did you uncover the identity of the bomber? Devin followed him toward the stairs. He paused, then turned to face her. I'm sorry, but we don't have anything yet. We were able to rule out the one victim I thought might be responsible. He committed suicide several months ago. He never recovered from losing his son. Suicide? She paled. Another death my father is responsible for. Not everyone commits suicide when things are tough, he said. Don't take on anything more, Devin. Bottom line, he's not the bomber. He grimaced. Sorry, I don't have better news. That's okay. She forced a smile to hide her keen disappointment. I wish there was something I could do to help. I mean, other than cleaning the house, that is. Rye's gaze softened. Nice of you to help Ellie and Alana out. It's a big house and needs a lot of upkeep. It's the least I can do, since I'm staying here for free and borrowing Ellie's clothes. Speaking of which, I need to shower and change. Rye gave her a nod, then turned away. Taking the stairs two at a time, he headed to his room. She sighed and dropped down to sit on the stairs. She'd really hoped for something more, a lead on who was responsible for setting off these bombs. What if Rye was right about her Uncle Charles? She'd dismissed the idea because it seemed far-fetched, but now she understood her family was nothing like the Finnegans. Her father's paranoia and anti-government rhetoric had been bad enough to ruin her parents' marriage. It wasn't a stretch to think her Uncle Charles was operating under the same sort of delusions. It would be more surprising if he wasn't. Rye returned, coming down the staircase ten minutes later. He frowned when he saw her waiting for him. Something wrong? She rose to face him. Can I borrow your computer after dinner? I have some work to do, but you can use it for a few minutes. Why? What do you need? 
His instant suspicion made it hard to imagine he hadn't known about the coyote-slash-puppy Ellie hid in her room for three days. I'd like to try to find my Uncle Charles. I have guys working on that. We just learned Charles has a son, Lane Rowe. He's a few years younger than you. She glared at him. Why didn't you tell me that when I asked earlier? We don't know they're involved, and I can't keep you informed of every step in the investigation. That's not keeping me informed of every step in your precious investigation, she shot back. It's news about my family I didn't even know. He sighed. I asked you to trust me, Devin. She was about to point out he could do the same when Alana called, Dinner's ready. Great, I'm hungry. Rye brushed past her, heading into the kitchen, leaving her wondering about the cousin she didn't know and wishing Rye would trust her half as much as she was supposed to trust him. Rye felt bad for snapping at Devin. It wasn't her fault he was tired and hungry. His day had gone from bad to worse, leaving very little time for him or his team to work the case. And while he hated letting her down, he wasn't about to blab about his investigation to her purview either. She wasn't a cop, and any attempt on her part to help would be useless. He was looking at a long evening of work, but that wasn't Devin's problem, it was his. He led the evening prayer, then passed the casserole dish around the table. Thankfully, there were also fresh rolls, so he ate one of those while he waited for the dish to get back to him. What's the matter, Rye? Didn't you eat lunch? Alana asked. Nope. He took the casserole back and put a heaping helping on his plate. Too busy. You're off this weekend, though, right? Ellie asked. It's just Aiden who's working. We'll plan ten for Sunday dinner, including Devin. I don't need to join the family meal, Devin protested. Don't be silly, of course you'll join us. Ellie waved off her concern. We always have plenty of food. Please join us, Rye said, trying to make up for his earlier abruptness. It will be nice to have someone other than family at the table. Especially now that everyone is single again, Alana said wryly. Sunday dinner has been boring over the past couple of years. Yeah, it was too bad Quinn and Sammy broke up, Ellie said with a sigh. I liked her. Quinn will find someone, as will the rest of you, I hope. Rye hated to admit that getting his siblings out on their own would be easier if they would find someone to spend their lives with. Getting them out of the house was one thing, but having them settled down and married would be better. The fact that all nine of them were still single made him feel as if he were failing his parents big time. No offense, Rye, but we didn't like Rachel, Ellie said. None taken. He responded dryly. Ellie's comment wasn't entirely true. His siblings had liked Rachel just fine when they'd first gotten engaged, before their parents had died, before he'd taken over as head of the family. Even the lack of support from Rachel didn't turn to intense hatred until after she'd cheated on him. Beware the wrath of the Finnegans, he thought with a faint smile. His siblings had told Rachel off in no uncertain terms. As usual, Rye was the first one finished with his meal. He carried his dishes to the sink and soaked them in water. Ellie, do you mind if I pass on doing dishes? I have more work to plow through tonight. I'll do them, Devin quickly offered. Ellie and Alana cooked. I'll help, Alana chimed in. I skipped out on bathroom duty. He frowned. We're all supposed to chip in, Alana. Says the guy who's skipping out of dish duty, Ellie teased. It's fine, Rye. We'll get it done. Thanks. Normally, he didn't mind doing his share. Those were the house rules his parents had put into place years ago, and a tradition he'd carried on after they were gone. Yet, he needed to get some traction on this bomber, and soon. Devin was growing too close and personal already, and that was only after two days. What if she had to stay for an entire week? It was bad enough that memories of their kiss would not leave him alone. Earlier, when they'd been talking at the bottom of the stairs, he'd wanted to pull her into his arms. It wasn't like him to let a woman get under his skin. Hadn't he learned his lesson with Rachel? No, he needed to work tonight and all weekend. He'd do whatever was necessary to get a lead on this bomber. As he left the kitchen, he heard Devin ask, Ellie, would you mind if I borrowed your computer? I don't mind at all, Ellie said. 
I'll need it tomorrow morning to do homework, but I was planning to relax tonight. Rye hesitated, then kept going, heading toward the small study located off the living room. No reason to worry about Devon's attempt to investigate the case. He doubted she'd get very far. The study was more of an alcove than an actual room. When he'd first moved back home after his parents' deaths, he'd considered building walls and a door to turn it into a bedroom. But there hadn't been a need once Brady had gone to Quantico for FBI training and Aiden had joined the National Guard. Kylie had also moved out on her own with some female cop friends, so he hadn't bothered with the change. Using the desktop computer he'd upgraded two years ago, he went to work. His current plan was to review his long list of victims to cross-reference with law enforcement or banking connections. This was the best lead he had so far. The masked man must have some high-level access to have identified Devin's room at the American Lodge Motel. He wished the trap had yielded better results, but he had little choice but to work with what he had, which wasn't much. It was painstaking work requiring intense concentration. The women chattered seemingly non-stop as they worked in the kitchen, but he ignored them. He'd learned to tune his family out a long time ago, a trait that had come in handy while working in the busy and often rambunctious precinct as well. After an hour, he found a connection to the bank. Glomming on to the information, he quickly took notes. The husband of a female victim who died in the second of Rose's government-targeted bombs was a loan officer at the same national bank as the branch located across the street from Devon's apartment building. Terence Shook lived and worked in Chicago. Digging deeper, he pulled up the guy's driver's license photo. At 41, Terence looked at least a decade older, with his graying hair and worn features. Not that driver's license photos were ever great, but his was worse than most. Rye tried to imagine the guy dressed in a ski mask, casing the American Lodge Motel at midnight, but the two images didn't mesh well, especially since Terrence was roughly 75 pounds heavier than the guy in the video. A bomber for hire? He grimaced. Possible, but not likely. Murder for hire was far more common. The average person on the street could easily shoot someone, but it took a specialized level of knowledge to build three bombs with triggers set on a car's key fob, the opening of an apartment door, and the apartment mailbox. Then again, these services and more were available on the dark web, for a hefty price paid almost exclusively in cryptocurrency. It wasn't a stretch for a loan officer working in a bank to know exactly how to set something like that up, though. He highlighted Terence Shook's name and continued his search. He found a connection to law enforcement roughly 15 minutes later. Rye, I think you need to check something out. Huh? He lifted his gaze from the computer to find Devin standing there, looking nervous. Check what out? There's a car parked down the street. She twisted her fingers together. It's been there for the past hour. An hour? He struggled to dial back his anger. Which side of the street? East side of the street, roughly three houses to the south. I would have mentioned it earlier, but I don't know your neighbors. I didn't think much about it until now. Why now? He minimized the computer screen, then drew her toward the kitchen. Because the windows have fogged up. I think someone is waiting inside. Stay here. He took a moment to pull his weapon from his ankle holster. It was his backup weapon, and he didn't want to waste time going upstairs. The lights were off in the kitchen, so he made his way over to see the vehicle for himself. It was a four-door, dark-colored sedan. Maybe a Chevy, but it was hard to tell for sure. He turned back toward Devin. I'll check it out. If I'm not back in five minutes, call the police. Why not call them now? She grabbed his arm as if to hold him back. I don't think it's smart for you to head outside alone. Because it could be nothing. Five minutes, he repeated, then lightly pulled out of her grasp. Grabbing his coat, he went around to the back door leading out from the laundry room. He wanted to come up on the vehicle from the opposite side of the street, in case the reason for the fogged windows was nothing more than two teenagers making out, rather than the bomber keeping watch on the Finnegan homestead. It was strange that the bomber would park on the same street as their house. He knew most of the neighbors by name and their cars. 
occupational hazard of being a cop. He liked knowing who was coming and going, but it was impossible to keep track of his neighbor's friends and family who might stop in to visit. Slipping outside and making his way to the street located behind the house, Rye wished there wasn't so much snow on the ground. For one thing, he left a trail of footprints, and for another, it was nearly impossible to avoid being seen against the backdrop of white snow. The seconds ticked by in his head as he took a circular route to approach the sedan with fogged windows from the opposite side. He walked down the sidewalk as if out for a stroll, keeping his gaze locked on the car. With the fogged over windows, the driver couldn't see him any easier than he could see inside. When he was about 30 yards away, the sedan's engine rumbled to life. The windshield wipers flew back and forth, and the lights came on. Rye lifted his arm to block the bright lights, still trying to see inside the car. Were there two people inside, or just one? The sedan abruptly leaped forward, coming straight at him. He watched in horror as the car bounced up and over the curb and onto the sidewalk. Rye was forced to dive off the sidewalk, landing in the snow. He rolled twice, making sure the car didn't follow to roll over him, then lifted his head. The vehicle had rolled back onto the road and was speeding away. No, the perp was getting away. He lifted his weapon, intending to fire, but then changed his mind. Firing off a weapon in the Brookland subdivision was asking for trouble. Besides, the car was already gone, and he didn't have proof the driver was connected to the bombing. The car had tried to run him over, but the most he could be cited for was reckless driving. Yet there was no doubt in his mind the two incidents were connected, and the most troubling thought of all was that the bomber knew where he and his family lived. Bringing Devin home to his family had been a colossal mistake. Chapter 10 Devin's heart pounded in her chest as she watched Rye jump out of the way of the sedan that lunged toward him. Before she could dial 911, the car was gone and Rye was already jogging back to the house. Her stomach churned with nausea. Not only had the bomber found her at his house, but that same man had tried to kill Rye. She needed to get far away from there. Just thinking of Ellie or Alana being in danger was enough to have her fumbling for her phone to pull up a rideshare app. What are you doing? Rye asked. There's no reason to call 911. There's nothing the police can do about this now. I'm looking for a rideshare. She clicked on the app, then glanced at him with remorse. It's my fault you and your family are in danger. Don't bother. They already know you're here. He put his hand on her phone. You heading out to a motel now isn't going to help. I can't stay. What if that car comes back? She slowly sank into the closest kitchen chair. I hate this, Rye. I don't even know why this guy is coming after me. I know, but it's not your fault. He rested his hand on her shoulder. It's weird, though, that the bomber was able to track you here. How? I haven't used my debit card for anything. He was silent for a moment, staring at her phone. She looked down at it, too. My phone? She frowned. If he can track my phone, why did he bother to go to the American Lodge Motel? He's smarter than I anticipated, or he has some incredible connections. When he realized the American Lodge was a trap... He could have dug deeper, learning about your phone carrier. From there, he figured out how to trace your phone, following you here to my house. Rye's expression turned grim. It's my fault he found you here. I should have anticipated his next move. He was being too hard on himself. I should never have come here. There was a moment of silence before Rye spoke. What's done is done. We need to set another trap, a better one. We can make sure your phone is in the room, too. She frowned. Tonight? He hesitated, glancing at the window. No, not tonight. I'll get Taryn and Brady to help keep an eye out for the bomber to return. He stepped away. You should head upstairs to get some sleep. Sleep? She stared up at him. I'm too wired to sleep. It's probably better if I take a turn keeping watch for the sedan to return. He looked pained. No need for you to do that, but thanks for the offer. She wanted to argue, but knew it would be useless. Obviously, Rye liked to call the shots. No doubt that came from being the oldest of nine. She inwardly sighed and rose to her feet. Fine, I'll go. 
If you or your brothers need something, let me know. I doubt I'll be able to sleep much anyway. You need your rest, he chided. Easy to say, not to do, she thought grimly. She nodded and turned away. As she ascended the stairs, she heard Rye on the phone. Brady, I need your help. There was no doubt in her mind that Brady and any of Rye's other brothers would drop whatever they were doing to come help keep their sisters safe. It must be nice to have family you could count on, rather than be embarrassed about. She'd despised being related to one of the most notorious bombers in history. Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, the Tsarnaev brothers, who bombed the Boston Marathon, and her father, Paul Rowe. And now this new bomber, who'd targeted her three times already. The other bombers had chosen to kill random people, but not this guy. Oh no, he wanted to harm her specifically, most likely because of her father. She did her best to shake off the depressing thoughts. Tomorrow she'd meet more Finnegans, but only briefly. She fully expected Rye to get her out of the house early, right after he set a second trap for the bomber. Hopefully this time, the bomber would fall for the ruse, especially if she insisted on staying inside the room too. Using herself as bait was the best way to ensure Rye and his team caught this guy. After washing up in the bathroom, she sat at the top of the stairs, listening to the rumble of deep male voices. She was torn between the urge to talk to the Finnegan brothers and the desire to avoid confrontation by isolating herself in her room. What were you thinking? One of the voices rose loud enough that she could hear it. I know, Brady, I know. Don't you think I'm already kicking myself over bringing her here? I should never have put the family in harm's way. My only excuse is that I wanted Devin to be safe. Devin? Oh, you mean the Vic. Rye's brother's tone reeked of sarcasm. She felt certain Brady was the one doing the talking, as the voice didn't sound like Terran's. The Red Cross would have found her a place to stay. You should have known better than to bring her home. Okay, Brady, I get it. I'm an idiot. But this guy has set three different bombs for her. I thought it was a good option, but I was wrong. Hassling me over my mistakes isn't helpful. Rye's voice was surprisingly calm. Terran should be here soon. We need to guard the place in shifts, then figure out what to do tomorrow. Okay, fine. I'll take the first watch, Brady offered. She felt herself smiling at his capitulation. Brady might be upset, but that didn't mean he'd leave his brother out in the cold. It was nice how the Finnegans supported each other, even when they weren't happy about the need to do so. The sound of a door opening reached her. Fill me in, Rye. Thanks for coming back, Terran, Rye said. He began describing the events that had transpired an hour earlier. Hearing the details all over again made her feel bad, so she rose from her spot on the stairs and returned to her room. The guys would take turns staying awake to stand guard for the remainder of the night. There was nothing more she had to offer. In fact, just the opposite. Her staying had put everyone here in danger. She crawled into bed and closed her eyes. At this point, all she could do was pray that God would protect the Finnegan family, even if that meant sacrificing herself. Rye took the early morning shift, sending Terran to bed at 4 o'clock a.m. Having his brothers here made him feel better, but that didn't mean he'd gotten much sleep. He rubbed his gritty eyes as he padded toward the coffee maker. He'd downed more coffee in the past 36 hours than he had in months. Probably not a good sign. As the pot brewed, he made rounds around the house, moving from one window on the first floor to the next. At each post, he took a long moment to make sure there were no suspicious vehicles or people hanging out nearby. There was nothing to find. The area around their house was clear. His brothers had found that reassuring. Rye didn't. He knew better than to assume the guy had given up. No, the bomber was out there somewhere, maybe even sitting a few blocks away with a pair of binoculars. He wouldn't put anything past this perp. Even more reason to find another motel to use as a potential trap. He poured a cup of coffee, then continued moving from window to window again as he sipped the strong brew. Last night, his brothers had agreed with the plan to set another decoy motel room to trap the bomber using Devin's phone and debit card to add credibility. But he didn't think that would be good enough. They needed more to catch this guy. 
It was risky, but he could ask a female police officer to sit in the motel for several hours. Brady's idea of wiring the motel room and placing hidden cameras both inside and outside the room was good, but there was still room for error. The guy might watch the place long enough to decide no one was inside, a logical assumption since the perp hadn't taken the bait at the American Lodge. The downside to having an officer there was that he'd need his boss's approval, and that was a bigger hurdle than finding an officer who looked enough like Devin who would be willing to take the assignment, on a Saturday no less. Movement from the second floor had him eyeing the stairs. He fully expected Ellie or Alana to be the first ones up, but Devin was the one who came down the stairs to join him. Good morning, he smiled politely, even though the wrath of his brothers over his decision to bring her here still stung. Help yourself to coffee. Thanks. Her expression was somber as she moved past him. You need to get me out of your house and to another motel as soon as possible. He scowled, following her into the kitchen. What are you talking about? This isn't right. I'm putting your entire family in danger. We need to make a big show of you moving me out of here to a new location. She filled her cup, then turned to face him. It would be better for everyone if I stay in the motel room alone to hopefully draw the bomber out of hiding. No way. Not happening. We're not using you as bait. He couldn't believe she was offering herself up this way. Why not? I'm the one he wants. She stared down at her coffee for a long moment before meeting his gaze. It will be better this way. I have no family that I'm close to. No real friends. No one will miss me when I'm gone. I would, he thought, but he held back the words. That's not the point. The only person sitting inside the motel room will be a trained cop, not a civilian. No. Her tone was sharp, and she quickly lowered her voice. I don't want anyone else to be in danger. Her offer was admirable, but there was no way on earth he would agree to such a dangerous plan. I think she has a point, Brady drawled from behind him. He spun around to glare at his brother. No way, Brady. Police ops are run by cops, and we don't use civilians as bait. Sure we do. We have civilians wear wires and go into danger all the time. His brother shrugged. And you would still lead the op. We'd set up the same safety measures we discussed last night. I agree, Devin piped up. This is the best way to catch this guy. Rye had to hold himself back from slugging Brady. He and his younger brothers hadn't lowered themselves to fistfights since their teenage years, but his anger with Brady was on a slow boil. Brady hadn't held back last night, which was his prerogative, yet pulling Devin into the plan as bait without running it past him wasn't right. Don't push me, Brady, he warned. I'm not in the mood. Hey, you made this mess. It's up to you to fix it. Brady filled a cup with coffee. The goal is to do that without putting innocent lives at risk, he shot back. We'll find a female officer to sit in the motel room. Ryland Finnegan, you have two options, Devin said loudly. You can set up a motel room for me to use, or I'll do it on my own without backup. I can use my phone, call a rideshare, and be out of your hair in ten minutes or less. Brady winced. Okay, let's not get hasty. No need to go off on your own. Rye glared at his brother, then stepped forward. Devin, I need your help. We'll work together to find a motel room, okay? Maybe identify a place you would go to if you couldn't get into your apartment building. He hesitated, then added, From there, you need to let us handle the arrangements. No, Rye. Two choices, remember? Either I stay in the motel room with backup or without. Those are your options. She brushed past him to head toward the stairs. Let me know what you decide. There was a long silence after Devin left the room. I hate to say it, but I think I like her, Brady announced. I give her credit for setting herself up to attract the bomber's attention. You're an idiot, Rye shot back. Now that you jumped in to agree with her plan, it'll be impossible to keep her out of it. Brady raised a brow. Sounds like you care about her. As much as I would anyone who has been targeted by a lunatic bomber. 
Rai refused to let his brother know how upset he was at the idea of Devin setting herself up as bait, that he'd allowed himself to become personally involved with her. And you know full well that most people who wear wires into dangerous situations are doing so because they're already involved in criminal activity. Devin has never broken the law. It was her father who set off those bombs in Chicago, not her. Although she had paid for a fake ID and SSN, he thought, but didn't say. Ah, I understand now. You brought her here because you like her. She's not just another victim to you. Brady shook his head. Bad news, bro. This won't end well. You need to keep your head screwed on straight. Rye gave up. There was no point in beating his brother over the head as much as he'd like to. Arguing wasn't getting them where they needed to be. How about you try using your power for good, Brady? As a Fed, you have more resources than I do. You must have connections with motels in the area. I do, his brother admitted. I'll need a computer. He and Brady spent the next hour settling on a motel room that wasn't too far from where Devin's apartment building was located. He went upstairs to approach Devin's room since they needed her debit card to secure the room. She held the debit card up. You can have it as long as I get to be the one staying in the room. He didn't like it, but he would agree for now. Fine. Great. She managed a sad smile. Thanks, Rye. This means a lot to me. He took the card, then returned downstairs. He didn't like lying to Devin. He told himself he'd set her up in the motel room as a last resort. It was possible his boss wouldn't agree to the plan, giving him the go-ahead to station a female cop in the room. Hold on, Brady took the card out of his fingers. I think we need to get the cameras installed before we officially put Devin's name on the room. If the guy has a flag on her card, he could set up nearby before we have the chance. Good point, he glanced at the clock. We'll hit the stores as soon as they open. I'm sure Devin won't mind if we hang on to her card a little while longer. Brady nodded. In the meantime, I can secure the room under my name without using a credit card. We can swap out for hers later. Getting the room was a start, but there was a lot of work that needed to be done. They needed super small cameras, ones that wouldn't be easily seen. Also, he needed to talk to his boss, something he wasn't looking forward to. He decided not to call him too early, figuring the more sleep the assistant chief had gotten, the better. By 7.30 in the morning, the rest of his siblings were up and about. Devin came back downstairs too, and after being formally introduced to Brady, she jumped in to help Alana make breakfast. They decided to make French toast on the large griddle. Rye remembered his mother cooking there to feed the small army that was their family. Devin manned the griddle like a pro. It occurred to him that one of her many jobs may have been as a restaurant cook, but it was more than being familiar with how to feed a lot of people. It was the way she and his sisters worked together, as if they'd always shared cooking and cleaning up duties. When he realized he was imagining Devin as part of the family, he pulled himself up short. Whoa, where had that come from? Brady was right. He'd allowed himself to get too emotionally involved in her situation. Best to remember this situation was temporary. The moment he had the bomber arrested and tossed in jail, Devin would be free to move on with her life. And his gut told him she wouldn't stick around in Milwaukee. She had no reason to stay. No roots holding her here. No one except for him. Nope. Uh-uh. He'd learned his lesson with Rachel. Besides, even if he was interested, Devin would want a family of her own. And he didn't. Been there, done that. Wasn't interested in starting over again. Rye firmly shoved those unnerving thoughts aside and concentrated on the more important task of setting up the trap. The noise in the kitchen made it impossible to concentrate, though, so he took the computer into the other room. Hey, shut it down for now, bro. We'll take care of everything once we finish breakfast. Taryn came toward him in the alcove that functioned as a study. Come join us. Yeah, okay. Closing the computer wasn't easy. He followed Taryn into the kitchen, watching in bemusement as Brady set the table. Thank you, Devin said. The second batch is just about ready. Grab more coffee if you want, then sit down to eat. Bossy, Brady teased. You sound like a female version of Rye. 
Devon turned to glance over her shoulder, locking her eyes on his. The attraction he'd been desperately trying to avoid shimmered in the air between them. He did his best to keep his gaze impassive, but it wasn't easy. Without a word, she turned back to flipping French toast. I had to be bossy, Rye said, breaking the silence. Alana had already gotten the syrup and powdered sugar out, so he grabbed the jug of orange juice and brought that to the table. It was the only way to keep everyone in line. Bossy? He was more like a drill sergeant, Alana complained. He scared every boyfriend Ellie and I dared to bring home. Who, me? Rye pretended to be wounded. I never did that on purpose. Yeah, right, Ellie said with a snort. Remember when Jason asked me to junior prom? You wore your cop uniform and cleaned your gun in the living room with your taser sitting on the table in plain view when he came to pick me up. He was so freaked out, he almost changed his mind about going. Rye grinned. Yeah, I thought he was going to bolt too. Idiot, Ellie muttered, shooting him a narrow glare. You do realize he never asked me out again after that. All the cop intimidation stuff was totally uncalled for. Rye shrugged. He could say he was sorry, but he wasn't. He figured that his job was to make sure his sisters didn't get into trouble, and the best way to accomplish that was to make sure each guy knew exactly what would happen if they so much as crossed the line. And it had worked for the most part. As a family, they'd had their ups and downs, but overall, he was proud of the accomplished young adults his siblings had become. Here you go. Devin set the large platter of French toast on the table. The only empty seat was next to him, so she took it. Hyper aware of her presence, he clasped his hands and bowed his head. As the oldest, his siblings always expected him to say grace, the way his dad did. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful food you've provided for us. We ask that you continue to bless us and keep us safe in your care. Amen. Amen, the rest echoed. As usual, he was the first one finished partially because he always ate at the speed of light and partially because he needed to get back to work. This new trap had to work. He wouldn't be able to live with himself if anything happened to his family. The stores didn't open until 9 o'clock, but he decided to use the time to check various items online to identify all the parts and pieces he'd need. The cameras were super small, and he already had several great ideas of where to hide them. When Taryn and Brady finished eating, they all headed out to pick up the supplies. When that was finished, he called Michaels. Now what? Michaels demanded. You do realize it's Saturday, don't you? Yeah, I know. Rye explained about the sedan and the fear of his family being in harm's way. After he outlined the plan, there was a long silence. He feared Michaels had hung up on him. But finally, the assistant chief said, You really think this new trap will work? I hope so. Rye couldn't lie to his boss. Considering how the driver of the sedan tried to run me over last night, it's reasonable that I would stash Miss Devin Thompson someplace else. I figure we'll leave here about two in the afternoon, only after the cameras and listening devices have been planted in the room. It's worth a shot. If we're really going to get this guy, it's better if Miss Thompson herself stays in the room, Michaels said. Last time, the perp didn't fall for your trap. As it is, he'll suspect you have eyes on the place. It's a long shot to think he'll take the bait this time. I disagree. We never put civilians in harm's way, Rye argued, his gut twisting with worry. A female police officer bundled in a coat would work just as well. No, we must assume the bomber knows Miss Thompson on a personal level. Otherwise, why would he keep coming after her? If there's any inkling the woman in the room isn't Miss Thompson, he'll never bite. This wasn't an argument he'd anticipated having with his boss, but it sounded like Michaels had his mind made up. Okay, fine. We'll use Devin, er, Miss Thompson. She offered to stay in the room anyway. Great. Then it's settled. Michaels sounded satisfied. Keep me updated on how things go. Make this work, Finnegan. We need to get this guy in soon, before another building blows up. I know. Thanks. After disconnecting from the call, Rye stared glumly out the window. The discussion with Michaels concerned him. He didn't want to put Devin at risk. Yet, it also seeded doubts in his mind about the overall viability of the plan. 
what if this guy was smart enough to avoid the trap? He made another call to a couple of team members. I need your help in getting a motel room wired for sound and set up hidden cameras. Oh, and I need someone to follow up on a guy named Terrence Shook. He works for the same bank that Devin uses. He's lower on the priority list, but needs to be investigated anyway. Sounds like fun, Joe said. How soon can we start with the cameras and bugs? He glanced at his watch. Right now. He gave Joe the list of items to pick up at the electronics store, along with the motel room. Call me when you're finished. I can't take the victim there until it's closer to check-in time. Roger that. Joe disconnected from the call. I'm glad to hear you're honoring our deal. He spun around to find Devin leaning against the wall. She'd moved so silently he hadn't heard her approach. Her wry statement made him realize she'd overheard him arguing with Michaels. It's dangerous, Devin. Even though we'll have eyes and ears inside the room, there's a lot that can happen before we can get inside to rescue you. I know, and I accept the danger. She pushed away from the wall. I want this guy caught more than anyone. I understand. But as he watched her turn away, Rye knew he'd have to change the plan. He'd need to figure out a way to sneak inside the motel room with her. Letting her sit inside the motel room to face the bomber alone was not an option. Chapter 11 Waiting as the hours ticked by until it was time to head to the motel was excruciating, and Devin knew this was the easy part. Being inside the motel, anticipating the moment the bomber showed up to kill her, would be much worse especially since she had no idea what to expect. Would the bomber find a way inside the motel room, or just set the bomb to blow once she was inside? The good news was how Rai's boss had insisted she be the one to draw the bomber out of hiding. She was the guy's target. He was also smart enough to not fall for a female cop who only bore a slight resemblance to Devin. The way he'd avoided the trap at the American Lodge proved that. Rai was going above and beyond to catch this guy. Seeing how the sedan had nearly struck Rai last night made her realize how far he'd gone out on a limb for her, and that he wouldn't hesitate to do it again if needed. As a captain for the tactical unit, Rai had often put himself and his team in harm's way to protect the public. That was his job, one he took very seriously. He wasn't treating her any differently. She was the one who'd slipped and allowed herself to become emotionally attached to Rai and to his family. The Finnegan's dynamic, especially their camaraderie, fascinated her. There was no doubt in her mind that every single one of them would walk through fire to rescue the others. She admired them all, especially Rai, for the way he'd held them together after losing their parents, more than she thought possible. But that was her cross to bear, not his. After lunch, she tried to get lost in the mystery she'd found on the bookshelf. The Finnegan brothers continued making rounds throughout the house checking the windows on a regular basis, which was a little distracting. The novel itself was good, but her own situation intruded on her thoughts, ruining her ability to enjoy the story. Plus, the way Rye was so focused on his computer work and the small study, she couldn't help wondering what, if anything, he'd found. Finally, she gave up. After setting the book aside, she crossed over to join Rye. Are you sure there's nothing I can do to help? I'm sure. Thanks. He gave her a quick glance, then turned his attention back to the computer. We'll head over to the motel in a couple of hours. A couple of hours? She tried not to groan. Sounds good. He sat back in the chair and rubbed his eyes. I know this hasn't been easy for you. I keep going back to your Uncle Charles and your cousin Lane. There is absolutely nothing on social media about either of them. My father didn't have much use for social media either she shrugged. A lot of people don't like putting their personal life out there for everyone to see and comment about. Personally, I value my privacy, even before my dad blew up those buildings. I completely understand. I don't see the point of social media myself. Rye smiled wearily. A lot of cops don't put their stuff out there, out of safety concerns. I just wish I had more insight into their daily lives. The Chicago PD is looking for them but so far they haven't found them. She frowned. The Chicago PD can't just arrest them because they're related to me and my father. No, but they can ask them questions. 
he tapped the computer screen. A few of my guys are following their credit cards to see if they're in Milwaukee, but so far, neither guy has used their plastic. Not everyone has plastic either, she reminded him. I don't remember much about my father's spending habits, but my mother preferred to pay in cash as she went, living by the golden rule of not spending what you don't have. Smart lady. Rye regarded her thoughtfully for a long moment. You've chosen to live the same way. Yes. Her situation was different in that she worked as a waitress slash bartender, which didn't always pay exceptionally well. Oh, Fridays and Saturdays were great, but the other nights of the week were only so-so. It was enough to support her basic needs, but nothing that would make her rich. And this week, she'd missed work on those highest-paying days. She suppressed a sigh. Maybe this was God's way of telling her to move on to a new place once the bomber was behind bars. To start over fresh, maybe even doing something different. She had an associate degree, she could go back to school, or look for a job doing something more than restaurant work. Funny how the times she'd attended church as a kid, had learned about God and faith, had easily returned now that she'd met Rye. It was also interesting that the Finnegan family always prayed before meals. At first, she'd thought Rye had pushed the practice as a way to honor his parents, but the way Brady and Taryn had participated in the prayer, along with Alana and Ellie, made it clear this was common practice for all of them, not just Rye. For a family who'd suffered so much loss, she was humbled by the way they'd kept their faith. Her mother hadn't done the same after the divorce. Then again, her father hadn't been a great role model either. She'd always suspected they'd only gotten married because of her, which brought her thoughts back to her family. You really think my uncle and cousin are involved? Like I said before, we need to at least talk to them. Hold on a minute. Rye leaned forward, his gaze fixated on the computer screen. We just got a tag off Charles Rowe's debit card. He looked up at her. He used the card at an ATM machine near the Illinois and Wisconsin border, on the Illinois side, but still interesting. She shivered. That doesn't mean much. My car blew up two days ago. If Charles planted the bomb, why would he bother to head back down to the state line? I'm not sure. Rye drummed his fingers on the desktop. We haven't found Lane at all, so it could be that Charles found out about the bombing here in Milwaukee and started driving up to find his son. Rye's theory made sense, although the fact that Lane had targeted her didn't follow the same logic. I have no idea why Lane would want to hurt me. I never met him. Are you absolutely sure about that? Rye manned the keyboard. We have driver's license photos of both Charles and Lane Rowe. He turned the laptop so she could see the screen. Do either of them look familiar? She stepped closer to see the images. Charles looked similar to her father, maybe a little taller and slender, but their faces shared the same narrow eyes, prominent nose, and cleft chin. As she moved her gaze to the next photo, she expected to see a stranger. Instead, she recognized him. That's Lane? I knew him as Eric Nash. We worked together very briefly at the same restaurant back in Detroit. I quit about two days after he started. Eric Nash, huh? Rye's voice held a note of excitement. Maybe he's operating under an alias too, like you. It hurt to be compared to her cousin, but she couldn't deny the fact that he was right. She turned away and sank back onto the living room sofa. Eric Nash was Lane Rowe. How creepy to realize she'd been working alongside her cousin for a couple of days without knowing their family connection. He'd been hired on just as her boss's advances had gotten worse. When her boss had pinned her against the bar trying to kiss her, she'd walked out and never returned. And she hadn't seen Eric again either. But now that she knew Eric and Lane were one and the same... She had to admit that her cousin could very well be the bomber. Maybe she'd thrown him off by leaving Detroit so abruptly to start over someplace new. If she'd have stayed, would he have planted the bombs in Detroit? Staggering to realize that she probably wouldn't be sitting here in the Finnegan homestead if Eric slash Lane hadn't been forced to follow her to Milwaukee. More likely, she'd already be dead. Devin, are you okay? It took a moment to realize Rye had dropped beside her. 
I just can't believe it, she murmured. Eric is Lane, my cousin. She forced herself to take a deep breath, letting it out slowly. He must be the bomber, Rye. It's the only thing that makes sense. I think that's a strong possibility too, but try not to worry. I sent a message to my team, instructing them to dig for intel on Eric Nash, with a similar date of birth as your cousin Lane. He draped his arm across her shoulders. This is good news, Devin. If he's the bomber, we'll find him. She forced a nod. He could be the man in the ski mask outside the American Lodge Motel. I mean, same approximate height and weight. Do you remember Eric Nash having good computer skills? Rye asked. We've leaned toward a bank or law enforcement connection, but a good hacker can probably dig up the same information on cell phone carriers, etc. She shook her head. We only worked a few shifts together before I left. She desperately wanted to lean into Rye's embrace, soaking in his strength. Knowing her cousin had found her in Detroit, changed his name, and had gotten a job at the same restaurant was inconceivable. She straightened and turned to face Rye. I left Detroit because the restaurant manager got drunk and pushed me up against the bar, trying to kiss me. But even before that, I found a couple of weird notes and flowers left on my car. Eric hadn't started work yet, so I never considered him a suspect. I thought it was an older guy who came to eat every Friday, insisting to be seated at my table, no matter how long the wait. He seemed harmless at the time, but... When I got the flowers and notes and my boss tried to kiss me, I figured it was time to move on. Now you think they may have been left by Lane? Rye asked. I hope you reported that bar manager to the police for sexual assault. No point in doing that, but I think Lane must have been involved in the notes and flowers. A chill snaked down her spine. And that wasn't my first move. How long has Lane a.k.a. Eric, been following me. I don't know, but we'll find him. Rye flashed a reassuring gaze. This is a good lead, Devin. Although, I would like to know more about the older guy who latched onto you back in Detroit. She waved a hand. He's harmless. His name is Rob Jones, and I'd estimate he's in his late 40s or early 50s. I can't imagine he followed me to Milwaukee for the sole purpose of setting bombs. Rob Jones is a common name. Rye said with a sigh. I have to admit, that's not going to help much. He scowled. What's the manager's name? The one who attacked you? Larry Eastman? But he doesn't matter. To her mind, both Larry and Rob Jones were harmless, but her cousin Lane? His following her to Detroit was disturbing on so many levels. Not just following, she realized grimly, but stalking and setting bombs to kill her. Rye kicked himself for not showing Devin the pictures of her uncle and cousin sooner. Normally, he wasn't this disorganized, but it was his own fault. Having Devin stay there at the house had been his first mistake, followed closely by the bigger mistake of getting too close and allowing her to mess with his head. The danger last night had thrown him off course, and to be fair, his team hadn't sent him the driver's license photos until an hour ago. Still, there was no excuse for dropping the ball. Devin was right, though. Eric Nash, a.k.a. Lane Rowe, must be the bomber. He'd hidden his blood relationship to her on purpose. If he'd discovered she'd recognized this guy sooner, they could have spent the morning searching for Nash. Now they only had an hour or two at the most before they needed to be situated in the motel room. He was glad to have an ID on the guy, but he also doubted Lane Rowe was still using the name Eric Nash. Normally, it wouldn't be easy to pick up a new fake ID, at least, not without a lot of money. Yet nothing had proven to be too difficult for this guy. He'd set three bombs so far. It bothered him to know the guy may have tried to set another device here, at the Finnegan homestead. Excuse me, Devin murmured, rising to her feet. She quickly headed upstairs to her room. No, not her room, the guest room, he silently corrected. Devin didn't live here. She was a guest who would be moving into a motel for the night. And if the bomber didn't show, he grimaced, rose to his feet, and returned to the computer. He had no idea what the new plan would be if the trap they set tonight didn't work. Blowing out a breath, he went back to work. At this point, 
All he could do was take one step at a time. Hey, when do you plan to leave? Brady asked. He glanced up at his brother. Can't check in until 3 p.m., and I figure we should wait a little while after that so it's not so suspicious. Why? I called Quinn, but he's not able to join us. Taryn and I both thought it would be good to keep an eye on this place, even after Devin is gone. I agree, he said with a nod. Thanks. Brady shrugged. Alana spoke to Kylie, too. She's not happy to be left out and wants to back you up at the motel. There's no need for the entire family to be involved, he protested. Kylie worked as a sheriff's deputy, currently assigned to the Milwaukee County Courthouse. Lesson learned, bro. If you bring home trouble, we're all going to be involved, and Kylie believes you left her out because she's a woman. I work with female cops all the time. But even as he said the words, he realized there was truth to what Brady was saying. He'd instinctively gone to his cop brothers for support without considering Kylie's skills and expertise. I'll apologize to her. Leaving her out wasn't intentional. Yeah, right, Brady snorted. Wish I could be here to watch the fireworks, but I'm heading out to find a secure location near the treetop motel to keep an eye on things before you and Devin get there. Fireworks was putting it mildly. Kylie had red hair and a quick temper to match, but he nodded. Thanks, Brady. His brother nodded, then left. Before Rye could get back to work, he heard Kylie's voice in the kitchen. As the oldest sister of the group, she and Rye had butted heads over the years. It took him a full 15 minutes to calm her down, and even then, he'd been forced to agree that she could help back him up. Next time, call me before the others. She stabbed him in the chest with her index finger. And I want to meet this woman. We're all putting our lives on the line to protect. Easy, Kylie. We put our lives on the line to protect the public every single day. He frowned. This is no different. His sister scoffed. Sing another tune, Rye. I'm not buying it. He was short on temper himself. Whatever. I couldn't care less. Just remember the crux of the situation is that any explosive device has the potential to harm people. It's not just about property damage. I'm ready to leave any time, Devin said from the doorway. We have another hour or so yet. He quickly introduced Devin to his sister Kylie. I've heard all about you from Alana, Kylie said. Yes, well, your family has been incredibly kind. Devin held his sister's gaze. And I appreciate everything Ellie, Alana, and Rye have done for me. Kylie nodded. Glad to hear it. Rye barely refrained from rolling his eyes. He could tell his sister was warning Devin off, and there was no reason for it. Brady is down at the motel, searching the area for a good surveillance point. You may want to do the same. We can leave Taryn here with Ellie and Alana. Works for me. Kylie was dressed casually, but she was wearing her weapon in a shoulder harness. Brady mentioned the treetop motel? That's the one. They rent rooms by the week, which works in our favor. I want it to appear that Devin is going to live there for a while. Sounds good. I'll talk to Brady on the way. See you later, Rye. Devin. She nodded, then left as quickly as she'd arrived. I still have how many siblings yet to meet? Devin asked. Aiden, who you missed the other morning, Colin, and Quinn. He shrugged. Sorry to bombard you all at once. It's fine, although your sisters are very protective of you. She offered a lopsided smile. They really hate your former fiancé. With good reason, but he didn't bother to elaborate. Don't worry about them. They should be worried about their own lives. Besides, today our focus is protecting you. Try to relax for a while. We'll head down to the treetop about 3.15. I plan to make it look as if we're sneaking you out of here. Well, we kinda are, right? A brief smile creased her features. She turned away, then paused, glancing back at him. Thanks again, Rye, for everything. I haven't done anything yet, he said wryly. We still have a long day and night ahead of us. She nodded, her expression serious. I still want you to know how much I appreciate what you've done for me. He frowned. Did you happen to overhear my siblings squawking about all of this? I told you not to worry about them. Unfortunately, nosy brothers and sisters are part of being in a large family. I'm used to it, but I can appreciate how it must seem invasive to you. Not at all. 
I think it's great the way your family looks after each other. Her brow furrowed. Different from the way my cousin has decided to come after me. He couldn't imagine a family that turned on each other the way it appeared that Devon's had. I'm sorry about that, but we should also keep an open mind. She turned away without saying anything more. His phone rang. Seeing Joe's name on the screen, he quickly answered. Is the room set? Yep, we have eyes and ears on the corner room, and per your instructions, I left an earpiece and microphone inside. The place is set like a super small efficiency apartment for longer term guests, complete with a microwave on top of a mini fridge. What about the windows? On the website, it looked as if the corner room had an extra window, but he needed to be sure. Yep, one overlooking the front parking area near the main doorway, and one along the side of the building. Perfect. Thanks for doing that. Stay put for a minute. I'll call my brother Brady and my sister Kylie and ask them to meet up with you. They'll need the other earpieces and radios. Lowering his phone, he sent a text to his siblings. After a moment, Brady answered. Looks like they're across the street at a coffee shop. Maybe you could pop over to meet up with them. Consider it done, Joe assured him. We think the perp is Devin's cousin, Lane Rowe, a.k.a. Eric Nash. He quickly explained about how Devin recognized the driver's license photo as her co-worker in Detroit. The problem is that he's probably operating under another alias by now. And I don't like that the uncle used his plastic near the state border either. It's possible they're working together on this. True, but it's a good break in the case, Cap. We'll double down on finding the uncle, too. I'm sure good old Charles will lead us to Lane. Great. Rye had the best team in the city, but he still cautioned himself not to get his hopes up too high. Thanks. I'll call you the minute we find something, Joe continued. And if you need more backup at the treetop, let me know. Will do. He disconnected from the line and debated going back to cross-referencing the list of victims with known law enforcement or bank connections. It seemed a waste of time with the new information on Devin's cousin. What is wrong with you? Ellie planted herself in the doorway, her hands on her slim hips. You can't use Devin as bait. These were the days that drove him crazy. First, Brady insisting Devin be in the motel room, and now Ellie demanding the exact opposite. He shut down the computer and packed it away. It was my boss's idea, not mine. Don't you trust Kylie and Brady to keep her safe? And you too, I hope, she responded. Yes, I trust you and the others, but I don't have to like the element of danger. He caught Ellie in a quick, one-armed hug. I don't like it either, but I'm confident we're going to get this guy, and that's the best way to ensure Devin's safety. Ellie hugged him tight. Make sure you all come back in one piece, Rye, she said in a voice muffled against his shirt. Every last one of you. That's the plan. He kissed the top of her head, then pulled away. He couldn't promise something he had no control over. Ellie knew his job was dangerous, but it wasn't danger that had taken their parents. It was a car crash. It wasn't up to them to wonder why God had called their parents home so soon. I need to shower and change. Devin was ready to go at exactly 3.15. He made a point of moving the front living room curtains and peering outside for a long moment before heading out to the garage. Devin followed close on his heels. Once she was settled in the passenger seat, he told her to scrunch down but to inch her head up just a few inches as they drove through the neighborhood. Got it, she did as he asked. Rye kept a keen eye out for a tail and purposefully took a winding route to get to the motel that was only seven blocks from Devin's apartment building. The building looked a little worse for wear compared to the website photos, but Devin didn't seem to care. He ushered her inside the small lobby. The room had been held under Brady's credit card, but now Devin handed her debit card over to put the room in her name. A moment later, she had signed off on the transaction and had the key to room 8 in her hand. Rye poked his head out the lobby door, looked around, then quickly walked Devin to the room. She didn't look nervous as she set the small bag Ellie had loaned her filled with one change of clothes and toiletries. Home sweet home she murmured. Hopefully not for long. Rye quickly moved through the room, identifying the locations of the listening devices and miniature cameras. When Devin carried her toiletries into the bathroom, he unlocked the window, removed the screen, 
and tucked it behind the TV. Then he closed the window. He picked up the earpiece and the tiny microphone. The stage was set. He just needed the bad actor to show up on cue. I know you need to leave, Devin said, stepping back into the main room. Yeah. On impulse, he pulled her in for a quick hug. Don't be afraid, okay? I'm not. She lifted her chin bravely. I hope this draws Lane out of hiding. Me too. He left the room, glancing around as he went back to his car. He needed to find a place to stash the vehicle before he could sneak back in. He imagined Brady, Kylie, and the others watching him as he drove away. After parking the SUV in a paid lot, he moved through the side streets until he was able to approach the treetop from the back. He felt certain Brady or Kylie would give him an earful once they saw him, but he didn't care. He slipped up alongside Devin's motel room, lifted the unlocked window, and quickly crawled inside. Once he was set, he locked it again. What on earth are you doing? Devin asked in alarm. Is something wrong? I'm not leaving you here alone. He winced as his brother and sister complained loudly in his ear at the same time. Save it he said curtly into his microphone. I'll hide in the bathroom to keep out of sight, especially as the sun goes down. I need the both of you to do your jobs, understand? You should have warned us, Brady insisted. He turned toward Devin just as she launched herself into his arms. He cradled her close, knowing that this connection between them was exactly why he'd been unable to walk away, leaving her to face the threat alone. Family always stuck with family, and despite his best efforts to keep Devin at arm's length, he cared for her way more than he should. Chapter 12 Rye was staying. Burying her face in his chest, Devin closed her eyes in relief. She hadn't wanted to admit how scared she was to be in the motel room alone waiting for her cousin to creep in with a bomb intending to kill her. Yes, she'd insisted on being the one to draw him out, but that hadn't lessened her fear. Hey, it's okay, Rye murmured. My siblings will let us know the minute they see anything suspicious. She nodded but didn't say anything because she knew those same siblings were listening in. Then it dawned on her that they had video too. Flushing with embarrassment, she pulled away from Rye's embrace and glanced around as if they'd done more than hug. You, uh, mentioned you were planning to hide in the bathroom? She pulled her scattered thoughts together with an effort. Is that really necessary? Rye drew her to the back corner of the room. He spoke in a hushed tone. Anyone watching from outside needs to believe you're in here alone. Two dark silhouettes, one obviously a man, will ruin the plan. I'll hide out until we hear the bomber is close by. Okay. You're right. She ran a hand through her hair and let out a long breath. That should work. But if Brady and Kylie are both watching outside, I'm sure staying in the room with me is overkill. Rye shrugged. Doesn't matter. I'm not leaving. He appeared to be listening for a moment to either Brady or Kylie or both. Then he said, Copy that. Have they noticed something suspicious? She didn't like being left out of the communication loop. Not that she was complaining. Better to have Rye's strong and reassuring presence than an earpiece. No, I'd let you know if they had. He didn't quite meet her gaze, and she understood his siblings were not happy with the change in plan. Humbling to realize he hadn't let his family's strong opinions stop him from supporting her. Thanks again, she murmured, crossing her arms over her chest to keep from reaching for him. I pray this works and Lane shows up soon. We all hope the same thing, Rye agreed. He raked one last gaze around the small room, then stepped into the bathroom, leaving the door open. If you need to use the facilities, I'll give you privacy for that. In the meantime, I'll let you know if Brady or Kylie see anyone lurking near the motel. She nodded and he disappeared into the bathroom. Crossing to the TV, she used the remote to power it on. A moment later, Rye poked his head through the open doorway. Mute the sound, Devin. Remembering the microphones, she found and pressed the mute button. She didn't care if she couldn't hear the TV show. It was simply a prop in this strange play she happened to be starring in. 
The main window curtains were open a few inches, not too much and not to the point where no one could see inside. They wanted her cousin to see her sitting inside alone so he'd make his move. Propped on the bed, she stared blankly at the television. Having Rye close by was wonderful, but how long would they be forced to sit and wait? The cameras outside the American Lodge hadn't picked up the ski-masked man until midnight. The clock across the room blinked from 3.59 to 4 o'clock. She sighed. Midnight was hours away. She imagined Ellie and Alana preparing dinner for the two of them and Taryn, or maybe they'd settle for leftovers. Her stomach was a mass of nerves, stealing her appetite, but that didn't prevent a flash of guilt, knowing Rye, Brady, and Kylie were missing out on dinner too. Considering they worked in law enforcement, she knew it wasn't the first time they'd work through dinner, or the last. Still, she hated putting the Finnegan family in danger, especially when she didn't even know why her cousin wanted her dead. Thinking back to the Hazen House restaurant she and Eric had worked in back in Detroit, she re-examined her brief interactions with him. She'd only worked two shifts with him before she'd left. To be honest, she couldn't remember what, if anything, they'd said to each other. He hadn't seemed particularly interested in her at the time. That was only nine months ago. How and why had he tracked her down to Detroit? Why hadn't he made his move earlier? Had he used the three days to get closer to her? Had he set up a bomb to kill her that she hadn't even known about? Or maybe his plan changed after she'd left Detroit, moving to Milwaukee. Still, it all came back to why. She'd attended her father's trial had been called as a witness, but in the big scheme of things, the little she'd been able to testify to about her father hadn't been a big part of the case. She'd only reinforced his anti-government rhetoric, nothing more. Had her cousin been in the courtroom that day? At the time, she'd assumed most of the people sitting in the galley were victims of her father's crimes. She hadn't made eye contact with anyone partially from lingering guilt for being related to the man who'd stolen so much from them but even more so because of the never-ending media circus. The media had still managed to get enough video footage and pictures of her to flash on the television, despite her efforts to avoid them. If her cousin hadn't been in the courtroom that day, he'd likely watched the news coverage of the trial. Was he a sympathizer with her father? Shared and participated with the anti-government rhetoric he'd spewed. After an hour of being tortured by her thoughts, she stood and wandered around the room, pausing to glance out the window, the way she would if she were alone here and worried about being found. Rye had warned her this would be a long day, but she hadn't realized how long until she'd glanced at the clock ten times in seven minutes. Enough. She pulled the book from the small carry-on Ellie had loaned her and settled down to read. If you're going to read, you need to shut the TV off, Rye said from the bathroom. Okay, being watched was downright creepy. He was right to point out inconsistencies in her act of being there alone, so she reached for the remote and powered the TV off. Better? She called back, still staring down at her book. Yes, Rye said. What if he doesn't show? Having Rye in the room wasn't enough. She wanted, needed to be able to connect with him even if that meant sitting in two different areas of the room, talking through an open doorway. We could sit here all night for nothing. He'll show. Rye's tone was underscored in confidence. Besides, we have cops out searching for your uncle, too. Something will break sooner or later. It was the later part that concerned her. Nothing from Brady and Kylie? No, all is quiet out there. She sighed. I can't imagine doing stakeouts like this on a regular basis. Routine police work can be tedious, Rye agreed. That's one of the reasons I enjoy being in charge of the tactical unit. Natural for you to be the boss, she teased. Rye didn't respond. Knowing that Brady and Kylie were listening in, she dropped the subject. The hours dragged by slowly. At seven o'clock, she shut off the light, then asked Rye to step out of the bathroom for a few minutes. When she finished, she stretched out on the bed, still dressed except for her shoes. She pulled the blanket up and stared blindly up at the ceiling. She must have fallen asleep because two loud pops had her bolting upright in bed. Rye? She called softly. 
Stay where you are. Rai's voice was a whisper. Brady is investigating the source of gunfire. Gunfire? Her pulse spiked. Pressing her palm to her chest, she willed her heartbeat to slow down. Her cousin set bombs. He wouldn't come after her with a gun. Would he? She propped herself up against the headboard, listening intently, but she only heard silence. After what seemed like an eternity, Rai said, The local cops have responded to the gunfire. It's a few blocks away from here. Brady decided against breaking his cover to investigate. He called for backup instead. Okay. She took several deep breaths to calm herself, even as the realization sank deep. You think my cousin fired the rounds as a diversion? There was a long pause. It's possible, Rye admitted, although you know as well as I do that this isn't exactly a low crime area. We'll learn more once the police secure the scene. I should apologize for falling asleep, she whispered. I feel terrible. I'm sure you're not remotely comfortable in there. I've been in worse situations, Rye said dryly. Don't worry about me or my siblings. We're used to this. She nodded, even though she knew Rye couldn't see her. Brady and Kylie could through the cameras. She whispered, thanks, to include them as well. Red and blue lights passed her window. She jumped up and pushed the curtain aside to peer out, but the squad cars were already out of sight. She scanned the area outside for a moment, wondering where Brady and Kylie were sitting, then turned away to crawl back into bed. It was comforting to know that if her cousin had created a diversion, his ruse had failed. No surprise to learn Brady and Kylie hadn't broken their cover. She smiled in the darkness. Her cousin didn't stand a chance against the Finnegans. She had no doubt that the three of them would take care of her idiot cousin without breaking a sweat. Still... She silently prayed that God would keep Rye, Brady, and Kylie safe, and for this nightmare to end soon. Rye heard Brady calling 911 to report the gunfire as an anonymous source. He understood why his brother hadn't given his name. If the beat cops knew an FBI agent was on scene, they'd assume the gunfire was related to a federal investigation. Nothing could be further from the truth. Kylie was the one who'd cautioned them about the need to stay put. She was stationed behind the motel, with Brady taking the front. Rye texted Joe to find out more about the reports of gunfire. Joe promised to look into it. Ten long minutes later, Joe sent a text response. Per Joe, there is one dead and one wounded on scene. Rye read the text out loud for his siblings. Reports of an argument prior to the gunfire indicate this was a personal altercation between the two perps, not likely to have been a diversion set up by the bomber. Roger that, Brady responded. Got it, Kylie echoed. One dead and one wounded, Devin echoed. Yeah, nothing for you to worry about. Try to get some sleep, he added. We still have an hour before midnight. I'll do my best. Good. He stood and paced, or rather, attempted to, considering the minuscule bathroom. Sitting on the hard commode was not comfortable, and there wasn't enough room to stretch out on the cold tile floor. Two steps, turn, two steps, turn. He felt like an idiot making the small circles, but moving was better than sitting when it came to fighting off exhaustion. Earlier, while sitting in the dark and listening to Devin's deep breaths, He'd found his eyes drifting closed, too. He needed to stay sharp. If Lane Rowe was able to trace Devin's debit card or phone, Rye was certain he'd make his move tonight, especially if he believed Devin was sitting inside the room alone. He sent another text to Joe, asking for an update about Charles Rowe. Unfortunately, Joe didn't have good news. Devin's uncle hadn't been picked up yet, and the video at the gas station where he'd used his debit card hadn't been working. In short, they didn't have any proof that Charles Rowe was the one who'd used the debit card. The transaction could have been done by Lane. Being in the bathroom put him at a disadvantage. He would rather have been in the room keeping watch through one of the windows. It wasn't that he didn't trust Brady or Kylie. He had no doubt they'd hold up their end of the bargain. He'd reassured Devin that he and his siblings were accustomed to stakeouts. But he'd never been in a situation quite like this. For one thing, he was hungry 
and snacks were normally a part of a stakeout. But the real issue was that his nerves were stretched to the breaking point because Devin and his siblings were in danger. Why it was easier for him to send his team into dangerous situations, he had no clue. He cared about his teammates, they were like family to him. But they'd also worked together for years, and he knew the strengths and weaknesses of every member. Yeah, tonight's op was an unusual situation, in more ways than one. He grew impatient as midnight ticked by without any sign of Roe. If Lane had used his father's debit card, he had plenty of time to get to this location by now. He resisted the urge to ask his siblings for an update, knowing they'd have given him one if there was something to talk about. No news was good news, or bad news if the interminable silence indicated their target wasn't going to take the bait. Although, why Roe would stop now, he couldn't imagine. Not after bombing Devin's car, setting another device in her apartment, then blowing up her mailbox. No, this guy wouldn't stop. Not until he'd killed her. The motive behind all of this was still murky. He'd questioned Devin about why anyone in her family would have a grudge against her, but she had seemed clueless. At first, he'd been suspicious, but now he believed she was in the dark as much as he was. Simple revenge? Maybe. Yet, even most extremist groups were about eliminating those who may be a threat to their freedom, not a regular citizen like Devin. Killing her wouldn't further their cause or change their situation. A personal grudge seemed unlikely too. Devin hadn't known about her cousin, had never met him until he'd gotten a job in the Detroit restaurant where she worked. But maybe her father had bad-mouthed Devin to his brother and nephew. Brady's voice in his ear startled him. A male subject, appearing to be intoxicated, is stumbling toward the treetop motel. The facial features don't match Rose Sr. or Jr., so he could just be another civilian, but stay alert. Roger that, he whispered. All clear back here, Kylie added. Brady, let me know if you need me to change my position to get a closer look. I assume he's wearing a coat. He could have a weapon hidden under there. Roger that. Right now, he's leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette, Brady said. Rye kept his voice low as he spoke into the microphone. It could be our guy is using the cover of being homeless to case the joint. Wow, Rye, I hadn't thought of that, Brady drawled, a bite in his tone. Why do you think I pointed him out in the first place? Trust me, I'm watching him closely. Rye stifled a sigh. Sometimes his siblings were a pain in the behind. Cut me some slack. It's not easy sitting in the dark waiting for a signal. You have no one to blame but yourself, Kylie said. You shouldn't be in there, Rye. I don't know what you were thinking. Devin's not a cop, remember? He fought to keep his voice quiet enough not to wake her. We wouldn't leave Ellie or Alana alone. There was a long moment of silence. He imagined his siblings were making a big deal of his comparing Devin, a woman he'd only met two days ago, to a member of their family. Yeah, well, too bad. He didn't care. They could think whatever they wanted. He didn't regret his decision to stick close to Devin. Five minutes passed before Brady gave another update. Unsub is moving down the street, away from the motel. Unsub was another way of saying unknown subject. The feds loved using acronyms for everything. Keep eyes on him, Kylie murmured. He could be a decoy. You think it's possible there are two perps? That uncle and cousin are working together? Rye asked. Nothing has been ruled out, Brady said. Homeless guy just staggered across the street in my direction. I don't think he's seen me, but it's not going to be easy to keep him in view without someone out there to tail him. Rye couldn't volunteer to do it himself, but he could call for backup. You want a couple of my guys to join the fun? There was a long pause as Brady considered his offer. Negative, we'll hold the course for now. If I see him again, we'll know for sure he's our guy. Describe him to me, Kylie said. He might make his way around the back. Roughly five feet ten inches tall, scruffy beard, hair covered by a knit cap, and he's wearing an oversized green army jacket over dirty jeans, along with scuffed and worn construction-type boots on his feet. Rye was impressed with his brother's eye for detail, 
The purpose of footwear was important, as a lot of people who wanted to blend in with the homeless didn't remember to include ratty or holy boots. Roger, Kylie replied. I'll let you know if I see him. The silence lengthened as the waiting continued. Rice stood and moved toward the doorway, listening to Devin's even breathing. He found himself smiling wryly, glad one of them was getting some well-deserved rest. If Roe didn't show, they'd have no choice but to continue the stakeout for a second night, and that would mean bringing in reinforcements to keep watch throughout the daytime hours. Devin would be frustrated to be stuck here another day. As the hour moved past one in the morning, closer to two, he found himself turning to prayer. Please, Lord Jesus, help us to find this man before he hurts anyone else. Amen. He took several deep breaths, telling himself the homeless guy wasn't a threat and Roe would show up any minute. Two o'clock came, then 2.15. Rye? Devin's voice came from the bedroom. Something wrong? he asked in a hushed tone. I need to use the bathroom. She sounded apologetic, as if she was inconveniencing him rather than the other way around. Of course, that's fine. He edged through the doorway, standing off to the side as she padded over. There was enough ambient streetlight coming in through the curtain to illuminate the way. She paused in the doorway. No sign of him yet? Afraid not. He didn't mention the homeless guy. There was no reason to worry her. I'm glad you were able to sleep. Some, she admitted, then slipped into the bathroom, closing the door behind her. He waited in the back corner of the room for her to finish. She opened the door and stood near the open doorway. Rye, what happens if he doesn't show? Maybe we're wrong about his being able to track my phone and debit card. We know he tracked you to the American Lodge and to my home, Rye reminded her. He may be suspicious of a trap, though, so he may wait another 24 hours to make sure you're here before striking out. Another night of this? She sounded appalled. He was about to reassure her when Brady's voice came through his earpiece. There's a man dressed head to toe in black, lurking in the shadows. I believe he's armed. Find cover. Rye grabbed Devin and hauled her into the bathroom, pulling the door shut behind him. Glass shattered, followed by a poofing sound. What in the world? Rye tried to figure out what was going on when he heard Brady's voice. Firebomb! Get out of there, Rye! Rye? What's going on? Devin sounded shell-shocked, but there was no time to explain. He wrenched the bathroom door open. The fire spread across the bed, flames licking up toward the curtains hanging on both sides of the window. Let's go! He wrenched the second window open, pulled out the screen, and pushed Devon through the opening. Hurry! Move! Devon threw her leg over the windowsill, then ducked through. Rye quickly followed as he heard Kylie and Brady calling for backup. Seconds later, the fire raged out of control. If Devon hadn't gotten up to use the bathroom, she'd be dead. Chapter 13 Devin stumbled as Rye pulled her toward a building across the street from the motel. There was no sign of his brother Brady, though. Had he gone after the perp? If so, she prayed he'd catch him. Her entire body was shaking so badly she could barely speak. What happened? Brady sent the alarm just as the guy shot some sort of firebomb through the window. Rye glanced around. I hope he has him in custody. Kylie joined them her expression full of concern. Are you both okay? No injuries? We're fine, Rye said curtly, but that was way too close for comfort. Tell me about it, Kylie agreed. A few minutes later, Brady returned, clearly out of breath. Sorry, Rye, I lost him when he jumped into a jeep parked five blocks away. A jeep, not a sedan? Rye asked. Brady nodded. Yep, are you sure this guy wasn't the same perp you saw earlier? Rye scowled. He could have cased the joint, then came back wearing different gear and armed with a gun. How can I be sure? Brady sounded testy. It's dark. They could be one and the same. The weapon wasn't your average rifle either. It was some sort of mini rocket launcher. 
The sound the gun made was different from a rifle, too. Brady stared at the fire raging inside the motel room. Obviously, it was armed with something that would explode on impact. I hope it was a one-and-done sort of thing. He could come back to try again. Huddled beside Rye, she tried not to imagine what would have happened if she'd still been sleeping in the bed when the device had landed. Another shudder hit hard, causing Rye to pull her close against him. You're safe, Devin, he murmured. For how long? She didn't voice the thought. I guess the trap worked. Not in the way we'd planned. Rye's tone rose in frustration. Our goal was to catch this guy, not give him yet another opportunity to attempt to kill you. I don't think he made me, Brady said, his voice hesitant. He didn't look in my direction at all. Kylie nodded. I don't think I was made either. Whether he did or didn't see you posted nearby doesn't matter, Rye said wearily. Based on his actions at the American Lodge, he must have suspected this was another trap, or he wouldn't have taken the hands-off approach of sending in a firebomb. Watching the fire, it didn't seem hands-off to her. She couldn't stop thinking about how close she'd come to burning to death. Why did her cousin hate her so much? Good thing you were able to get her out of there. Brady clapped Rye on the shoulder. But I feel like I let you down, bro. Me too, Kylie added. You both did great, Rye said. I'm the one who underestimated this guy. I should never have assumed he'd stick with planting bombs. Hey, after finding the three bombs he'd planted, it was reasonable to believe that the bombs were his M.O., Brady pointed out. Most of these bombers are not only making a statement, they like to watch the big boom. Colin may have some insight into this guy's mindset, Kylie said. As a firefighter, he's dealt with plenty of arsonists. Devin's thoughts whirled as she listened to the discussion. She wanted to ask more about the guy Brady had seen, but the loud, wailing sirens put an end to the conversation. She balled her fingers into fists to stop them from shaking. Two large fire trucks roared up to the front of the motel, followed by several police cars and an ambulance. It was difficult to tear her gaze from the ambulance, knowing how close she'd come to being hauled away as a burn victim. A dead one. Within seconds, the small motel was flooded with first responders. Rye kept her close by his side, despite the hailstorm of activity. As two uniformed officers came toward them, Rye said, I better call my boss. We're all going to get our butts chewed out over this, Brady said. True that. Kylie agreed. Rye released her and stepped forward to meet them. I'm MPD Captain Ryland Finnegan, and I can fill you in on what happened here tonight, or rather this morning. We'll need to bring in Assistant Chief Michaels, too. He's aware of this. How does Michaels know the motel is on fire? One officer challenged. Not that part, but this was a trap we set for the bomber, Rye corrected. The officers glanced at each other. Fill us in. Devin didn't want to hear the entire story again. Her head ached and her stomach churned. Never had she imagined the night would turn out like this, with firefighters battling the blaze in her motel room and cops questioning them. It was enough to make her wonder if Rye and his family would have been better off without her. She lifted her gaze upward, wondering why God had put her in this situation. No, that was the wrong way to think about what had happened here tonight. Her cousin had put her in this situation. He was the one who wanted her dead. It was only by God's grace in watching over her that she was alive and unharmed. How else could she explain the need to use the bathroom in time to avoid being burned? And having a second window to escape from had helped them get away unscathed. Yet, despite her relief at avoiding the fire, wave after wave of dejection washed over her. They were no closer to catching her cousin than they were yesterday or the day before, especially if he was using another alias. Between the smoke billowing around them and her depression, tears pricked at her eyes. She turned away to swipe at her face. The last thing she wanted was to look weak in front of Kylie and Brady. All three Finnegans were immersed in conversations with first responders. Brady's comment about having a lot of explaining to do bothered her. She didn't want any of them to get into trouble. 
she pulled herself together with an effort. Taking deep breaths helped, but no matter what she tried, she couldn't stop shaking. Miss Thompson? A firefighter came up behind her. His face was blackened by soot. I need to talk to you. Of course. She blinked away her tears, sniffled and stepped closer. He took her arm and pulled her away from the others. The force of his action sent alarm bells jangling in the back of her mind. Then his fingers tightened painfully around her elbow, digging into the skin beneath her jacket. Don't say a word, Jenny, or I'll detonate the bomb I've hidden nearby. Jenny? Ice congealed in her blood. Her father was the only one who'd used the nickname. Her mother had insisted she be Jennifer. Peering through the darkness, she realized the bomber wasn't her cousin. It was her Uncle Charles. She stumbled and would have fallen if he hadn't held her so tightly. Had her uncle really set a bomb that might kill Rye and his siblings, along with the firefighters and police officers on scene? It didn't seem likely, yet she didn't dare call his bluff, especially considering how he'd firebombed her motel room, escaped Brady's pursuit, only to turn around and return dressed as a firefighter to grab her. How had he done all this without getting caught? She'd believed Rye's detailed plan in setting the motel room trap to be comprehensive, but somehow her uncle had done a better job of anticipating their moves and adding contingencies, like using his firefighter gear to draw her away from the scene of the crime. Why are you doing this? Don't talk, he hissed. He held something in his hand, but it was too dark for her to tell what it was. For all she knew, it could very well be the control for another bomb, and that was enough for her to remain silent, keeping pace with him as he drew her deeper into the shadows. She cast a furtive glance over her shoulder. Rye would realize she was missing and come after her, wouldn't he? Charles rounded the corner of a building, moving faster now. The more distance he put between her and the others, the more he cemented her fate. He was going to get away with this. Get in! He shoved her into the passenger seat of the jeep. Listen closely. If you try to escape, I'll detonate the device. An evil grin flashed on his face. Normally I'd stay to watch the fun and chaos, but you're my main priority, Jenny. Paul wants you to pay for what you've done. He'll give me the key to the secret cache of weapons once I'm able to make you pay for your crimes. Her father? A secret cache of weapons? And what crime? Her testimony? Of course, she'd known this mess would lead back to him. She didn't say anything more, her thoughts spinning uselessly. Charles had the upper hand now, but not for long. How far away did they have to be before the trigger wouldn't work? She had no idea but felt certain the device wouldn't work over a distance of several miles. Picking an arbitrary number of miles to ensure Rye's safety and that of the other first responders milling about the scene outside the motel seemed crazy, but she couldn't just sit there doing nothing. There had to be some way to buy some time for Rye and the others to realize she was gone, unless they assumed she'd left on her own. If that was the case, they may not bother to look for her. A chill snaked down her spine. No, Rye would know better. He would keep searching for her. Even if she left on her own, she felt certain he wouldn't just walk away, knowing she was still in danger. Her chest tightened, and panic threatened to overwhelm her. She couldn't afford to lose control. She needed to be strong for Rye's sake. Please, Lord, keep me safe in your care and guide Rye to find me. Charles shed his firefighter gear tossing it into the back seat. Then he quickly slid in behind the wheel. She belatedly noticed he wasn't wearing boots like the other firefighters had, which should have been a clue that he wasn't one of them. His fleece jacket and pants were black, making it easier for him to blend into the night. He started the car, then pulled away from the curb. With both hands on the wheel, she noted the trigger device was nowhere in sight. Then her gaze landed on the slight bulge in the right-hand pocket of his fleece. A real trigger or a fake one? And if it was real, how far away would they need to go before she could try to escape? She agonized over her next move. But to her surprise, Charles didn't go very far before pulling into an empty parking lot in front of a dilapidated building. 
her muscles tensed as she feared he may decide to hurt her in other ways before blowing her up. No, please, Lord, save me. Get out, he ordered. He slipped his hand into his pocket. Or else. A lump formed in the back of her throat. It took all her courage and strength to open the passenger side door and step out. Her knees buckled and she sagged against the car. Escape was impossible. All she could do was pray that whatever Charles had in store for her would be over quickly. She believed that God had sent his only son Jesus to save her, the way she'd been taught years ago. She straightened and faced her fate. In that moment, she realized she wasn't afraid to die. Where's Devin? Rye abruptly broke away from the debriefing with his boss and the officers on scene. A chill hit hard as he hurried over to where Brady and Kylie were also discussing the recent events with first responders. Brady? Kylie? Did either of you see Devin leave? What? Brady broke away from the officer he was talking to, glancing around the area. No, she was right here. She's not here anymore, Rye snapped, unable to hold back his anger. Maybe she needed to sit down. After all, she's probably exhausted by everything that happened, Kylie offered. Hey, are those taillights from a car? Brady asked. Rye saw them too. He broke into a run, fighting a wave of panic. His fault, not Brady's or Kylie's, Devin was his responsibility. He should have been watching her more closely. Brady and Kylie joined him, easily keeping pace. The taillights disappeared, so he put on a burst of speed. Call for backup, he shouted. Get the cops to set up roadblocks. Got it, Brady said, breaking off from the chase. Rye kept pushing forward. So did Kylie. They went up the block, then stopped when there was no sign of the taillights or the vehicle itself. Where are they? Rye swept his gaze over the area. Which way did they go? I don't know. Kylie was searching too. We need to split up. You go west and I'll head east. He gave a terse nod and veered off to the left. It bothered him to drag Kylie with him into danger, but he couldn't ignore the deep sense of dread. If they didn't find Devin soon, the bomber would kill her, finishing what he'd started three days ago. No, please, Lord, I'm begging you to please keep Devin safe. When he reached the next street, there was still no sign of the vehicle. He slowed his pace, sweeping his gaze from side to side, intently scouring the area in case the bomber was hiding with Devin somewhere nearby. No vehicle here, Rye, Kylie said through her headset. None here either, he answered. Roadblocks are being set up, Brady chimed in. Keep going, Rye said to Kylie. Check every single parked car. Roger that, Kylie said. I'll help, Brady added. Head north, Brady. Kylie and I have the other directions covered, and the motel crime scene is south of us. He hoped and prayed the bomber hadn't doubled back in that direction. Focused on his task, he didn't notice the cold winter wind. Nothing mattered except finding Devin. There, he spotted a parked car two blocks up ahead. It was a truck, not a sedan or jeep, but Rye approached it with caution anyway. Peering inside, he confirmed the truck was empty. Placing his hand on the hood, he found it cold to the touch. Not this one, he thought, as he continued moving forward. This was a commercial area of the city. No residences on this stretch of the street. It should be easy to find something out of place. Unfortunately, there weren't many vehicles parked in this direction. Maybe Kylie and Brady would find something. But his earpiece remained silent. Brady, where are those roadblocks? Frustration swept over him at coming up empty-handed. You said the officers would have this area secure. I see one being set up about a hundred yards up ahead, Kylie said. No other vehicles, though. We may want to switch gears to check the parking structures, Brady added. Our perp isn't dumb. He'll know that being out on the roads where we can find him is a bad idea. Logically, Rye knew his brother was right. If they didn't find something soon, they'd switch to the parking structures. He moved faster, trying to cover as much ground as possible. Up in the distance, he saw a squad with red and blue flashing lights park sideways across the street. The roadblock was finally in place. 
A little too late, he thought grimly. Time was the enemy. Devin's cousin might have gotten her out of the city by now. He picked up his pace to meet up with the officers. Thanks for the help. We believe the perp is driving either a sedan or a jeep. Keep your eyes open for anything unusual. Understood, the officer nodded. Appreciate it. Rye turned away and jogged back down the street. He touched his earpiece and spoke as he ran. Roadblock is in place here too. I'm switching over to searching parking structures. Roger that, Brady said. I'm coming up empty too, Kylie chimed in. I'll help. He was grateful for the assist, but couldn't help thinking they were spinning their wheels searching this area. Where would the perp take her? A horrible thought had him reaching for his phone. Taryn, I'm glad you're still awake. Did you catch him? His brother asked. No, it's worse than that. The bomber has Devin. You need to be on the lookout for him to show up there. Okay, I'll make the rounds again now. And call in the local police. If he shows up here, we'll grab him. Thanks, Tear. Rye hadn't felt this level of helplessness since the night his parents had been killed. If he lost Devin, his life would dramatically change, which was an odd realization since he wasn't in love with her. As soon as the thought formed, he knew that was a big fat lie. Who was he trying to kid? This churning in his stomach wasn't just out of concern for an innocent woman. It was because he'd fallen in love with Devin, and he could easily lose her, forever, if he or his siblings didn't find her. As he passed an abandoned restaurant that looked as if it had been closed for years, he slowed to a stop. The parking lot was snow-covered and overgrown with weeds, but there were tire tracks. Recent tire tracks. Brady, what's your 20? Rye hoped he wasn't overreacting, since the marks could have been left by anyone, including one of the police vehicles who'd responded to the scene. I have tire tracks in the parking lot of a former restaurant. What's the closest cross street? Brady asked. Flowers. I'm going to investigate. Wait for me, Brady said. ETA less than five minutes. That was five minutes too long, so Rye ignored the request. He turned into the parking lot, stepping carefully so that he didn't mess up the tire marks. Using his phone as a flashlight, he peered through the darkness behind the building. There was just enough space back there for a car, but the area was vacant. Turning back, his light snagged on an area where the tire tracks turned around. Then he noticed the footprints. His heart thudded painfully against his ribs as he lowered to a crouch to examine them more closely. A smaller pair of prints and a larger pair. Devin and the bomber. He rose and glanced around the area again. How long ago had they been here? And how had he missed stumbling across them? Based on the tire marks, they must have stopped here then left. But why stop at all? To get out of the vehicle? Yet there was no sign of it. I told you to wait, Brady said, breathing heavily as he joined Rye. There are tire marks and footprints. Rye turned and flashed his light toward the abandoned restaurant. Let's check out the building. Brady grabbed his arm. If you suspect he's in there holding Devin hostage, we need backup. Rye pulled out of his brother's grasp. You're my backup. Besides, there's no sign of a vehicle, so I doubt he's here. It's possible he stashed Devin inside. Why? Brady asked, falling into step beside him. I don't know. The tiny hairs on the back of his neck lifted in alarm. The building appeared deserted, but he didn't think it was. He reached for his weapon. Kylie, come meet us at the restaurant by flowers, Brady said. We're heading inside. Roger that, Kylie replied without hesitation. There was a wide front door and a smaller rear door likely used for the kitchen staff, based on the old dumpster that still sat back there. He briefly checked both doors, then turned to glance at his brother. Do you want to cover the front or the back? The back, Brady said. If anyone comes out that way, I'll snag them. Okay, I'll go in via the front. Kylie, stand guard by the front door when you get here, Rye directed. Got it. He and Brady split up. The concrete step in front of the main doorway was covered in a thin layer of ice, so it was impossible to tell if anyone had gone in recently. 
When he tried the door handle, though, he found it unlocked. This was it. Rai stood for a moment, then quickly opened the door, kicking it with his foot, while staying back in case the bomber was waiting inside with a gun. The door swung shut again, but not before he heard a female voice. Don't come in! His blood ran cold upon recognizing Devin's voice. Devin? It's Rai, Brady, and Kylie. Are you hurt? There was a choking sound, followed by, Yeah, you could say that. Please, go back. Don't come any closer. He didn't understand what she was concerned about, unless the perp was standing nearby with a gun to her head. Are you alone? I believe so, but that doesn't mean Charles isn't nearby. Charles, not Lane. But there was time to think more about that later. I'm coming in, he called. No, right, don't. I, there's a bomb. Of course there was. He should have realized that from the very beginning. He hesitated, but then kicked the door open again and crossed the threshold, holding his weapon at the ready in case Charles was hiding nearby. He took only a few steps when he saw Devin sitting in a chair, a terrified expression on her face. His gaze took in the bomb that was duct-taped over the front of her winter jacket, a homemade suicide vest. Please, Rye, get out of here. She sat completely still, her eyes wide with fear. I'm sure he'll trigger the bomb any second. Go, now. I'm not leaving you. He took a moment to clear the building, ensuring Charles wasn't hiding close by. Many of the wooden frames were rotted, and he hoped, as Brady had mentioned, that the entire structure wouldn't collapse around them. When he was satisfied Charles wasn't hiding inside, he holstered his weapon, reached up, and touched his earpiece. Brady, you and Kylie need to get back at least 80 feet from the building. What's going on? Brady asked. He met Devin's frightened eyes and said, Charles Rowe wired her up with a suicide vest, and he has the trigger. I need you to get back up on scene and spread out to find him. He can't be hiding too far away. What are you going to do? Kylie asked. I'm going to try to get the vest off Devin. He disconnected from the radio and stepped closer. Don't be afraid. I'm going to get you out of here. Please, Rye, just go. Her voice hitched. I don't want you to die too. He didn't want to die either, but he wasn't leaving. Not now, not ever. But he couldn't lie. This was a nearly impossible task. All he could do was pray for the strength and wisdom he'd need to free Devin before the bomb detonated, killing them both. Chapter 14 Stay back, Devin repeated as Rye stepped close, his gaze focused on the bomb. She was afraid to move, to even blink, but she refused to remain silent. She admired his dedication, but this was a no-win situation. Charles was out there, waiting for the opportune time to press the trigger. Just like he had with the bomb he'd stuck in her apartment mailbox, she gathered every ounce of strength she possessed to inject confidence in her tone. Please, Rye, I'm begging you to go back. There is no reason for both of us to die here tonight. I'm not leaving you, he said again. My goal is to find a way to get you out of that thing. Charles told me that will be impossible. Think about your family. Ellie, Alana, the others. They need you, Rye. They need you to continue holding everything together. She wished there was a way to make him understand. I'm not afraid to die. I've done nothing but pray since Charles snatched me. But I can't stand the idea of your family losing you. Please hurry to escape. My uncle will set off the bomb at any moment. Even as she spoke, Rye knelt beside her, tracing wires with his fingers as he examined the bomb strapped to her chest. Then he held up his phone with the flashlight app illuminated. Here, I need you to hold this for me so I can see what I'm doing. She wanted to refuse, but knew he'd just do the task in the dark, so she slowly lifted her hand to take the phone. The duct tape Charles had used to strap her down went around her biceps, so she could only lift her arm part way. Please, Rye, I want you and the others to get back. He ignored her plea, frowning as he traced the wires. She held her breath, expecting to blow up any second. Would she feel any pain, or would it all happen too quickly for her to realize what was happening? She prayed for the latter. What can I say to make you leave? 
She didn't hide the desperation in her voice. There's no time for this. Charles told me he was going to detonate the bomb. Nothing. I need a moment to think. Humbled by his dedication, her eyes welled with tears. No one had cared about her as much as Rye, except her mother. Yet she wanted him to hurry up and determine there was nothing to be done so he could get out of there. Rye had his entire family to live for. She had nothing. Tears flowed down her cheeks, but she didn't make a sound, holding the flashlight for Rye at an awkward angle. Rye pulled out a knife, and her heart lodged in her throat. Are you cutting the wires? Nope. He used the tip of the blade to slit through the duct tape around her right upper arm, then did the same with the left. With trepidation, she lifted her right arm upward, still holding the phone. Is this better? He nodded and continued cutting the duct tape, moving faster now. Then, to her surprise, he cut through her thin winter coat. A flicker of hope eased the tension in her chest. He continued slicing with the knife until the coat was separate from her body. I'm going to hold the vest while you slip out of the jacket and the chair, he instructed. She wanted to protest, but did as he asked. While Rye held the bomb-like vest, she slid sideways out from what remained of her coat. A moment later, she was standing beside Rye. Now what? She stayed close to his side. Can you set it down? That's the plan, but you need to go first. He glanced up at her. No arguments. I'll be right behind you. She didn't want to leave him, just as he'd refused to leave her. But she didn't know what else to do. The longer she stayed, the longer he'd be in harm's way too. I love you. The declaration popped from her mouth before she could think about the ramifications. Then she turned and hurried out of the abandoned restaurant. Outside, Brady and Kylie, along with several other police officers, were standing way back across the street. She instinctively ran toward them. Where's Rye? Kylie demanded. He promised to come out right behind me, she gasped, then turned to stare at the restaurant. Seconds later, Rye raced from the building. Get back! he shouted. As one, the entire group moved backward several feet. The abandoned restaurant behind Rye exploded, the force of the blast knocking her off her feet. She hit the asphalt road with a jarring thud, the back of her head bouncing off the ground. Oddly, she didn't feel any pain as she scrambled upright, frantically searching the area. Rye? Where are you? Rye? Here. His voice was faint as he lifted his head from the ground. He rolled off his stomach to glance back at the building that was on fire, flames dancing through the broken windows. She lunged toward him, needing to see for herself he wasn't hurt. I can't believe we were able to escape. He pushed to his feet, then grabbed her close. God was watching out for us, Devin. She nodded, fresh tears filling her eyes. God was, yes, but you were the one who refused to leave me. She was still in awe over that. Thank you, Rye, for saving my life. Nice job, bro. Brady and Kylie rushed over to join them. I was worried you wouldn't make it out, Brady added. Thanks, but it's not over. Rye released her to address his siblings. Charles is still in the area, and we need to find him, or he'll just keep coming after Devon. The fire trucks from the motel are heading this way, Kylie said. That reminds me, Charles was dressed as a firefighter, which is how he got me away from the scene earlier, she quickly interjected. I would have called out, but he claimed to have a bomb hidden nearby that he'd set off if I didn't go along silently. It was probably a bluff, but we need to search the area anyway, Brady said. I'm going to see if we can get some bomb-sniffing dogs brought in. That will take time that we don't have. Rye said, and if he had a bomb there, he'd have probably set it off by now. Let's focus on finding Charles. Devin, what vehicle was he driving? A dark-colored jeep. She tried to remember everything that had happened before he'd duct-taped the bomb to her chest. I was only inside the building for a few minutes before you showed up. Rye reached for his radio. Keep the roadblocks intact and be on the lookout for a dark-colored jeep being driven by Charles Rowe. He's been identified as the bomber. I need all officers not assigned to the roadblocks to begin searching the area for him. We were about to search the parking lots before you found Devin, Kylie said. Maybe he's lying low somewhere nearby. 
especially since he must have triggered the device, Brady added. I'm so glad you were able to escape in time, Rye. I'm not sure if he triggered the device or if it was the way I tossed it as far away as possible just before I ran out of there, Rye said. Either way, we must assume he's close by. I also need to make sure Devin is someplace safe as we spread out to search for him. Rye's expression was grim. We can't let him get to her a second time. I'll go with you. She was anxious to do something rather than standing around while her uncle tried to escape. Please, Rye, let's just stick together, okay? He hesitated only a moment, then nodded in agreement. Fine, let's spread out then. Hold on, Brady protested. Give me a minute to pull up a map of the area. We need to be organized about this. Rye grimaced. Good point, and we each need to take a police officer with us too. She could tell he was a bit rattled from the explosion. Rye and Kylie huddled around Brady's phone as they identified all the possible parking structures. I want the one closest to this location. Rye tapped the screen. Brady, you take this one, and Kylie, you cover this one. Those are the only three structures in the area. Oh, and Kylie, I left my SUV in that structure too. You may want to check it out. Make sure it's not wired to blow. Will do, Kylie promised. Let's grab three street cops to join our search. Stay in touch, Brady said as they split off from each other. You come with us, Rye ordered. The cop looked young, but he didn't argue. He jogged over to join her and Rye. Captain? Officer Stiles, I need your help. We're looking for a dark-colored jeep in this structure that may belong to our perp, Charles Rowe, Rye informed him. Let's go. Stiles nodded. The three of them ran toward the closest parking structure. Devin stayed close to Rye, but ironically, she was no longer afraid. Having a bomb duct-taped across her body had been the most terrifying situation she'd ever experienced. Yet somehow, Rye had not only found her, but he'd also stayed with her, working a minor miracle to free her from certain death, risking his own life to do so, which was even worse. The possible danger they faced here paled in comparison. A surge of anger fueled her lagging strength. This was no time to fall apart. Rye was right. They absolutely needed to find Charles, and soon. He was evil and deserved to spend the rest of his life in jail just like her father. Rye headed up the entryway of the structure, using the ramp where the vehicles normally would get inside. Then he paused and glanced at the officer accompanying them. Okay, we're going to split each floor down the middle. Styles, you take the north side, and we'll take the south. Be careful and keep your head down. We don't want to spook him. The officer glanced curiously at her, but didn't ask the obvious question of why she was joining them. Got it. Devin stayed behind Rye, with the officer behind her. They crept up to the first level, then split off in opposite directions. She glanced around curiously. The good news was that there weren't that many vehicles in the structure at this hour of the morning. There were some, but it was easy to see none were dark-colored jeeps. Rye used his radio to talk to Stiles in a low voice, rather than shouting across the concrete space. First floor clear. Let's head up to the second floor using the stairwell. Roger that, she heard the officer reply. Once again, she followed Rye into the small area where the elevators were located. Directly across from the two sets of steel elevator doors, there was another door. Rye opened it, revealing a stairwell. She followed Rye up with Styles behind her. They hovered in the lobby area and peered through the glass doors. There were maybe 15 vehicles up there. Rye eased the door open and slipped through. She did the same, staying close behind Rye as he made his way to the vehicle parked closest to the door. He paused, then gestured for the young officer to go the other way. He nodded and moved off. Rye eased around the car and checked the next one. Then he abruptly stopped, causing her to bump into him. He took a moment to pull her down so they were both crouching behind a minivan, which was the third vehicle down. What is it? she whispered. Rather than answer her, he spoke softly into his radio. Styles, I have a dark jeep over here. It's the sixth vehicle down the line. What do you see on your side? One white jeep, but no dark ones. The officer's voice was a whisper too, but she was close enough to hear it. 
I see the dark one now too. Heading your way, Captain. Peeking out from behind Rye, she saw what looked to be the boxy back end of a jeep. Her heart thudded against her ribcage. From here, it looked exactly like the one Charles had been using. Rye wished now that he'd left Devon locked up in the back of a squad far away from here, but it had been impossible to ignore her request to go with him. In truth, after losing her once to Charles dressed as a firefighter, he hadn't trusted anyone else to watch over her. But if that was Rose Jeep, the possibility of the guy hiding inside with yet another explosive device put him in a difficult situation. If the perp saw them, he may just blow up the vehicle in one final attempt to take them all out at the same time. At this point, Rye wouldn't put anything past him. The seconds ticked by slowly as Stiles made his way over. Soon he was crouched beside them. What's the plan? Good question. If he and Stiles were alone, he'd insist they move forward for a closer look. Just because there was a dark-colored jeep there didn't mean it belonged to Roe. It was a common vehicle in Wisconsin. The four-wheel drive feature was especially useful during the long winter months. Why don't you let me move forward a bit, Stiles offered. Just enough to get the license plate number. He hesitated, then nodded. Okay, but we need backup. As soon as you have the license plate information, we'll retreat to the elevator alcove until the rest of the team gets here. What if it's not his jeep? Devin asked. He shrugged. We'll keep searching. But for now, we're operating under the premise that it's his and may be rigged to blow. He eyed the cop. Be careful. Roger that. Stiles flashed a grin and eased away from the van. It bothered him to send the younger guy into danger. Normally, Rye would have been the one to take the risk, the way he had when it came to rescuing Devin from the bomb strapped to her chest. It was hard to believe that slicing through the duct tape and her light jacket to get away from the device had worked. He hadn't been sure it would. The street cop took what seemed like forever, but soon reappeared. Got it, he whispered. He held up his phone, showing Rye the photograph of the license plate. He quickly memorized it. Glancing over his shoulder, Rye estimated the distance to the elevator alcove to be roughly 50 feet. Every nerve in his body wanted to run, but making sudden moves probably wasn't wise. Okay, let's slowly ease back, he whispered. The goal is to reach the elevator without raising suspicion if Roe is in the vehicle. Understand? When they both nodded, he said, Devin, you go first. Remaining in a crouch, she turned and slowly made her way toward the elevators. He gestured for Stiles to go next. The young street cop silently followed Devin, and Rye was impressed by their quiet movements. He went last, covering Stiles and Devin's backs. After just fifteen feet, he heard the rumble of a car engine. He glanced back and saw the brake lights of a vehicle flash on. The jeep shot backward out of the parking space. Go! Go! he shouted. He put on a burst of speed, reaching out to push Stiles forward. Hurry! Tires squealed as the jeep lunged toward him. Devin made it through the doorway, but had turned to stare back at him in horror. Keep going! He feared Roe would crash into the elevator alcove to get to them. Devin didn't keep going. She held the glass door leading into the elevator lobby open for Stiles. Rye pretty much shoved the cop toward her as the jeep roared closer behind him. The engine grew louder. As he approached the elevator alcove, Devin rushed forward and wrenched the doorway leading to the stairs open. She disappeared through the opening, followed by Stiles. He closed the gap, but the jeep did the same. He felt the bumper hit him from behind. He pushed with his feet at the same time, jumping clear of the jeep in his attempt to get through the door and into the lobby. The jeep smashed into the glass door. Glass rained around him as he lunged forward, falling into the stairwell. He landed hard against the rail, just managing to stay on his feet. Keep going, he shouted. He felt certain Roe would blow up the jeep to kill them all, or give chase. Neither were good options, although he preferred the latter, while bracing for the sound of an explosion as he pounded down the stairs after Devon and Stiles. Gunfire rang out, the bullet pinging off the metal railing near his right side. He ducked around the corner only halfway down the stairwell 
and pulled his own weapon. Keep going, he urged when he realized Devon and Stiles were waiting for him on the stairs leading to the ground level. Get outside and call for backup. Another bullet hit roughly two inches from his head. Rye dropped to his knees, took a breath, and peeked quickly upward and around the corner. Seeing a man standing near the top stair holding a gun, he didn't hesitate to fire off several rounds of his own before ducking back to seek cover. For long moments, there was nothing but silence. He didn't relax, though, knowing Roe was likely waiting for Rye to make the next move. Two could play the waiting game, he thought grimly. At this point, he was thankful Stiles and Devon were safe. A crunching sound of glass being smashed beneath a boot spurred him into action. He peeked around the corner again and fired three shots up at the area where he'd seen Roe a minute earlier. This time, he heard a muffled cry as he hit his target. A series of loud thuds reached his ears as Roe's body rolled down the stairs. Rye surged backward in case this was a trick, his weapon trained on the target. If the guy so much as moved, he'd shoot again. But it didn't take long for him to lower his gun, realizing the man was dead, having suffered several chest wounds. Then he frowned. The man lying in front of him wasn't Charles, the way Devon had claimed. He was too young, and his features resembled her cousin, Lane Rowe. Instantly, he threw himself sideways, just as another barrage of bullets echoed loudly down the narrow stairwell. Charles was still alive. The two men were working together. He clattered down the remaining stairs until he burst outside. His gaze landed on Devon and Stiles. Get away from the structure, he shouted. Lane Rowe is dead, but Charles is alive and inside. Stiles reached for his radio, but too late. The explosion he'd expected earlier reverberated around him. For the second time in less than an hour, Rye was tossed airborne from the force of the blast. He landed with a hard thud, his forehead slamming into the ground. Then there was nothing but darkness. Chapter 15 Rye! Devin broke free of Officer Stiles' grasp and ran toward Rye. His body hadn't moved since hitting the ground, but she refused to think the worst. He couldn't be dead. He just couldn't be. Rye, can you hear me? She ran her hand down his back debating the wisdom of turning him over. Wasn't there something about not moving someone so you didn't make their injuries worse? Rye, it's Devin. She tried to feel for a pulse in his neck, but the angle was awkward and she couldn't feel anything. Help! She glanced over to where Stiles was using his radio. He quickly joined her. I can't feel his pulse. Stiles tried to feel for his pulse too. He glanced at her with concern, but then... Rye let out a low groan. Rye! Tears of relief welled in her eyes. We're here! He lifted his head off the ground to look around in confusion. Then he pushed himself up and over so he was lying on his back. There was a large knot in the middle of his forehead, and for all she knew, he might have other injuries. Don't move, okay? She ran her hands over his arms but didn't feel any signs of an obvious injury. Still, she was hardly a nurse. What did she know? They needed professional medical care. Charles? His voice was low and husky. Did you see him? No, I didn't see him. But don't worry about that. An ambulance is on the way. She glanced questioningly at Stiles, who nodded. We'll get you to the hospital soon. Don't need the hospital. He turned his head so he could see her. They were both in the jeep. Both? She wondered if he was suffering a head injury. It's okay, Rye. Just relax. Charles and Lane, he said. I shot Lane, he's dead. But then I saw Charles, and he tried to shoot me. He must have realized he wasn't going to get away. Maybe he saw the backup arriving, so he set off the explosion. Realization dawned. Charles and Lane were working together the entire time? Looking back, it made sense. One man would have had difficulty doing everything alone. I had no idea. Lane must have been hiding somewhere nearby while Charles taped the bomb to me. Rye grimaced and lifted a hand to his head. I should have put them together sooner. If I had... Don't, Rye. Do not blame yourself. She rested her hand on his chest, 
gazing down at him imploringly. I'm the one they wanted, remember? If anyone is at fault, it's me. I don't think either of you should be blaming yourselves for anything, Stiles drawled. Seems to me that you took out a couple of bad guys, Captain, and that they got exactly what they deserved. The corner of Rye's mouth tipped up in a smile. I want to believe Charles didn't survive, but I need to know for sure. More cops arrived on the scene, along with the long fire truck that had just extinguished the fire at the treetop motel. Rye! Kylie rushed over, her expression full of concern. What happened? Long story, he muttered. He reached for Devin's hand, and she was more than happy to hold on to it. Man, I knew I should have taken this parking structure, Brady said with a sigh. His words were light, but his gaze was serious as he looked down at his oldest brother. I wish I'd have been the one to find this guy. She loved everything about the Finnegan family. The concern in both Brady's and Kylie's gazes proved how much they loved their brother. Yet, she couldn't bring herself to move away from Rye's side. Thankfully, Brady and Kylie didn't seem to mind that she stayed put until the ambulance rolled to a stop and two paramedics came over wheeling a gurney. I'm fine, Rye protested, pulling out of her grasp so he could sit upright. Just bumps and bruises. Yeah, I can see the large goose egg on your head, the female paramedic pointed out. Rye reached up to touch his forehead. Nothing like hitting the ground face first. Please let them examine you. Devin begged. You would insist on the same thing if I was the one lying there, or one of your siblings. She's right, Kylie said firmly, and you know it. Fine, Rye gestured to the paramedics. Do your thing. Devin hovered nearby as the two examined Rye. They asked several questions to assess his memory, then listened to his heart and lungs. You lost consciousness, which requires a trip to the ER, the female paramedic said when they'd finished. The doc will want to do a CT scan of your head to make sure there's no internal bleeding into your brain. I'd rather not, Rye protested. You will, Brady insisted. No arguments, remember? I'd like to go with him, Devin said, if that's okay. I know my uncle and cousin are probably dead, but I'd rather not stick around. Brady and Kylie glanced at each other, then nodded. Fine, we'll meet up with you at the Trinity Medical Center once we finish up here. Thank you. She wanted to hug them both for being so kind. They had more of a right to be there than she did. But she couldn't leave until she knew for sure Rye was okay. To her surprise, the paramedics didn't put up a fight about her riding along. Maybe because the fiery scene at the parking structure was so awful, they understood why she needed to get away. She made sure to stay out of the way on the short ride to the city's trauma center. I'm okay. Rye said reassuringly, catching her worried gaze. I'm sure they'll discharge me once the scan has been completed. I know, she forced a smile. Thank you for saving my life, again. The female paramedic glanced at her curiously. Sounds like a rough night. You could say that, she agreed wearily. When they reached the hospital, the paramedics allowed her to tag along as they wheeled Rye straight back to a room. A pretty nurse with short, dark hair hurried over to greet them. Hello, my name is Dana. I understand you've suffered a nasty head injury. She smiled while connecting Rye to a heart monitor. I'll take a quick set of vitals and perform a neuro exam. The doc will be in shortly. Devin stayed out of the way but couldn't tear her gaze from Rye. The bruise on his forehead was bad, and she suspected he might end up with two black eyes too. After Dana did her exam, she brought in an ice pack for his head. Thanks. Rye held it in place with one hand. When Dana left, she edged closer and held the ice pack for him. I'm so sorry you were hurt, she said. I'm just glad the worst is over. Rye shifted on the bed. I hope they get this scan done soon. I don't like being out of the loop. She couldn't help but smile. You don't need to be in charge all the time. Yeah, I kind of do. Can't help it. He closed his eyes for a moment. The ice feels good. I'm glad. There was so much she wanted to say, but of course, she didn't. The poor guy had a head injury. This wasn't the time to tell him how much she cared, how much she loved him.
he hadn't responded to her declaration of love, which told her what she needed to know. He cared for her, but didn't feel the same way. No surprise, really. Rye could have any woman he wanted. She'd brought nothing but trouble and danger to his family. She had no doubt he'd be glad to be rid of her now that the danger was over. The doc arrived and did his own neuro exam. We'll get you down to radiology soon, he promised. I believe Dana has made the arrangements. She'll get you a hospital gown too. Can't go in wearing street clothes. If the scan is clear, you'll spring me loose, Rye asked. We'll see, the doc demurred. To her surprise, it didn't take long for Dana to return. As promised, the nurse pulled the curtain for privacy so Rye could shed his clothes. He looked more vulnerable wearing the hospital gown. When he was ready, Dana pushed his bed out of the room and into the hallway. We'll be back in about 15 minutes, she called over her shoulder. Okay. Devin sank into the hard plastic chair, then dropped her head into her hands. Waves of exhaustion rolled over her. So much had happened in such a short period of time. Being found at the motel, then kidnapped by Charles, then finding him in the parking garage. All this damage and destruction, for what? Revenge? Her father had somehow convinced his brother and son to kill her because she'd testified against him in court, and he dangled a cache of weapons as a bonus for a job well done. What kind of father did that? His behavior was the exact opposite of the Finnegan family. They'd suffered a tragic loss, but they had bonded together rather than splitting apart. Because of Rye, with help from Taryn too, but mostly Rye. He was the most honorable and amazing man she'd ever known, and she'd miss him when she was gone. Devin held herself together with an effort. She couldn't fall apart here. Once she knew Rye was fine, she'd figure out where to go and what to do. It wasn't as if she hadn't started over before. Yet she wouldn't go back to using her birth name. She'd rather stay Devin Thompson. In her mind, Jennifer Rowe was someone else, gone forever along with the rest of her awful family. Not her mother. At least she'd had her mother's love for the first 20 years of her life. She decided when she legally changed her name, she'd use Anne as her middle name to honor her mother. She'd managed to find a new place to live, a new place to work. It wasn't that hard, really. But she also knew that moving on wouldn't change how she felt about Rye. No, even once she was gone from Milwaukee, Rye Finnegan would always have her heart. It wasn't easy to wait patiently in the ER while others finished up working the crime scene. His head throbbed painfully, but he didn't think it was bad enough to warrant a hospital stay. The three powerful words Devin had told him when he'd freed her from the bomb in the abandoned restaurant reverberated through his mind. I love you. At the time, he'd been trying to come up with a way to escape the bomb without being caught in the blast. When that mission was accomplished, they had gone out on the manhunt for Charles. He'd been shot at, killed a man, and nearly lost his life for a second time. Yet those three little words had pulled him through. He and Devin hadn't known each other long, and his family would have a field day once they learned the truth. But he didn't care, because the irrefutable fact was that he loved Devin too more than he thought possible, far more than he'd loved Rachel. The way she'd begged him to leave her in the restaurant had been humbling. In all his years as a cop, he'd never had a victim offer to die to save him. Devin had done that twice, first with the mailbox key, then again tonight. Devin wasn't like anyone else. She'd wanted to protect him, constantly reminding him just how much his family needed him. She was the exact opposite of Rachel, in every way that counted, but mostly because of the way she'd bonded with his siblings. Not that she'd met all of them yet. Hopefully she would at Sunday dinner tomorrow, well, rather, later that evening. After the scan was finished and he was wheeled back to his room, his heart swelled when he saw Devin waiting for him. She looked exhausted, but smiled and stood. How did it go? He reached for her hand, kneading the contact. I guess we'll hear soon enough. The doc will be in once he's received the results, Dana assured him. A voice in the hallway called out, Callahan, you have a call on line two. Coming, Dana said, then patted his arm. 
Call if you need me. Callahan? Devon echoed. You think she's one of the Callahans Ellie mentioned as being relatives of yours? I don't know. We can ask later. He didn't much care at this moment. He sought her gaze. Did you mean what you said? Confusion flickered in her blue eyes. What did I say? He hesitated. Had he imagined it? Just before you left the abandoned restaurant, you said you loved me. She blushed and looked away. Oh, that. I, uh, that wasn't fair, Rye. I shouldn't have burdened you with my emotions when you were focused on saving my life and yours, too. His heart swelled with hope. I'm glad I didn't imagine it, because I love you, too. She gaped, her eyes widening. What? You don't have to say the words back. You've had a rough night, and you have a head injury, and... And I love you, he interrupted. He reached for her hand. You've been through a traumatic night too, so I get it. There's no rush. I, we can take our time. Rye, I don't know what to say. She didn't look as happy as he'd hoped. You deserve someone better than me. Someone without all this baggage. Look what my father and my uncle and cousin did tonight. It's awful. And I didn't even tell you about the secret stash of weapons my uncle was trying to get his hands on. We'll find the weapons, or the feds will. That's not the important part. You are, Devin. You're sweet, honorable, and brave. And don't forget, I have eight siblings. If that's not a boatload of baggage, I don't know what is. They are not baggage. Your family is amazing. Tears shimmered in her eyes. A wave of helplessness hit hard. Was she turning him down? I love them. I do too. He tugged on her hand to bring her closer. What are you saying? You don't love me? I love you so much, she whispered. But I'm afraid it won't last. Now that the danger is over, you'll learn I'm nothing special. You tried to protect me, Devin. That's incredibly special. He wanted to pull her down for a kiss. Why had he brought this up now? He should have waited until he'd been discharged. Lying in a bed, wearing a stupid hospital gown, had put him at a distinct disadvantage. You risked your life for me more times than I can count, she said. I'll never be able to repay you for that, Rye. Never. I risk my life for others every day, so I don't want you to repay me. He thought this would be easier. I just want you to love me the way I love you. Oh, Rye. She smiled and wiped at her tears. I do. I love you very much. She bent and kissed him. He reached up to hold her in place, kissing her back, trying to tell her without words how much she meant to him. He couldn't imagine his life without her. Oh, sorry, are we interrupting? Kylie asked. Devin broke off from the kiss, her cheeks growing pink. Uh, sorry about that. I, uh... She glanced at him with a panicked expression. She's teasing, Devin. Don't listen to her. He turned to his sister. Yes, you are interrupting, but I'll forgive you if you're bringing good news. Seems like we just saw the good news, Brady drawled. Have to admit, I'm not surprised. You're not? Devin asked in surprise. Kylie grinned and came over to put her arm around Devin's shoulders, giving her a hug. Not one little bit. The way you two looked at each other made your feelings clear to the rest of us. We just weren't sure when you'd get around to figuring it out for yourselves. Rye could have kissed his sister for making Devin feel welcome. He grinned. Yeah, well, cut us some slack. We were a little busy over the past few hours. Slack given, Brady said. Oh, and you'll be glad to know two bodies have been found in the parking garage. The scene is still too hot to pull them out, but the firefighters located them and notified the M.E.'s office. Obviously, we'll need the official word from them on the ID of the victims, but since you saw both perps, it's a safe assumption they're both dead. Rye let out a sigh of relief. It's finally over. Praise the Lord, Devin whispered. Yes, praise the Lord indeed. Aw, I like her, Rye. Kylie hugged Devin again. I'm glad we're keeping her. We, Rye echoed, but from the bemused expression on Devin's face, she didn't seem to mind being included as part of the family. 
Do me a favor, Kai, and try not to scare her off, okay? Never, Kylie retorted. I told you, we like her. Mr. Finnegan? The doc stood in the doorway, frowning at the visitors. You should be resting. I have eight siblings. This is resting. Rye offered a lopsided smile. What's the word on the scan? Thankfully, no bleeding into your brain was seen on your CT scan, the doc said. But that doesn't mean you're completely out of the woods. We'd like to have you stay for at least eight hours so we can do a repeat scan later. I'd rather not, Rye shot back. Can't I just get a follow-up scan if my condition changes? Do you have a nurse to watch over you? The doc asked. As a matter of fact, he does, Kylie said. Alana Finnegan is an ER nurse too. She works here. Don't you know her? The doc's eyebrows rose. Yes, I know Alana. Okay then, I'll go ahead and write the discharge order, but you, he pointed at Kylie, need to make sure he's watched closely by Alana. Understand? I promise, she agreed. The doc muttered something under his breath as he turned away. Rye grimaced. You sure put him in his place, Kai. Yeah, well, he made me mad. Kylie shrugged. And you know Alana will watch you like a hawk. There was another knock at his door. Captain Finnegan? Rye decided he'd get more rest at home, even with his siblings being there. Yes, come in. A tall, blonde-haired man entered the room. I'm Mitch Callahan, the arson investigator assigned to the fires that have ravaged the city over the past several hours. I hear you're the one who knows the most about that. Are you related to Maddie Callahan? Devin asked. Rye's youngest sister, Ellie, has been working on a DNA connection to the Callahan family. I am. My sister, Maddie, told us about the DNA link to the Finnegans, too. He grinned. Funny how my wife, Dana, ended up being your nurse tonight. Guess this is almost like a mini-reunion or something. Yeah, Kylie agreed. Ironic, isn't it? Seems like the minute Ellie told us of a possible DNA connection, our paths have begun to cross. It's a small world, isn't it? Very, Mitch agreed. I've actually worked with Mitch before, Rye admitted. I just didn't think he was part of the same Callahan family Ellie was referring to. Although, now that he thought of it, he should have considered they were one and the same. He'd been too preoccupied by the bomber to give the DNA connection much thought. I know, right? Mitch hesitated, then added, I wish we could chat more, but I have a few questions about the explosives used at each of the three crime scenes. The treetop motel, the abandoned restaurant, and the parking structure, Rye said. I can only give you details about the bomb in the abandoned restaurant. I wasn't close enough to the others. I'll take whatever information you can give me. Mitch eyed his siblings and Devin. I can stop by later if you're not up to doing this now. Rye glanced pointedly at Brady, then at Kylie and Devin. His brother got the message. Yeah, we'll grab something to eat from the vending machine while you guys talk. Devin looked as if she might protest, but Brady didn't take no for an answer. He tugged her toward the door, and she quickly followed his siblings out of the room. He gave Mitch Callahan everything he could remember about each of the three events that had taken place that night. Or rather, that morning. Mitch looked shocked when he described how he'd gotten Devin out of her jacket while the bomb was still intact. That was a huge risk, he said. I couldn't come up with another idea, and thankfully it worked. I'm afraid I can't tell you much about the parking structure explosion. He put a hand to the bump on his head. Other than it packed a punch, tossing me several feet in the air. I'm glad you're doing okay, Mitch said. I wasn't able to get too close yet, as it's still too hot, but I'll work the scene again in the morning. I'd like an update when you learn more information, Rye said, if you don't mind. Sure thing. Mitch tucked his small notebook away. Do you think your family and mine are really related? I figure the DNA doesn't lie, but my parents are gone, so I can't ask them anything about their grandparents. He shrugged. Maybe your family knows more? My mom might. Mitch agreed. She's babysitting our kids tonight. We have a three-year-old boy named Simon and a one-year-old daughter named Trina. I know Maddie is planning to talk to our mother soon. Either way, it's funny how we're just learning about this now, isn't it? Take care of yourself, Rye. I'll stay in touch. Thanks, Mitch.
The moment Mitch Callahan left, his siblings and Devin returned. Dana is getting your discharge paperwork together, Kylie informed him. I assume you guys brought one vehicle here? He gestured to his jeans folded on the empty chair. You'll find the keys to my SUV in the front right pocket. Will one of you get it for me? I will. His sister dug out the keys. I saw your SUV in the garage I was searching. Brady has his vehicle here. He can drive you home. She left without a backward glance. I'll need to be dropped at the motel, Devin said. No way. You'll continue to stay in the guest room. Rye frowned when she didn't respond. What's wrong? I thought you liked staying at the house. That was just to keep me safe. I, uh, can't stay there indefinitely. Her cheeks were pink again, and he shot Brady a look that told him to get lost. I'll pull my car up to the circle drive. Brady turned away, then added over his shoulder, Don't make me wait too long. When they were finally alone, he sat up and swung his legs over the edge of the bed. The hospital gown was open in the back, but he did his best to ignore the indignity of that. What's going on, Devin? Why can't you stay in the guest room for however long it takes? For however long what takes? She took a step closer and rested her hand on his chest. I love you, Rye, but I can't just move in with you. That's not right. I don't care what's right or not right. I want you to stay. He slipped his arms around her waist and drew her closer. It would be different if you had an apartment to return to, but you don't. Please don't fight me on this. I would feel much better if I knew you were staying with my family. Are you sure? She still didn't look convinced. Please, come home with us. I want you to be comfortable. Besides, you saw how nuts it gets there. It's not as if we'll be alone much. I could use your help. He kissed her again, hoping to silence any potential protests. Devin wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him back. They probably would have stayed locked in each other's arms for hours if Dana Callahan hadn't chosen that moment to walk in. Oh, sorry. I guess you really are ready to go, she teased. He regretfully lifted his head. You have the worst timing. She laughed. Sorry, but this is a hospital, and I have your paperwork. If you're ready to leave, we have other patients that could use your bed. Dana's expression turned serious. You have strict instructions to return if there's any change in your pain, blurry vision, or ability to remember things. Understand? I hear you, and I'm sure Alana knows what symptoms to watch for. He gestured to his clothes. Now, if you will both excuse me, I'd like to get dressed. Devin followed Dana out of the room. Rye quickly tossed the hospital gown aside, wincing a bit as the pounding of his head intensified as he bent over to grab his shirt and pants. Hmm, maybe he needed more time to kiss Devin. He hadn't noticed his headache when she'd been in his arms. The thought brought a smile. He couldn't wait to take Devin home, where she belonged. Epilogue Two weeks later Devin marveled at how easily she slipped into the organized chaos of the Finnegan family. She knew Rye's siblings worked hard to make the transition easy for her, but there were times she had to pinch herself to make sure she wasn't dreaming. Being with Rye, seeing him off each morning, and helping to make dinner each night was wonderful. He'd never once made her feel uncomfortable, kissing her goodnight as if they were dating rather than sleeping under the same roof. Yet she knew their living arrangements couldn't go on indefinitely. She could tell from the occasional confused glance between Ellie and Alana that they were wondering how long she was planning to stay too. Two weeks after the parking structure bombing, the Emmy's office let her know that her uncle's and her cousin's bodies had both been identified. Her uncle had suffered a gunshot wound. In addition to setting off a bomb, they assumed he'd been trying to toss toward Rye. Her cousin had been shot multiple times in the chest. She didn't grieve their passing. How could she? But she did pray for her father, still serving his multiple life sentences in federal prison, that the hatred he held toward her would fade over time. After explaining about the secret stash of weapons, the feds had gone after her father hard for more information. She hoped he'd been smart enough to cooperate. As she began to start dinner, her phone rang. Surprised to see Rye's name on the screen, since he never called from work, she quickly answered, 
Hi, is something wrong? No, everything is fine. I just wanted to take you out for dinner tonight. Everyone else is gone, aren't they? I, uh, yes, they're off doing their thing. She never mentioned to Rai how much living here was like being in the hub of a busy transit station. She had trouble keeping everyone's schedules straight. But we don't need to go out. Yes, we do. I'll be home in an hour, okay? Without giving her time to say anything more, he disconnected from the call. She pocketed her phone and thought about the clothes she'd already borrowed from Ellie. Rai's youngest sister had been more than generous, offering her anything she needed, so she headed upstairs to find something nicer than jeans to wear to dinner. As she searched Ellie's closet, she realized this was the first time she and Rai had gone out together. She frowned, hoping he didn't think she expected special treatment. She found a dark blue sweater dress and carried it to her room. She showered, used a blow dryer on her hair, which could use a trim, then drew on the dress. It fit perfectly. Thanks, Ellie, she whispered, staring in awe at her reflection. It had been years since she'd considered herself pretty. When Rye arrived thirty minutes later, she was ready to go. His admiring gaze made her blush. I helped myself to Ellie's closet again, she admitted, feeling self-conscious. She told me she didn't mind. You look incredible. Rye glanced around the kitchen, then drew her into his arms to kiss her. It's nice to have you alone for a bit. She couldn't disagree. After a long kiss, he lifted his head and sighed. As much as I hate to say it, we better go. Okay. She grabbed her purse and followed him into the garage. Five minutes later, he pulled up in front of a nice Italian restaurant. This looks very nice. I love Italian food, he said with a grin. Don't tell my Irish ancestors. She laughed. I won't. The hostess took them to a private table for two in the corner. She noticed several of the other restaurant patrons smiled at them as they walked past. It was the first time Devin felt as if she belonged there, beside the most handsome man on the planet. The server brought warm bread and seasoned oil. Once they placed their dinner order, Rye reached over and took her hand. I should have taken you out for a proper date before now, he said in a low voice. I don't mind staying home or cooking for you. She glanced around the cozy, intimate atmosphere. Although this is very nice, Rye smiled. I wanted tonight to be special. She wasn't sure what he meant. Did you learn something new today? No. He rose, pulled something from his pocket, then went down on his knee in front of her. She caught her breath when he opened the box. Devin, I love you with all my heart. Will you please marry me? Yes, Rye. Tears would ruin the bit of makeup she'd used for the occasion, so she tried to blink them back. I love you too. I'd be honored to marry you. I never told you that I didn't plan to have children, but it's okay because I changed my mind about that. He slipped the sapphire blue engagement ring on her finger. I want children with you, Devin. We may have to wait until Ellie is settled, but we deserve to have a family of our own. Oh, Rye, are you sure? She hadn't realized he'd been set against having kids, yet here he was, offering her exactly what she wanted. I want you to be happy too. There's no need for us to rush into having a family. All I need is you. Well, keep in mind I have eight siblings. Pretty sure we're a fertile bunch, he said dryly. Then he stood and drew her up too. I want to have a family with you, Devin, he repeated, then kissed her right there in the middle of the restaurant. The patrons around them burst into a round of applause, but she barely noticed. Rye had given her everything she'd ever dreamed of, and more. She loved him so much and couldn't wait to become a part of the Finnegan family.